Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to vouchsafe thy special blessing upon this parliament and that thou wouldst be pleased to direct and prosper the work of thy servants to the advancement of thy glory and to the true welfare of the people of Australia. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. I acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Gambri peoples who are traditional custodians of the Canberra area and pay respect to the elders past and present of all Australia's Indigenous peoples. Are there any documents to be tabled by the clerk? The clerk. President, I table documents pursuant to statute as listed on the dynamic red. Are there any proposals for committees to meet during the sittings of the Senate? The clerk. Yes, Mr President. Committees have lodged proposals as shown at item three of today's order of business. I remind senators the question may be put on any proposal at the request of any senator. It being none, we'll move on. Senators, pursuant to the order adopted yesterday, um, Shall I call the clerk? For, I'll call the clerk just to call on the business and then put the second reading. Government business order of the day, number one, Treasury Laws Amendment, more flexible superannuation bill 2020. Vote on the second reading. So the debate was closed on these bills last night. We will move to the second reading vote on that bill only. The question is that that bill be read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Clerk. <coughs> A bill for an act to amend the law relating to taxation and for related purposes. Is it the wish of the committee that bi the bills be taken together as a whole? There being no objection, it is so ordered. Senator McAllister. Uh, thanks very much. Um, I rise to ask a couple of questions of the minister about this, but before we get there, it is worth reflecting on where we are in the process of this debate. Yesterday, without notice, the government moved to crunch debate on three very important bills, three bills that relate to a superannuation system worth three trillion dollars. Three bills that go to the financial interests of every working Australian. Three bills which in combination have the potential to disadvantage three million Australians by as much as $240,000 at retirement, a consequence of shoddy drafting shoddy policy work and an ideological obsession with supporting their mates in the financial services sector at the expense of the evidence. I think it is a pretty pathetic indictment on this government that a system as important as Australia's superannuation system is the subject of endless petty partisanship. For eight years, every bill on superannuation that has been brought before this parliament has been marred by a fixation with an ideological war at the expense of the evidence. Nothing this government ever does in relation to superannuation is in the national interest. Nothing this government ever does in relation to superannuation relates in any way to the interests of working people. It is just one endless petty culture war after the other. A fixation driven by people on the other side who cannot bear the idea that industry super funds even exist. That this system that is the envy of people all over the world exists and works. That a system that allows businesses and workers and their representatives to direct their own financial interests, to make investments, to make some contribution to the structure of business and of capital investment in this country. 
This system, which works so well, which has delivered for so many people, which has lifted so many people into a dignified retirement, this is the thing they can't bear. And why not? Because the idea that ordinary people might have a say, might have a seat at the big table, is an anathema to these people. These people think that that right ought to be preserved for the merchant bankers, the business people in the really nice suits, not for the working types, not for people who do an ordinary job, not for the people who get up early and go to work doing hard labour, not for them and their representatives, just for people like them, just for people like them on the other side. And I had actually thought it might come to an end when Ms O'Dwyer left the portfolio. I had thought that perhaps things might get better. But the performance yesterday and what I expect to happen today doesn't suggest that anything has changed at all under this minister. Because Minister Hume is stubbornly persisting with a program of legislation that everyone has told her is flawed. When you've got Innes Willocks, not a notorious socialist, Innes Willocks from a key employer group, out begging the government to put aside ideology and look at the evidence, it should be a signal to you, Minister, that you have a problem. When you've got Innes Willocks saying that people like Andrew Bragg, who likes to chat a lot on this topic, might need to put aside the eight years of hostility to superannuation that he built up during his time at the Financial Services Council, it might be an indication that the government has a problem. Because your credibility on super is shot. Every time a superannuation bill comes before this chamber, the one thing that we can be absolutely certain, the one thing we can be certain about is that the interests of ordinary people won't be in play. There will be a weird set of interests for the Liberal Party. There will be a weird set of internal stakeholders who have got some nutty conspiracy theory about how industry superannuation works. There will be Andrew Bragg with an entirely misconceived idea about how industry super's investments work. There will be the Financial Services Council who have got a particular set of views that you are always willing to listen to. But there will never be an examination of the evidence. There will never be an engagement with the findings of Commissioner Hayne, who was very clear about which parts of the superannuation system required particular and additional attention and which parts were working OK. There won't be an engagement today with the evidence from the Productivity Commission that there is a whole section of the superannuation industry that will be left unregulated by this bill that is letting workers down. None of that is to be engaged with if we are to take at her word the contribution the minister made last night. The thing is we don't know what we're really dealing with today because there has been a deal done. Last night, Senator Hanson, Senator Roberts and Senator Griff gave their vote to the government to crunch all this through, to make sure that the terms of the debate today would be very narrow, that the time for debate would be very narrow that senators in many instances would be in a position where they were voting on amendments that they had only just seen and where the time allocated for discussion was very, very limited indeed. Why is this government so allergic to scrutiny, Minister? That might be something that you address in your first contribution. The final thing I want to come to is the amendments that are before us on the bill that we are now dealing with. Senator Hanson has circulated three amendments. One of them goes to improving tax concessions for a small number of very wealthy people. Curiously enough, the age at which this measure kicks in is 67. Well, Senator Hanson was willing to give the government the support to bring all this on last night. And it happens, if we're to believe Wikipedia, that Senator Hanson herself has only recently turned 67. Well, what a coincidence. What a coincidence. And the question I have for you, Minister, is will you be supporting her amendment? Because is this the deal 
that's been done. We know a deal's been done. We don't know its terms because you haven't been willing to be upfront about that. So I'm inviting you now to tell us the terms of this deal and, in particular, to tell us what the government's voting position will be on each of the amendments that have been circulated on this bill in this chamber in the name of Senator Hanson. Thank you, um, Senator McAllister. Minister. Uh, thank you, Chair, and thank you, Senator McAllister, for that contribution. Um, there are a number of amendments that are <coughs> going to be put forward today from right across the chamber on all three bills. The government has a different position on each one, as you would expect. On the three amendments that are coming from Senator Hanson today, two the government will be supporting and one the government will not be supporting. Thank you, Minister. Uh, Senator McAllister. I would invite the minister to be transparent about which of the amendments she intends to support. Minister. Uh, thank you, Chair. So the government will be supporting the amendment on sheet zero, uh, 1005. It will be opposing the amendment on uh, sheet 8983, and it will be supporting the amendment on sheet 8997. Senator McAllister. Senator, I've asked you to lay out the terms of the deal that you've made with the crossbench. Will you do that now? Minister. Senator McAllister, as you know, the government makes negotiations with the crossbench. All conversations are done in good faith, and that will continue to be the case. Senator McAllister. Senator. Uh, Minister, thank you for that. Uh, it's a very uh, obtuse answer to my question. You have secured the support of three senators for crunching this debate through. We can assume that you secured the support of three senators for crunching your legislation through. What are the terms on which you have secured their support? What have you offered them? Before they make their position clear on this bill. Minister. Uh, thank you. And Senator McAllister, as you'd understand, this legislation has merit in its own right. When we speak to members of the crossbench and indeed uh, members across the chamber, uh, we do so in good faith. We listen to what it is that their concerns with the bill are and we make and, or, and we potentially support or reject amendments as appropriate. Senator McAllister. Minister, you've indicated support for. 1005. What is the effect of that amendment? Minister. Uh, thank you. So this amendment to the more flexible super bill would remove the excess contribution, concessional contributions charge, which is known as the EECC charge, for people who exceed their concessional contributions cap. So the EEC charge of just over 3 per cent, 3.01 per cent, is currently applied to the tax liability on excess contributions to super that are in breach of the concessional contributions cap. Removing the EEC, ECC charge for excess super contributions will help simplify the superannuation system and also cut red tape. It's imposed on people even when they breach their cap through no choice of their own, such as situations where their employer pays more than the 9.5 per cent superannuation guarantee rate. 26 per cent of employees are currently on agreements where their employer pays in excess of 9.5 per cent. The proposed amendment would remove the ECC charge but leave intact the existing integrity arrangements which ensure that any excess contributions continue to be taxed appropriately at an individual's marginal tax rate. Senator McAllister. Uh, Minister, is it correct that this amendment will deliver a benefit to senators? Minister. Uh, this uh, change, this amendment, will um, deliver a benefit to anybody who is paid in excess of the uh, superannuation guarantee rate of 9.5 per cent, uh, particularly those for whom their, em their employer pays super more than that rate without any choice of their own. Senator McAllister. Well, it's a tough gig, isn't it, when your employer pays you super without any choice of your own in excess of the minimum rate? Sounds tough. Is that the situation Senator Hanson finds herself in? Minister. Minister for that. Senator McAllister. Are you not aware of the general terms on which senators are employed, Minister Hume? 
Minister. That's entirely relevant to this piece of legislation, Senator McAllister, but we know that when we speak to crossbenchers and they uh, tell us their concerns with a particular piece of legislation, that we would always negotiate in good faith. Senator McAllister. So this has been the subject of negotiation between yourself and Senator Hanson. And it is a change which delivers a benefit to high-income people who get paid more than the standard superannuation rate. That sounds exactly like the situation of most senators. Why is it that Senator Hanson can come in here? She's not even here, actually. She can't be bothered to come and defend her own amendments. You're here carrying the can for a minister, but you've agreed to this. Why is it that you think that approving an amendment that directly benefits Senator Hanson is appropriate? Minister. Uh, Senator, thank you, Chair. Uh, the government will support uh, changes that help simplify the superannuation system and reduce red tape. Senator McAllister. Uh, yes, I understand that the government intends to support this change. I'm inviting you to tell the people of Australia why. Why people who go over the cap, which is quite generous at 27,000, a little bit over, need a tax cut. Because honestly, if I think about the people that I know in my community, there's not many of them tipping more than 27,000 bucks into their super every year. That is a very elite group of people. How many Australians are going to benefit from this, Minister? <coughs> and why is it that the remainder of Australians who don't, who don't benefit from this, should bear the costs of the change that you're proposing? Minister. Uh, thank you, Chair. Senator, many of those who breach this cap do so through absolutely no choice of their own. Removing uh, the um, excess contributions charge simply removes red tape. And, uh, and, um, and simplifies the superannuation system. Senator McAllister. Minister, what's the fiscal <coughs> impact uh, over the forwards for voting for this amendment? Minister. Senator, it's an amendment that's been put forward by uh, the crossbench. It's not an amendment that's been put forward by the government, so the fiscal impact has not yet been analysed. Uh, Senator McAllister, wait for the call. My Senator apologies. <laughs> Thank you very much, Chair. Um, Minister, your advice just now is that you are in here committing the government to vote for an amendment that will benefit a very small group of Australians, that will cost the budget, and you've got absolutely no idea by how much. Uh, Minister. <coughs> Thank you, Chair. Uh, an update will be provided on the costings at the next budget update. Senator McAllister. Well, I mean, I <coughs> concede, uh, Minister, that that gives you a generous period of time to get around to this. But is this the new standard that we're going to set for governance? That you come in here, you do a deal with Senator Hanson to ram your bills through, and the price of that is an amendment of uncertain cost that you're willing to tick off on, despite the fact you've got absolutely no idea about the consequence for the budget. I mean, this is the problem with the way you are dealing with superannuation. It is a toy. It is a thing for endless political games. It is the subject of deals, which you're very, very reluctant to discuss. But you can't even do the basics. What government would come in here and ask senators to support a proposition where you've got absolutely no idea of the fiscal impact? The superannuation system does actually have a pretty substantial impact on the budget. You won't see this side of politics wandering out there making propositions about super without thinking that question through. And it astonishes me that you would come in here, give government support for something dreamed up by Senator Hanson, 
in her own interest without even bothering to cost it. Can you explain to me if this is the standard that you'll be setting for all of the other amendments that are before us today? Minister. Thank you, Chair. Senator McAllister, I think I can safely say that we haven't costed your amendments either, and I'd be interested to know whether you have costed your amendments. But that said, as I've said before, we negotiate with the crossbench in good faith at all steps of the way to make the best legislation possible. Senator McAllister. Senator Hume, you haven't bothered on the fiscals, but can I ask you this? For a senator here on a backbench salary, how much will they personally benefit? by the change that you're proposing to endorse uh, by supporting the amendments on 1005. Minister. Thank you, Chair. I haven't costed this amendment. I haven't costed your amendments, but if you have costed your amendments, I'd be interested to know what they are going to cost the budget as well. Senator McAllister. So you don't know. Senator Hanson's come in here and she's popped something in and she's proposed it to you. Remove a charge that affects her personally. It affects a lot of people here personally, actually. But you haven't bothered to find out what the individual benefit is. Not something that even made you curious when Senator Hanson put this proposal to you. Senator McAllister. <clears throat> My question to you, Minister, is were you not even curious? Were you not even curious about the impact of what was being put to you on high income earners in this chamber? Minister. Senator McAllister, in your own words, this affects a very small number of people. If we can make legislation better, we will certainly always consider how to do so. Senator McAllister. It certainly does affect a very small number of people and a lot of people in this chamber. Do you think this is what the Australian public expect from us? Do you think that they expect us to come in here and spend time debating amendments that, in your words, affect a very small number of people, provide a benefit to a very small number of people, most of whom earn very generous incomes? And do you think they expect you to just tick that off when it's put to you without looking at the impact of the cost on the budget or without thinking through the kind of benefit that's going to be offered to the people sitting around you. Minister. Senator, I think that what the Australian people expect is a superannuation system that serves them rather than the superannuation funds that administer it. You know, the government uses quite considerable constitutional powers to compel Australians to sequester nearly $1.10 of everything that they earn, potentially for up to 40 years, and yet they do so in a highly inefficient system. Everything that the government has done in the last, uh, in, in its entire time in, in, gov in, in government in this parliament has been to improve the efficiency of the system through reducing the number of duplicate accounts out there. That means there's two sets of fees, two sets of insurances, to make sure that insurances are appropriately applied and can be claimed upon, that there is uh, you know, competitive tension that drives fees down and that the tail, the long tail of underperforming superannuation funds that um, people languish in for years and years uh, are eliminated from this system. Um, indeed, this bill that is before us now is about making superannuation more flexible, specifically for older Australians, older Australians that haven't had the benefit of a compulsory superannuation throughout their working lives. And we will continue unapologetically to do so. Senator Watt. Thank you, Madam, De uh, Madam Deputy President. Um, just to pick up on some of the questions Senator McAllis has been asking, Minister, uh, I know you've said that you do not know what the cost to taxpayers will be fr from agreeing to the crossbench amendments. Do you know, are we talking millions of dollars? Are we talking billions of dollars? Are we talking tens of billions of dollars? Do you have any idea how much you're about to sign taxpayers up to as part of your deal with the crossbench? Uh, and also, Senator Watt, you need to be speaking from your spot. Thanks. 
Minister. Thank you, Chair. So, Senator White, as is the usual practice when an amendment passes uh, on a piece of government legislation, the cost effect of that amendment will be published in the next budget update, which in this case will be my info. <coughs> Senator Watt. Um, thank you, Madam Deputy President. Does it not concern you, Minister, that you are potentially signing taxpayers up to many billions of dollars? as a result of supporting these crossbenchers, because you don't know what the cost is. You say we should just wait for the budget update, but today's the day when you're about to put people on the hook. And you, I mean, if we're, if we're about to see the parliament deliver tens of billions of dollars uh, of taxpayers' funds to a very small number of people, I would have thought we'd, we're entitled to know that. Minister. Thank you, Chair. So the government will always make a decision on amendments based on their individual merits, um, and indeed the cost of those amendments would be it would be very helpful to government if those that were proposing amendments would do their own costings. For instance, I understand that there is an ALP amendment to this legislation that's before us now, and again, I don't know what the cost effect of that would be. Should the government have chosen to support that amendment, again, the cost would be outlined in my info, as is usual practice. Uh, Senator Watt. Isn't the difference, though, Minister, that you are not, the government is not supporting any of the Labor amendments, is my understanding, um, or a very small number of them at best, but it's the government who are choosing to back in crossbench amendments. So isn't it a little bit more relevant to have some idea of what the cost of amendments that are going to pass with the government's support than any other amendments that anyone might be moving that are going to go down? That's the, that's the issue. Minister. Uh, so, thank you, Chair. Uh, the government makes decisions about whether to support or not support uh, amendments that are made by the crossbench or indeed the opposition very carefully and considers the effects on the um, uh, underlying legislation. Um, I'd be very interested to know if the opposition put forward their many amendments to these three bills today. If they provided any costings themselves uh, attached to those amendments, then the government might take them more seriously. <coughs> Senator Watt. Uh, just returning to amendment number 989. Eight nine nine seven, which is, as I understand it, the amendment Senator Hanson has moved um, to give herself eight nine eight three. The amendment Senator Hanson has moved to give herself a nice little pay rise. When when was that amendment presented or first discussed with the government? Minister. No, um, I'm sorry, I can't answer that, Senator. What what I can say is the no, government's not supporting it, so the question's no. irrelevant. Thank you. Sorry, I'll just, sorry, Senator McAllister, I'm going to have to ask you to. I'm going to give you the call so you can put that question again so we can record it. On and I just wanted to indicate that uh, the ALP has circulated an amendment on sheet 1025. We won't be proceeding with that amendment this morning. Thank you, Senator McAllister. Yeah, thank you very much, Minister. I'll let the, uh, can I alert the chair to the state of the chamber? Yes. Thank you. Quorum required. Ring the bells.
quorum present? Thank you. Order, quorum present. Okay. Uh, all right. So, as no amendments have been moved, the bill. Uh, I now put the question: that The bill stand as printed. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. Ayes have it. Clark. All right, well, the question is now that the bill be reported. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, no. No one has it. Okay. Division required? Okay, ring the bells. Yes. Sorry, Senator Kane. Thank you, Chair. Could I just uh, ask that? Did we hear two voices? I didn't hear any voices, but I'll give another go. I and we will we'll have another go because it's the first time I've never heard a voice. So the question is the bill now be reported. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. Noes have it. Division required.
Lock the doors. So the question is. I'm going to put the question. They've had four minutes. So the question is that the bill uh, stand as printed. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair and the noes to the left. I appoint uh, Senator Ciccone as teller for the ayes and Senator McGrath as teller for the noes. I think I said uh, I'll repeat the question. So the question is the bill be reported. My apologies.
Order. So the result of the division is ayes 31, noes 32. The question is resolved in the negative. Just to remind the chamber, we are still in committee. Minister. Sorry. Senator Hanson. We're in committee stage. Oh I'm, oh, I'm sorry, Senator McAllister. Sorry about that. OK. It is worth explaining, is it not, to the Senate what just happened. Because what just happened <clears throat> was that the government voted against reporting their own bill out of the committee stage, the bill they drafted. And why did they do that? Why do they do that? Because it's very unusual. I don't think I have ever seen the government vote against their own bill, against voting their own bill. As far as I can tell, and I'll be interested to see how this unfolds, this was to give Senator Hanson, who was running late, who's now appeared in the chamber, the chance to move her amendments that benefit her. This is exactly about the government using all of their numbers to protect the financial interests of Senator Hanson. What a disgrace. What an embarrassing abuse of chamber process to prevent your own bill from exiting committee to help the crossbench one person move amendments designed to financially benefit her. What a disgrace. Is anyone seeking the call? Senator McKim. Thank you very much, uh, Acting Deputy President. Just um, to follow on from Senator McAllister's contribution, uh, uh, in the submission of the Australian Greens, Senator McAllister is entirely accurate in uh, what she has just put forward as a rationale for what has just happened, and we collectively join with Senator, Mac Senator McAllister and the Labor Party in expressing our utter astonishment that the government would actually vote ag against the progression of its own legislation through this Senate. I don't know whether this has ever happened before, and I'd be very interested to find out. Certainly not something that I've witnessed uh, either in the Senate or my uh, many, many years in the Tasmanian Parliament, where the government has actually voted against the progress of its own bill in order to allow um, Senator Hanson to move her amendments. And I want to be very clear: when uh, Senator McAllister was putting her her theory about what just happened to the chamber. Uh, Senator Hanson agreed with it and said that Senator McAllister was quite right in um, the assertions that she was making. So there it is. This is simply the result of a dirty deal done between the government and One Nation, and it has resulted in um, uh, uh, the most bizarre situation where the government has, uh, has astoundingly decided that it should vote against the passage uh, or the progress of its own legislation through this place. So we'll now wait and see how this shakes out and uh, how the government votes uh, on Senator Hanson's amendment. But it is uh, amendments. I want to be clear, though, these are not crossbench amendments. These are One Nation amendments. They will not be supported by the Australian Greens. But again, uh, this is uh, Alice in Wonderland stuff from the government here, which uh, just uh, potentially historically 
voted uh, against the passage of its own legislation through this Senate. Thank you, Senator McKinn. Senator Roberts. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mr. Acting Deputy President. I want to make it very, very clear that these accusations, and that's what they are, are completely false. There is no one, there is no one in this parliament more honest than Senator Hanson. I've worked with her completely, completely honest, and I reject those imputations. They're vile and they're, they're wrong. Senator Roberts. Uh, is there anybody seeking the call? Well, I might just respond to Senator Roberts, if I may. Well, what I might do, Minister, Senator Hanson did jump to her feet first, so I will give Senator Hanson the opportunity, unless she wants to succeed to you, to the minister. Senator Hanson. Thank you very much, um, Senator uh, Deputy Chair, for, for actually doing this. Um, what has happened, and I do admit that it was because of me and it wasn't the government holding up the legislation. I admit when I'm wrong, but I will tell the truth, unlike a lot of other people in this chamber. The whole fact is that it was because this um, came on to actually move the amendments, and I ran to get to the chamber in time to actually move the amendments. So that is the truth. It's got nothing to do with the government whatsoever. And it's got nothing. Now, with these amendments that I'm um, proposing to put forward, I, I do have a concern with one of my amendments. I've just discovered that it has not been printed correctly to my wishes, so therefore I've, um, I am considering what to do with this. And I realise now, unless I have confirmation from the government, of if it can be changed, but I'm of the opinion um, I don't think it can be changed. And that was the amendment uh, on um, page. 8983 revised 2. As the amendment says, that if you are aged 67 years of NOVA, you get $5,000 to put into your account superannuation. Now, that was basically for all Australians. Those Australians, because 67 years of age is the retirement age. Now, that means that all those Australians, and we are struggling to keep people into the workforce. It is basically as, a, as an incentive for all Australians, it doesn't matter who you are, what work you do, whether you be a truck driver, whether you actually be, you know, someone who works in a retail business, someone who works in mines, if you're 67 years of age, do you have an incentive to put an extra $5,000 into your super? Because what we find now, a lot of people are actually drawing out their super in retirement age, paying off their homes, going for holidays, spending money, and end up on the pension. It was a way of an incentive to keep people into the workforce, regardless of who you are, for all Australians, those battlers, everyone. But as I see now, it was supposed to be only $5,000 a year, not increased by $5,000 every year. That was not what I wanted to see written here. Therefore, I am in a bit of a dilemma. I still believe that Australians should, over the age of 67, for those older Australians to be able to um, put the money into their accounts and I think it can keep them into the workforce which we need. Just because you're 67 and you're of a retirement age, which I am proud to say I am 67 years of age and I turned 67 yesterday. And if, and if Senator Murray Watt thinks that my staying here for an extra six years for $30,000, he doesn't know me. I don't need to be in this place with a lot of pusillanimous politicians for the next six years for an extra $30,000. It's about the battlers. It's people out there to be able to stay in the workforce from 67 years of age and keep them, give them some incentive why they should, and they're worth their weight in gold. Because most of my employees in my office are over the age of 67. So and I'm proud to say that, as the people that worked in my fish and chip shop were also of the older age group, and they are worth their weight in gold. Now, as far as the other, um, the, the other, um, uh, what I've got here, and this is about the battlers. Those people were given the opportunity to take their money out of superannuation, um, to use it in the time of COVID. This now is going to give them the opportunity to put that money back in without any penalties up until 2030. So those people that have used the money 
give them the opportunity to put it back into the superannuation funds so they will actually have that money when it comes to retirement age. Was that Labor's policy? No. They're not worrying about those battlers because it would have been the battlers, those hard-working Australians, that had utilised taking their money out of their accounts, the superannuation, thanks to the government giving them that opportunity. But now it's about allowing them the opportunity, now that they're back in work, to give them the opportunity to put that money back into the account. And I'd like to see how Labor's going to vote on that one, because they'll be knocking back all the battlers the opportunity to actually put money back into their account. And the third one is about the concessional um, putting your money into your superannuation. So if you are over the twenty-six or $27,000 that you, you put into your super at the moment from your employer, anything over that, you're paying full tax rate on that money. So, and then you have the opportunity to pull it out. But again, you are taxed at 3 per cent again for drawing your money out. Your money, your money you've paid full tax on, and you're drawing it out again, they want to hit you again for another 3 per cent. So it's about getting rid of that 3 per cent, considering you've already paid your tax on it. So that is my third one. So if you think that... Um, my moving this is because of me, and for thirty thousand oh, dollars, I come on, mate. You just don't know me. I've probably paid more tax in this country than what you ever have, and I've done more work for the people of Queensland, and I have actually achieved more for Queensland in the past five years than some of the Queensland senators in this parliament, including. And I am fed up with the lies, misrepresentation, and the people who put a spin on so many issues here and talk about. Um, casualisation of those in the mines. It was one nation that actually got the government to put in casualisation to get rid of it, to get rid of it, to allow those Australians, to allow those Australians to actually, after 12 months of working in a job, that they can actually turn around and ask for full-time employment. That was one nation. That was me. That was not Labor. That was not Labor, and it definitely wasn't Murray Watt who was actually pushing for that. So it's about looking after those people, giving them the opportunity, and that has been my focus in this parliament. is about a fair go for all Australians. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's up to you how you want to vote for this. If you want to play your politics in this place, well, I'm sick and tired of it, and so are the Australian people. So stop Dammel, stop Dammel twisting and saying anything. Oh, it's election time. Oh, you know what, um, Senator Watt? I'm actually going to put that video up where you praised me for my work and effort that I've put into Queensland. You praised me on this floor of parliament. Isn't it suit you? Isn't there in the wind a politics? It's in the air? Oh, that's right. We're up for election. Murray Watt's up against Pauline Hanson. You know, you won't get re-elected on your abilities at all. You will get re-elected purely based on the fact that you're top of the ticket. Probably Chisholm, Senator Chisholm, might do a far better job than you. Sen Sen okay, thank you. Look, um, I just will remind senators that uh, um, I will request that you do put your comments through the chair. Senator Watt. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Well, I'd like to begin by wishing Senator Hanson a happy birthday. I didn't actually realise it was your birthday yesterday, Senator Hanson. Um, but that, that explains your actions in moving this amendment even more. When I spoke on this last night, I realised that you were 67 and that that was the reason you were trying to move a tax benefit for people who were 67 or older. What I didn't realise is that you were moving the amendment to benefit 67-year-olds on the day you turned 67. That is ingenious. That is ingenious. How long did you spend working out how you could manipulate the system to give yourself a pay rise on your birthday? Now, look, I've heard, I've heard of a lot of people out there who like to buy themselves a birthday present on their birthday because they're not sure what they're going to get. I've never heard of a politician come down to Canberra to move an amendment to use taxpayers' money to give themselves a birthday present on their birthday, but that's what Senator Hanson did just yesterday on her birthday. 
That is extraordinary. Now, Senator Hanson, you said that you ran down into the chamber. I can understand why you ran down into the chamber, because you were so desperate to move this amendment to give yourself a birthday present, not only a $30,000 pay rise, but a $30,000 birthday present present at taxpayers' expense. If I was going to do that, I'd be running down to the chamber as well. But you know what's different about you and me? I don't run down to the chamber to give myself a pay rise. I don't get elected to, get to Canberra to give myself a pay rise. I get elected to actually look Sorry. after battlers, not bullshit to them like Lord, you Senator do, Watt, uh, Watt. constantly. Order, 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 order. Now, this may be strange coming from there. I withdraw. Yeah, thanks, Senator withdraw. Watt. But I would encourage you, Senator Watt, to put your comments through the chair. Mr Acting Deputy President, un unlike Senator Hanson, you and I do not get ourselves elected to Canberra to give ourselves a pay rise. We don't run around our respective states misleading people and pretending that we care about them only to get ourselves elected and give ourselves a pay rise like Senator Hanson has done. What the truth is about what we've just seen this morning is that Senator Hanson has been caught out. Senator Hanson has been exposed as the fraud that she always has been in saying that she claims to support battlers, but in fact she only tries to help herself. She has been shamed into coming down into this chamber, running down into this chamber uh, by her own admission, uh, to try to fiddle with this amendment that she put together yesterday because she's been caught out for trying to use taxpayers' money to give herself this pay rise. Those of us who are from Queensland and have been watching Senator Hanson in action have been used to her having her snout in the trough for a very long time. She has had her snout in the public trough for over 20 years, usually to try to access electoral funds that are meant to go to her party, instead to use for her own personal, politic, personal benefit. Senator, What's different this Senator time Watt, is that Senator she's Watt. got her snout Senator, in the trough Senator to benefit Watt. herself personally. Senator Watt, thank you. Senator Hanson. I take offence to that on a point of order of referring to electoral funding, which has got nothing to do with this debate. And on top of that, it's a bloody lie, and I'm not going to sit here and put up with this rubbish that comes out of his mouth. Thank you, Senator Hanson. Look, Senators, uh, these, sorry, Senator Roberts, just let me finish on the point of order. I think, Senators, that we can all get very passionate in this place and know more than me at times. I would encourage Senator Watt to reflect on your comments there. There's plenty of opportunities to get your point across. So, Senator Watt, um, I probably would ask if you could just contemplate a retraction, and that's a, I am asking that, and it's entirely your call. Senator McAllister. Thanks, Mr. De uh, Mr Acting Deputy President. On the same kind of question, I wonder if you might reflect on Senator Hanson's um, language and the assertions she made about Senator Watt's contribution in fruity terms, I think she may also consider withdrawing some of her remarks. And, and thank you, Senator McAllister. And you know, it is great to have passionate debate, but uh, we've had a number of occasions now this morning that I would ask Senators, please reflect. And anyway, let's let's set the let, sorry, Senator Roberts, just let me finish, please, and then I will come to you. I would ask both senators if they would just retract if they would have the ability to contemplate a retraction of accusations across the chamber. I can't control you to do that, but I'm asking Senator Watt. Or anything that was offensive, Chair. Thank you, Senator Watt. Senator Hanson, I would ask the same question of your good self, too. I'm not, I have nothing to withdraw with regards to his performance and what he does for Queensland. I have not got into a personal matter as he did with referring to my electoral funding. So therefore, I have, will not withdraw what I have said. Well, Senator Hanson, what I would request then that there was some colourful language that I pulled up Senator Watt on to, and I would ask that if would you withdraw the colourful language, please. It's the word blood. If you want to, I don't refer it was something along the lines of bullshit. I never, no, I never said that. Oh, bloody, sorry. The, the boy S was that side which was withdrawn. Oh, that's the Irish coming out of me saying bloody. But anyway, I withdraw it offensive to anyone. There are truck drivers present in the chamber that may take offence to some of the language. I'm not one of them, but anyway. Now, Senator Roberts. And coal miners, but we wouldn't take offence to it either. Uh, thank you, Mr Acne Deputy President. We just witnessed from Senator Watt a statement that was deliberately misrepresenting what Senator Hanson said immediately prior to that. That is not acceptable behaviour in this Senate, and it's done repeatedly. Misrepresentations, let's be clear, are an attempt to control, and always beneath control there is fear. I'm fine. I'm sorry, Senator Watt. 
as far as, I've so, so, uh, as I sit here in the chamber is that Senator Watt did retract whatever was offensive. I think it's now time that we should get back on track. We're here to do a little bit of work. Senator Watt, you do have the call. Thank you, uh, Chair. Uh, just to wrap up my contribution, um, for those who haven't been following exactly what is being proposed in Senator Hanson's amendment that she tabled yesterday on her birthday, on the day she turned 67, the purpose of that amendment is to give a very generous tax concession to high income earners who are aged 67 or older. It won't apply to people earning $30,000, $60,000 a year because Senator Hanson might not realise this, but people earning low to middle incomes don't generally have so much money set aside that they can make extra voluntary superannuation contributions. Uh, but those of us who are fortunate enough uh, to be working here or in other high income occupations do have that opportunity. So this is something the amendment that Senator Hanson has moved will only benefit high income earners like Senator Hanson. Who turned sorry, Senator Watt. Sorry, and just before we do, sorry, Senator Watt. There is, is Senator Hanson on her feet. No amendments have been moved yet. So anyway, Senator Hanson. For clarifying that, Chair. Point of order was the fact he stated that I've moved the amendment. I have not yes. moved the amendment. Senator Hanson, I picked that up, and uh, thank you for that, Senator Watt. Thank you. The amendment that Senator Hanson circulated yesterday uh, had one objective, and that was to give a generous tax concession, in other words, in ordinary people's language, a pay rise to high income earners like Senator Hanson who turn 67 or older. And as I say, Senator Hanson didn't just circulate this amendment on any day, she circulated it on the day she turned 67, the day she qualified for this extremely generous Senator White, pay rise. Senator Hanson, on a point that of order. Um, misrepresentation. Senator Watt said I've uh, circulated this on my birthday. My birthday was last month. This was not circulated on my birthday. So it's basically misrepresentation um, telling a lie. Can I help? Can I help? Yes. Sorry, sorry. sorry. <laughs> Kitchen, sorry, I'm, I'm halfway through changing. Sorry, Senator Hanson, but the Senate did hear you say yesterday was your birthday. So if there's some confusion, I think we. Sorry, Senator. I'll give you the call, Senator Hanson. No, sorry, so, Senators. So Senator Hanson, I yesterday give you the call. was not my birthday, so you are wrong. I'm sure you've realised that. My birth and I said in it was my birthday was last month. Senator Hanson, thank you for clarifying that. We can now correct the record, and I would urge your office to pull up the record. There is no points of order. Let's get back on track, Senator. What you have. I was wondering whether. Uh, it was within the standing orders to take a point of order to correct when your birthday is, but you know we're, we're used to seeing pretty strange Senator, things here in the Senate. Senator Watt, if you could continue. Thank you, Thank you. Chair. Um, so as I was saying, the purpose of this amendment that Senator Hanson circulated yesterday, which we now learn was not her birthday, even though she told us 10 minutes ago was her birthday, uh, but certainly she circulated this amendment uh, when she turned 67 after she had turned 67, um, would, would, gen would, would provide a very generous tax concession to high-income earners who are 67 or over. Or either, or over. And of course, Senator Hanson, unlike most people in this chamber, just happens to tick each box. High-income earner, 67. What a nice wicket. And there is some dispute about the value of this pay rise that Senator Hanson is seeking to grant herself. We have calculated that over the course of a six-year Senate term it amounts to $30,000, uh, but there are other um, calculations that have been performed this morning which suggest it in fact could it be up to the value of $150,000. But let's be generous to Sen Senator Hanson and assume she's only trying to give herself a $30,000 pay rise. What sort of politician, what sort of political representative sets out when they're thinking about what they want to achieve in Canberra, their top priority is to give themselves a pay rise. What sort of person does that? What sort of person goes around Queenslanders misleading, struggling battlers and tries to tell them that they're on their side, when in fact what they do is they secretly come down to Canberra and circulate amendments under the cover of darkness, which are intended to give them at least 
a $30,000 pay rise. I'll tell you what kind of politician does that. Senator Hanson does that. Senator Hanson does that, and she has form. Whether you look back over her recent political career or her longer-term political career, one consistent thing we have seen from Senator Hanson is a laser-like focus on targeting public funds to enrich herself. She's done it before with electoral funds. She's doing it now with taxpayers' funds on superannuation. Senator, Senator Hanson. I want um, Senator Watt to withdraw that comment that I've done it uh, taking money for electoral funds. Senator Watt, well, could you? The record stand for itself uh, on that matter, Chair. Uh, in conclusion. Sorry, just just one moment, Senator Hanson. Did you were you standing for another point of order? Senator Watt. Thank you, Chair. In conclusion. Just, Senator Watt, just bear in mind the stand, section 193 of the standing orders. Thank you, Chair. Um, I think what we saw yesterday from Senator Hanson will go down in history as one of the biggest attempted rorts, biggest attempted swindles of the public purse that Australia has ever seen from a federal politician. It will go down in history as Pauline's payday. That's what yesterday was. That was about Senator Pauline Hanson coming to Canberra to give herself a nice, sweet, fat pay rise that all of those battlers back in Queensland are going to be paying more tax to fund. That's what happened yesterday. Uh, and I can understand why Senator Hanson is now desperately running to the chamber to try to tidy up this mess because she's been caught out. Um, I've said before many times that Senator Hanson should be ashamed of her behaviour. I've never felt it more strongly than I feel it today, because not only is she trying to enrich herself personally, but she's doing it at the expense of the very battlers that she says she was elected to this parliament to represent. It is a shameful day, even for Senator Hanson. The government is complicit. We know there's been a dodgy deal done between the government and One Nation to get this legislation through. So the government's hands are just as bit, every bit dirty as Senator Hanson's are. And already people in Queensland know very well what you've been up to here, Senator Hanson. They're only going to know more about it. You can laugh. You can laugh. If you think it's funny to Senator, rip Senator off Watt, taxpayers' Senator funds Watt, through, through you, Chair, chair. If, if Senator Hanson thinks it's funny and a laughing matter to be ripping off the public to give herself a pay rise, She's on her own, because I don't think it's funny. I don't think it's funny. I think it's a very serious matter that Senator Hanson should be completely ashamed of that she would try to rip off taxpayers in this manner. Um, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Senator. Senator McAllister. Uh, Chair, as far as I'm aware, there is no question before the committee. The government voted to uh, bring this bill back into the committee stage. There's no amendments being put. Under those circumstances, I move that the bill be reported. Thank you. Senator Hanson. Um, no. Deputy no. Chair, I'd like to move amendment. Um, There's a motion before the Chair. You clause can... 2, 1 and 2 on sheet 8997. By leave, please. Senator Hanson, we might just for a moment. Senator McAllister has asked that the bill be put, so we're going to have to deal with that first. The question is that the bill be put. All those be reported. Sorry, all all those in favour say aye. aye. Against say no. Aye. I think the noes have it. Division aye. the uh, division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
Order, lock the doors. So the question is that the bill be reported. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator McCarthy as teller for the ayes and Senator Davey as teller for the noes.
Order. There being 30 ayes and 33 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. Just to allow those senators not participating in Committee of the Whole to leave the chamber, and then we'll see where we're up to. Uh, Senator Hanson. Madam Acting Chair, I want to move um, the um, one and two on sheet 8997 by leave, and also one and two on sheet 1005 revised two. Could those not participating in the debate leave the chamber? Senator Hanson, can you confirm that was 8997 and 1005? Correct. Thank you. Senator Hanson. Uh, is leave granted to, to move those amendments together? Leave is granted. Senator Hanson. Thank you. As I said on sheet 8997, to do with COVID last year, the um, people were given the opportunity to draw out 10,000 10, the first year and, and another 10,000 the second year out of their superannuation. This amendment will allow those Australians who have withdrawn their money the opportunity to put that money back into their account by 2030. It is a way Senator of saving. Senator just one moment. Could those not participating in the debate please leave the chamber? This is, a way of, this is a way of savings um, for people to put the money back into their account with no penalties. I think it would be great for the Australian people to actually have the opportunity to put it in. As I said before, um, based on Labor were quite happy to actually stop this point in the last vote that they had, they were quite happy with the bill not to proceed with my amendments. So therefore I take it that Labor are totally opposed to um, people being able to put their monies back into their account without any penalties over the next 10 years. So those people who had to pull it out due to reasons of not having work, finding it financially difficult, those people that are back in the workforce now, they are going to vote against them, these Australians, these battlers out there who it is important to them to get as many savings away as they possibly can in the superannuation. The second bill, the second um, one that I have put up here, is to do with people who have put in uh, past their $25,000 concessional. They pay tax on it on the way in, and actually, if it's over the 25000 threshold, they are paying full tax on it. They are given the opportunity to pull that money out in a certain period of time after the end of financial year, but they're penalised again another 3 per cent. Remember, they've already paid their full tax on it, and you want to penalise them again by paying another 3 per cent on that money. This will actually get rid of that 3 per cent, and they can draw out their money within a specified period of time. So I think it would help a lot of people if they want it to. I think that um, a lot of Australians would agree they pay far too much tax in this country, especially on personal tax, plus also the, the GST taxes and other taxes that we pay. So why tax people again on funds that they've already paid their full tax on? So I hope that um, Labor will actually support the battling Australians on these um, on these. Um, motions on these amendments that I'm putting forward and, uh, and giving Australians the opportunity to put their monies back into their accounts and save for their future retirement years. Minister. The government will be supporting these two amendments. Thank you. Um, the question is that the amendments as moved by Senator Hanson be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, against say no. The, oh, Sure. Just wait for your mic to come on. I d can I please get clarification on what is being moved, to Chair? It's amendments on sheets 8997 and 1005 on block. Thank you. Thank you. So the question is that the amendments as moved by Senator Hanson be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Again, say no. No. I think the noes have it. The eyes have division required. Ring the bells for, five, for four minutes.
Lock the doors. So there are two lots of amendments that need to be agreed to. I'll remind the chamber we're dealing with sheet 89971 and 2 and sheet 10051 and 2. And the question is that the amendments be agreed to. Order! The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Davey as teller for the ayes and Senator McCarthy as teller for the noes. Order, there being 35 ayes and 29 noes, the matter is resolved in the affirmative. If there are no further amendments, the question is that the bill uh, be reported. The, beg your pardon, that the bill as amended be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? No. I believe the ayes have it. The ayes have it. So the question is that the bill be reported. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? No. I believe the ayes have it. The ayes have it. The committee has considered the Treasury Laws Amendment More Flexible Superannuation Bill of 2020 and agreed to it with amendments. Minister. I move that this bill now be read up. What have I missed? I'm oh, sorry, I move that the, the report of the committee be adopted. So the question is that the motion is moved by the minister be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. Minister. I, I move that this bill now be read a third time. So the question is that the motion is moved by the minister, Senator Waters. My apologies. Can you just re-put the question? It's a little hard to hear back here. On the third reading, uh, I'd ask the people in the chamber to be quiet because it's not as if I have a very quiet voice. Um, so the question is that the motion is moved by the minister. Third reading be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? No. I believe the ayes have it. No. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
lock the doors. The question is the bill be read a third time. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point to Senator Davey, tell if the ayes. Senator McCarthy, tell if the noes. The result of the division is ayes 35, noes 29. The matter is resolved in the affirmative. The clerk. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to taxation and for related purposes. Government business order of the day number two. Treasury laws amendment self-managed superannuation funds bill 2020. Second reading. Pursuant to the order adopted yesterday, the debate has concluded, so I'll put the motion on the second reading. The question is the bill be agreed to at the second reading. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. Aye. The ayes have it. Senator, did I, I, division required? Ring the bells for one minute. One minute. Lock the doors. The question is the bill be read a second time. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator Davey, tell her for the ayes, and Senator McCarthy, tell her for the noes.
The result of the division is ayes 35, noes 29. The matter is resolved in the affirmative. The clerk. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to taxation and superannuation and for related purposes. Is it the wish of the committee that the bill be taken as a whole? There being no objection, it is so ordered. Uh, the question is that the bill stand as printed. Senator. Deputy President, uh, I don't intend to detain the Senate long on this question, um, but I do rise to move the amendment circulated in my name on sheet 1237. Um, Labor doesn't support this bill, and I won't go into a great deal of detail about why not. I would refer people to the evidence that was put before the Senate committee on this question. I rely in brief on the comment that was provided by Super Consumers Australia, people you might expect to rely upon in providing good advice about what is in fact in the interest of consumers. And they said this, we don't believe that the Treasury Laws Amendment Self-Managed Superannuation Funds Bill 2020 will make a meaningful contribution to delivering better member outcomes in an environment where barriers to accessing unconflicted financial advice persist. And that's at the heart of our concerns about this bill, because the risk is that the people who will benefit most from these arrangements are financial advisers giving shonky advice, the kind of advice we've seen again and again and again, the kind of advice exposed in the Hain Royal Commission and there are inadequate protections for consumers, and this bill exposes people further, exposes people further to these risks. So it's on that basis that I move this amendment, which simply does this. It seeks to have a review of the operations of this bill. And frankly, if the government is as confident as it says it is about how terrific this bill is going to be, it won't object to performing a review. The review would really require a consideration of the conduct of financial advisers and trustees and the performance and governance of self-managed superannuation funds. I don't know why you wouldn't agree to that. And I encourage government senators to actually consider voting for a pretty sensible amendment that would cause a review of a new government policy within 12 months. Senator McKim. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I just rise very briefly to associate the Australian Greens with Senator McAllister's remarks and to indicate for the record that we will be supporting this amendment. Minister. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Senator McKim and also Senator McAllister for those contributions. Obviously, this bill increases the maximum number of allowable members in a self-managed super fund and small APRA fund from four to six. It's not a complicated bill at all. The increase in the maximum number of allowable members intends to provide additional consumer choice and flexibility uh, to manage retirement savings, and that's especially so for large families. The opposition amendment asks a review to be conducted of the operation of this amendment, and the review also must consider the conduct of financial advisers and trustees and SMSF investment performance and governance. Now, the government's position is to oppose this amendment. Um, firstly, the opposition's amendment to review whether self-managed super fund membership should be expanded after 12 months of passage of this legislation will create considerable uncertainty for those that want to take up the option of a five or six member self-managed super fund in the first 12 months of the amendment operating. Secondly, and I think it's, it's rather unfortunate and disingenuous of the opposition to disparage the good work that financial advisers do and the contribution that they make to the financial well-being of thousands and thousands of Australians. And in fact, the Morrison government has implemented a number of reforms that strengthen the financial advice sector and provide consumers 
with, uh, with much better access to affordable and high-quality financial advice. So far, the government has strengthened and simplified the ongoing fee arrangements framework to minimise the risk of a consumer being charged a fee for no service. We've amended the disclosure requirements to ensure that financial advisers disclose whether they are independent, which was recommendation 2.2 of the Hain Royal Commission. The government has also committed to introduce legislation by the 30th of June this year, uh, which would establish a single disciplinary body for financial advisers. Now, this is in response to Commissioner Haynes' finding that while sanctions are available to ASIC to take against financial advisers, the lack of less serious sanctions means that ASIC generally only focuses on the most serious of incidents. And while the government has announced that FACIA will soon be wound up, its functions will certainly remain. Treasury will be responsible for standard setting and the code of ethics, and ASIC will be responsible for administering the exam. Uh, the great work that FACIA has done to lift the education, training, ethical standards of financial advisers will continue. The government has, in fact, agreed to implement the Hain Royal Commission's recommendation to review measures that have been implemented by the government, by regulators and by financial services entities to improve the quality of financial advice. And I think we can safely say that we all know which side of politics supports members' rights to manage their own money, and it's certainly not the Labor Party. At the last election, can I remind the Chamber that the Labor Party, in fact, proposed $57 billion worth of retiree tax, which was very anti-self-managed super. I intend to put the question on the amendment. Does any other senator wish to make a contribution? So I put the question that the amendment on sheet 1237 be agreed to. Those for the question say aye. aye. Against, no. I think the noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells.
Lock the doors. So the question is that Amendment 1 on Sheet 1237, as moved by Senator McAllister, be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator McCarthy as teller for the ayes and Senator Davey as teller for the noes. So the uh, re result of the division is 30 ayes and 30 noes. The matter is resolved in the negative. Just allow senators to leave the chamber uh, before we commence business again. So the question is that uh, the bill stand as printed. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. So the question now is uh, that the bill be reported. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? I uh, believe the ayes have it. The committee has considered the Treasury Laws Amendment Self-Managed Superannuation Funds Bill of 2020 and agreed to it without amendments. Minister. I move that the report of the committee be adopted. So the question is that the motion is moved by the minister be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. Minister. I move that this bill now be read a third time. So the question is that the motion is moved by the minister be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? Aye. I believe the ayes have it. The ayes have it. I call the clerk. Oh, Senator McAllister. Uh, uh, Chair, I didn't <coughs> call a division in the interest of time, but I'd ask that the opposition's um, vote on this matter be recorded. We voted in the negative. Yep, and ditto from the Greens, Senator McKim. Uh, indeed, uh, Deputy President, ditto from the Greens. Thank you. We're so recorded. Uh, I call the clerk. <coughs> A bill for an act to amend law, the law relating to taxation and superannuation and for related purposes. Government Business Order of the Day, number three, Treasury Laws Amendment, Your Future, Your Super Bill 2021, second reading. Minister. I move that uh, the um, amendments on sheets, the government amendments on sheets, PM1. So, uh, just oh, sorry, a moment, Minister, forgive me. just resume I'm your seat.
Uh, my mistake, Minister. I need to put that the uh, second reading uh, um, be concluded. So the question is that um, the motion to conclude the second reading amendment be agreed to. Beg your pardon. The question is the bill be read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. Against? I believe the, the ayes have it. The ayes have it. As Senator McAllister. Uh, Madam Deputy President, in a similar vein, I'd ask that our opposition to the second reading be recorded. And Senator McKim. Uh, yes, uh, as I um, uh, confirmed in my second reading speech yesterday, our final position on this bill will be contingent on whether certain amendments are accepted. So we're, we've allowed okay. the bill through into the committee stage, and we'll uh, make a final decision right, on the thank third you, reading. Senator McKim. I call the clerk. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to superannuation and for related purposes. Is it the wish of the committee that the bill be taken as a whole? There being no objection, it is so ordered. The question is, uh, Minister. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy. President, I move that the um, government amendments on sheets PM122 and QJ145 are moved together. Um, uh, that these amendments now be agreed to, and that these amendments now be agreed to, and that the item three on Schedule Three stand is printed. Uh, Minister, I believe you need to seek leave. Yes, I need to seek leave to table a supplementary explanatory memorandum relating to the government amendments moved to this bill. Uh, is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Minister, you were seeking to move all of those together, so if you seek yes, leave I'm seeking to do so. leave. Sorry, for forgive me. That's okay. Madam, Acting Deputy <laughs> President, or, Madam Deputy President, I should say. So, for clarity, I am seeking leave to move government amendments on sheet PM122 and government amendment on sheet QJ145 together. Thank you. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Uh, so, the question. I'm going to put the question. Yep. <clears throat> uh, because the minister has moved uh, several together, they still need to be split apart because they have diff different outcomes. So the first one is I'm putting uh, one to four on sheet PM122, and the question is that the amendments be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. I'm now going to put. Um, Amendments 5 on sheet PM122, and the question is that items 3 of Schedule 3 stand as printed. Those of that opinion say aye. Against? Uh, I believe the noes have it. I'm now going to put um, sheets, uh, amendments 1 and 2 on sheet. Uh, QJ145, and the question is that items 10 and 14 of Schedule 3 stand as printed. Those of that opinion say aye. Against? Aye. Uh, I believe the noes have it. <clears throat> and I'm now going to put the last of those amendments moved by the minister by leave, and that is uh, number three on sheet uh, QJ145. And the amendment is uh, the question is that the amendment be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Uh, Senator Patrick. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam uh, Chair. I, uh, I, I move, uh, seek leave to move um, Amendment 1 and 2 on sheet 1321 together. So, Senator Patrick, on my sheet, I've got one to seven. You only want to move one to two. So I'm dealing with sheet one three two one. Beg your pardon. <clears throat> uh, this is uh, an amendment that that uh, I know the government amendment, the government's yep. amendment that's that have just passed, have 
removed the uh, you know, part, some of the offensive parts of uh, Schedule 3. This seeks to remove the entirety of Schedule 3. Okay, and you're seeking leave to move one and two together. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. So, are you seeking the no? Okay. So the question is that um, will uh, they'll be put separately? So the question is that number two on sheet one three two one. The question is that schedule three, uh, as amended, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. <coughs> Against. I'm going to put it again. I only heard one voice. So the question is that Schedule 3, as amended, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? Aye. Uh, the noes have it. I'm going to put the second part of that of Senator Patrick's. Um, Would you like me to do the second one? Because that was consequential. Yes, beg your pardon, as you explained, Senator Patrick. That's consequential, so that's fallen away. Uh, I'm now in the hands of the Senate. Senator Patrick. Okay, I seek uh, leave to move uh, amendments one through seven together on uh, sheet one two six nine. And you're seeking leave to do that together. Is leave granted? Uh, leave is granted. Senator Patrick. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so this uh, this amendment seeks to uh, uh, delay st the stapling until the, f the first of the seventh two thousand and twenty two. Uh, it also seeks to include choice products in the performance test because they are currently not in the performance test. Um, it includes uh, administrative fees in the performance uh, tests, um, and it also uh, delays the performance testing commencing until the first of the seventh of uh, two thousand and twenty-three. Thank you, Senator Patrick, Minister. Uh, thank you. Um, Chair, uh, the amendments to Schedule 1 that delay the start date uh, of the stapling reforms by 12 months to 1st of July 2022, as put forward by Senator Patrick, will be opposed by the government. The amendments to Schedule 2 to increase the coverage of the performance test and the Your Future, Your Super comparison tool to choice products and mandate the inclusion of the administrative fees as part of the performance test methodology. Um, uh, the amendments will, these also delay Schedule 2 so that the performance test will commence for all products on the 1st of July 2023. Delaying Schedule 1 by even one year means that more unintended multiple accounts uh, will be created in this additional year, which will have a significantly detrimental impact on people's retirement savings. Members' retirement savings will be boosted if action is taken as soon as possible. On the uh, um, issue of underperformance and coverage, the performance test isn't relevant for products in which the members themselves select their investments. So further, retirement products have much broader goals such as income stability and also flexibility, as well as longevity risk management. Expanding the coverage of the Your Super comparison tool will severely diminish the usability of the tool. Um, on the issue of underperformance and administrative fees, the bill as drafted doesn't preclude the inclusion of administrative fees. Uh, by specifying that the regulations, mu the regulations must imp include administrative fees in the methodology, uh, that uh, limits the scope for flexibility to respond to changes in the future. And uh, the d in the under on the issue of underperformance and delay, delaying Schedule 2 will also delay the commencement of the Your Super comparison tool and mean that members will remain in underperforming products for an additional year. Senator Patrick. So I just want to check uh, with, the, with the minister because there, I know there are some other senators that are a little bit confused about this, but uh, can you confirm at this point in time uh, that the current bill has, uh, uh, leaves some funds that are not subject to the performance test? Minister. Uh, thank you, Chair. When the government announced the Your Future, Your Super policy back in October 2020, we set out a path for the extension of the My Super products in the first instance to include trustee directed products from the 1st of July 2022 and, uh, and an intent to expand to other investment options over time. And Treasury estimates that the performance test will cover 90 per cent of APRA regulated accumulation assets from the 1st of July 2022. Delivering on the intent to further extend the reach of the underperformance test, the government has tasked Treasury with undertaking a consultation process 
by 1 July 2022 to consider how best to expand the annual performance test to other superannuation products. And that includes non-trustee directed products and retirement phase products. So this will ensure that the performance test continues to have appropriate coverage. Senator McAllister. The opposition will be supporting Senator Patrick's amendment. Let's be really clear about the advice that's just been provided by the minister in response to this suggestion. The minister is confirming that the war on industry super continues. The minister is confirming that the government's endless ideological preference for paying a lot of attention to those funds, which the PC and Commissioner Hayne said perform quite well for members, will continue. But actually, no attention to be paid to the for-profit funds where the PC and Commissioner Hayne found a lot of problems. And that's the problem with this bill. It is a bill that is incredibly partisan in its nature. It's a bill that refuses to engage with the evidence about actual performance in the system. Everybody wants a high-performing system. Everybody thinks that when a worker is putting money into a superannuation fund, it should be a high-performing fund. But it's not what this bill delivers. This bill delivers a lot of scrutiny for the funds that do quite well and no scrutiny at all for a very long time for funds that have been shown again and again and again to be ripping off members. It's pathetic. Uh, Senator Hanson. Um, I'd like to ask the, the, member, uh, the minister a question on the factors. Isn't there an eight-year eight review um, period that these funds are reviewed and looked at on their performance basis? And if they're not, then they are, will be uh, adhered to by, the, by this legislation. Minister. Uh, yes, Senator Hanson, that's correct. The performance test or the underperformance test will apply to eight years of performance of, uh, of funds. Uh, and that includes uh, both uh, investment and administrative fees. And if a fund hasn't performed, if it hasn't lived up to you know, its ex to expectations, if what was written on the box isn't what is being delivered to members, well then that fund will have to write to members and tell them that they have underperformed. And not only that, but they also have, will be directed to that online comparison tool so they can, they're given a nudge, essentially, to find a product that might be better suited to them. And if a fund underperforms two years in a row, and we're talking 50 basis points below their own benchmark on a rolling eight-year average, if they underperform two years in a row, well, then they won't be allowed to accept new members. Existing members can stay there, but new members can't. The government believes that this is a very reasonable underperformance test, and it will sift out those that are good at what they do and those that aren't good at what they do, those that are delivering to their members and those that aren't delivering their to their members and that are hiding behind the skirts of those funds that are performing. Senator Hanson. Um, therefore, I want to ask you a question. If they're underperforming, the fact is that they're not returning um, uh, high returns to their customers and basically could they then reflect on the amount of fees that they're charging their customers and possibly reduce the fees to the customers to give them a better return on their funds? Is that a possibility? Minister. Yes, Senator Hanson, that's exactly what they can do and in fact this underperformance test will put a competitive pressure onto funds to reduce their fees, particularly those that have been uh, close to that underperformance benchmark for some time, they will be encouraged to reduce their fees in order to make that underperformance hurdle. I'm just going uh, to the leader of uh, government business, Minister. Thanks, uh, thanks, Chair. Look, I, uh, I understand that uh, the uh, calling of the result in relation to Senator Patrick's uh, amendment on sheet 1321, which was that Schedule 3 stand as printed, um, uh, may not uh, have uh, have. Uh, reflected the will of the chamber. It's not unusual that when we're having uh, the uh, standards printed question, that sometimes there's a little confusion in the resolution or application of that. Uh, can I uh, request that uh, that, that uh, question be put again, please, Chair? Uh, Senator McAllister. Uh, I have some questions for Senator Birmingham about the, his actual request, but procedurally, uh, can I clarify whether it's possible for Senator Birmingham to make this request? Uh, at a time when Senator Patrick has another matter before the chair. Um, well, we should really deal with the amendments before the chair, uh, but uh, Minister Birmingham has alert alerted us to the fact that the vote needs to be put again. 
So I'm in the hands of the Senate, um, Senator Patrick. So, Minister, I just want to confirm uh, in the in the statement you made about the monitoring of the performance of funds uh, and, uh, you know, and the notification that members get, uh, I understand that to only apply to approximately 90 per cent of the funds, I think was the number that you used. So th th there are 10 per cent of funds to which that regime does not apply. Is that correct? Minister. Senator Patrick, that is correct, but only for yes. the moment. The government has flagged its, extension, its intention to extend the uh, performance test to all products in the market and, in fact, has tasked Treasury with undertaking a consultation process by 1 July 2022 to consider how best to do that, because the data does not exist that will allow us to do that right now. The most important thing, though, is that the underperformance test applies to to my super products, to default products, those products that people go into unwittingly, that languish in for years unwittingly, and particularly if those funds are underperforming. And it will also apply from the 1st of July 2022 to trustee-directed products, so those multi-asset class products uh, where the trustee is the one that decides what the asset mix is going to be. The vast majority of products that remain are single-asset class products. They're very small in size, and they tend to be products that people have gone into on an advisory basis. Moreover, they tend to be products that people have gone into as part of a, a, a portfolio mix. So you don't go, put all your money into one gold fund, and if that one gold fund underperforms, it really doesn't make a difference because you've got an equity fund as well, an international equity fund or an Australian equity fund or an Australian bond fund, and you've done your own diversification. So most of those, the people in those funds are advised, and that's why they're in there. Senator McAllister. Uh, I'm conscious that we are moving rapidly towards the cutoff. I do have a question for Senator Birmingham. In his request that the chamber consider recommitting um, Senator Patrick's amendment uh, on sheet 1321, the minister indicated that the call had been wrong. Can I just seek clarification? It's not my understanding that the call was wrong. It's my understanding that Minister Hume voted the wrong way, which I would observe is a continuation of a debacle of a process throughout the entirety of this morning. Minister. Chair, uh, Chair as I uh, acknowledged, it's, it's not unusual, particularly in relation to the standards printed questions, when there is a uh, movement going backwards and forwards of questions uh, that, uh, that senators, as I have seen over the years from all sides, have, uh, have at times uh, needed to request that, uh, that a question be re-put uh, as a result of, uh, of the fact that they are opposing uh, an amendment, opposing an amendment uh, that is being put, uh, but to oppose the amendment, they need to vote in the affirmative. Uh, that is, uh, it's a quirk of Senate practice. The Senate has long acknowledged that uh, that it doesn't uh, make legislation by misadventure; that it reflects uh, the will accurately of the chamber, uh, and that is uh, that is why I make the request for. Uh, that to be recommitted uh, in relation to that question. Senator Hanson. Um, oh, I beg your pardon. Beg your pardon. But it is not unusual, Senator. And I think the minister is going to seek leave that the question be put at an appropriate time. So do. Thank you, Chair. Is leave granted? Right. Senator Hanson, you have the call. Senator, so just a few seconds of speech with regard to stapling. I want to draw attention that in 2013 the Labor Party voted for a cap from $25,000 to $35,000 for those people 50 years and over. So these are the battlers of Australia. Those people couldn't afford that extra $10,000 a year to go and into their super. Uh, $10,000 a year uh, resume for those your 50 seat. years. It being 11.45, we now uh, put the questions uh, pursuant to the orders. So the question which is immediately before the chair is uh, Senator Patrick's um, amendment. Uh, so that's one to seven on sheet one two six nine. And the question is that the amendments be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? Aye. Uh, believe the ayes have it. The ayes have it. The noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
Mr. Richard. Lock the door. So the question is that amendments one to seven on sheet one two six nine, as moved by Senator Patrick, be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Urquhart as teller for the ayes and Senator Davy as teller for the noes. Order, there being 30 ayes and 34 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. I'm now going to re-put um, Senator Patrick's amendment. So, uh, so the question, and that's a two on sheet 1321. And the question is that Schedule 3, as amended, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? No. Uh, I believe the ayes have it. No. Division required. Uh, ring the bells for one minute.
Uh, can we have the clock it's on now? Thanks. Order, lock the doors. So the question is that amendment two on sheet 1321 is moved by Senator Patrick. Uh, the question is that schedule three as amended be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Davey as teller for the ayes and Senator Urquhart as teller for the noes. Order. There being 34 ayes and 30 noes, the matter is resol resolved in the affirmative. I shall now deal with the amendments circulated by the opposition. So that's sheets 1308, 1320, 1323, and 1324. And the question is that items 3, 5, 10, 14, 20, 22 and subsection 34.2b in item 6 of Schedule 3 stand as printed. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? No. Uh, I believe the ayes have it. Okay. Division required. Ring the bell for one minute. <clears throat> Order, lock the doors. 
So the question is at items 3, 5, 10, 14, 20, 22 and subsection 342 b in item 6 of Schedule 3 stand as printed. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Davey as teller for the ayes and Senator Urquhart as teller for the noes. Order, there being 34 ayes and 30 noes, the matter is resolved in the affirmative. I'll now move to the remaining uh, amendments of the opposition on sheet 1308 and 1324 and the amendments on sheet 1320 and 1323 circulated by the opposition. So the question is, um, those amendments be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against? No. Uh, I believe the noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Uh, order. Lock the doors. So the question now is that the remaining amendments on sheet order 1308 and 1324 and the amendments on sheets 1320 and 1323 uh, circulated by the amendment be agreed to, by the opposition be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Urquhart as teller for the ayes and Senator Davey as teller for the noes.
order. Uh, there being 30 ayes and 34 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. I now move to um, <clears throat> the amendments on sheet one to three. Amendments one to three on sheet one two one eight revised, uh, as moved by Senator Patrick. And the question is that the amendments be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against. I uh, believe the ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. <clears throat> Four minutes. Yep. Lock the doors. So the question is that uh, amendments on sheet one two one eight 
revised uh, as circulated by Senator Patrick be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Urquhart as teller for the ayes and Senator Davey as teller for the noes. Order. There being 30 ayes and 34 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. So, pursuant to order, I shall now report from the Committee of the Whole. The Committee has considered the Treasury Laws Amendment, Your Future, Your Super Bill uh, 2021, and agreed to it with amendments. Uh, Minister. I move that the report of the Committee now be adopted. Oh. Beg your pardon. Beg your pardon. So I'll now hand over to the president. So the question now is that the remaining stages of the bill be agreed to and the bill be now passed. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. Aye. The ayes have it. Aye. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Four minutes. Four minutes at the request of the whips.
Lock the doors. The question is the remaining stages of the bill be agreed to and the bill be now passed. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator Davey Teller for the ayes, Senator Urquhart Teller for the noes. The result of the division is ayes 34, noes 30. The matter is resolved in the affirmative. The clerk. Bill for an act to amend the law relating to superannuation and for related purposes. So we will now return to the routine of business. Are there any notices of motion to be given for another day? Senator Fioravanti Wells. President, pursuant to notice given yesterday on behalf of the Standing Committee for the Scrutiny of Delegated Legislation, I withdraw business of the Senate notice of motion number one for three sitting days Order. after today. Just keep the noise in the chamber down a bit so I can hear Senator Fioravanti Wells, if we could. Proposing Please. the yes. disallowance of the Law Enforcement Integrity Commissioner Amendment Law Enforcement Agencies Regulations 2020 and business of the Senate notices of motion numbers three and four for 10 sitting days after today proposing the disallowance of the Competition and Consumer Consumer Data Right Amendment Rules No. 3 2020 and National Health Data Matching Principles 2020 and Business of the Senate Notice of Motion No. 1 for 13 sitting days after today, proposing the disallowance of the Telecommunications Fibre Ready Facilities Exempt Real Estate Development Projects Instrument 2021. Thank you, Senator Ferravanti Wells. There are no other notices of motion. Is there a report from the Selection of Bills Committee? Senator Dean Smith. Thank you very much, Mr. President. I present the sixth report of 2021 of the Selection of Bills Committee, and I seek leave to have the report incorporated into Hansard. Is leave granted? It is. I move that the report be adopted. Thank you. Senator Dunningham. Uh, I move the following amendment at the end of the motion. Add and the Ministerial Suitability Commission of Inquiry Bill 2021 not be referred to a committee. Senator Waters. Uh, President, I move to amend that amendment in the terms circulated uh, by my own amendment, AG1, namely to replace the words not be referred to committee with the words be referred immediately to the Legal and Constitutional Affairs Legislation Committee for inquiry and report by 10 August 2021. Now, what we saw yesterday was only the fifth time in this chamber's history that a government has blocked a bill being read a first time. What we're now seeing is a government attempting to block a private member's bill going to inquiry. This is an absolute debasement of process. This is a government throwing its weight around in order to uh, protect one of its own. Let's call this for what it is. This is a protection racket for Minister Christian Porter because this government doesn't want to face an inquiry into whether he raped a woman decades ago. That's what's under debate here. And rather than respect process 
and rather than have the Prime Minister do the decent thing and actually undertake an inquiry himself or, or have cause for an inquiry to be undertook, they just want to silence uh, the voices of so many people who are demanding justice and try to pretend that everything's fine and that um, you know th this isn't a problem at all. Well, this is not going to fly. How long are you going to uh, put up a protection racket for Minister Porter and keep this alleged rapist in the cabinet? How long? We won't stop moving to introduce this bill, and we won't stop moving to try to send it to inquiry. And I want to, I want to go into the, uh, the allegations, but I want to make an important point of principle. Private members are able to introduce private members' bills. We are also able to refer bills to inquiry. It is a virtual matter of course. It is highly unprecedented for a government to stand in the way of a private member's bill uh, to be read a first time and, even more unusual, to stand in the way of a private member's bill going to inquiry. This should send chills down the spine of everyone who is interested in having a government that is accountable and open to scrutiny. I, if this is a slide towards a dictatorship in aid of protecting an alleged rapist in the cabinet. You could not make this stuff up. Now, yesterday we had Joe Dyer, who is a friend of Kate, um, the woman who alleges that Christian Porter raped her many decades ago. We had Joe Dyer in the chamber, and she was incredulous that this government would stoop to such lengths as to stop this issue being talked about. Uh, and she made the point to the media that, in fact, this issue won't stop being talked about. You might try to silence us. But we are not going anywhere. 90,000 people signed a petition calling for an inquiry into whether Minister Porter should remain a minister, and there is many more thousands of people that would like to have confidence in the organs of government but cannot. And there are many more women who have been raped or sexually assaulted, in fact, 90 per cent of whom who have not gone to police because why? They fear they won't be believed. Your actions today and yesterday send a message that women will not be believed when we speak out about assaults that we have experienced, and that is an absolute abomination. And the motives that you are sending that message for to protect one of your own, to protect the boys' club, it is an absolute horrific occurrence. Uh, I am almost lost for words that you would sink to these lows rather than simply letting justice run its course and having the Prime Minister do the right thing and inquire into whether or not his ministers are fit to remain so. That is the point of the Prime, Ministerial, uh, Prime Minister's ministerial statement of standards. That is the point of that document. If there is no point of that document, we'll just shred it, like you have your credibility. I am hopeful that the crossbench will see that if the government can block me introducing a bill and can block me sending a bill to inquiry, that can do the very same to them. Perhaps it's veteran suicide. Um, perhaps it's something that One Nation wants to progress, although they seem to have quite ready access to this government. But the principle is the government of the day should not be able to stop private senators introducing bills and having those bills sent to inquiry. Now, I expected that you would have simply shrunk the time for the inquiry, blocked any public hearings from going ahead and done it all on the papers. That's what I expected. I expected that level of nefariousness. What I didn't expect was you to just block this from going to inquiry at all. I will ask the researchers to work out how often this has happened, but this is a slide into a dictatorship by this government who are allergic to secrecy, who are desperate, uh, allergic to transparency. They love secrecy, and they are desperate to protect an alleged rapist in their own cabinet, and they're sending a message to every woman in this nation who's been raped or assaulted that they don't believe her. Senator Hanson. Thank you very much. I would like to respond to that comment by Senator Walters with regards to a private members' bill. I was one of the ones that actually blocked it as well, and I will do it again and again and again. I think that private members' bill was absolutely disgusting to think that this parliament could put up and see whether a member of parliament elected by the people to be a fit and proper person. When this parliament was set up and under our constitution we have a separation of powers between the judicial and the parliament, that is not the case here. A private members' bill of this nature means that they want to be actors, judge and jury. This has been before the Police. There's no allegations because the person who has made the allegations to a friend 
is now passed away. So therefore, he has been before the, the police to see if there's a case to answer here. We are not here to, to act as a judicial part of this parliament uh, to see if someone should be a fit and proper person. I could name someone in the, in the Greens party who I think should come under that also. I could put up a private member's bill and say whether they should be a fit and proper person here to be here in this parliament as well. So where does it stop? Who's the next one who's going to be called out? I think it's absolutely disgusting of the Greens to carry on as if they have the right to bring anyone to, to call to justice when we have a judicial system to actually do that, not a private member's bill. We have not rejected a private member's bill in this place. And why it was done is because of the wording to say whether a member of parliament is fit and proper. That is not up to this parliament. It's not up to inquiry. It is not up to you to investigate whether he's guilty or not. Order. That is up to the courts to decide that. We have a process of justice in this country, and if we allow this to happen, who will be the next one in line who uh, they are disagreeable with? So I am fully supportive of Christian Porter to get on and do the job that he was elected to do, and the fact is that it will be the people of his electorate who will make the decision, not the Greens, not anyone else pushing their own agenda. And it is not up to you. So allow it up to our judicial system to deal with this. And we have a, a system in place. I think it's disgusting and appalling for you to be carrying on again like you do um, to get um, some, as if you got. Um, I, I can't even say who you are. You just, you just, you're absolutely. It is absolutely shameful and disgusting that you are actually doing this. Senator Patrick. Thank you, Mr. Uh, President. Just to make a brief uh, comment, because I think it is worth distinguishing the role of the judiciary versus the role of the Senate. The role of the judiciary is to, in fact, deal with uh, either criminal or civil offences, uh, and uh, uh, which is not the subject of this particular amendment. This goes to the fitness of a uh, of a member of parliament to be a minister, uh, a part of the executive. Uh, and it is in fact a constitutional duty for the Senate to have oversight of government. Uh, it is a, uh, a principle or a key pillar of a responsible system of government that the cabinet is responsible to, a leg to the legis legislature. And so in that, uh, 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 I, I just want to distinguish that uh, th th there are um, two, two issues. One, uh, one, one could be judicial, one is clearly a, a proper matter for the, for, the, for the Senate in the execution of its constitutional responsibilities. I say nothing as to um, the allegations that have been raised, but it is appropriate that uh, if a question is raised, then uh, it can be examined by the Senate. Senator Roberts. Thank you, to speak, uh, Mr. President. First of all, I want to quote Senator Waters. She said, let justice run its course. Now, firstly, I want to make a comment that rape is a terrible, terrible, terrible crime. But the answer for any crime is the law and upholding the law. So let justice run its course. We need to, we need to have... I need to note that, this, that the Greens are implicitly finding Mr Porter guilty. Hung and drawn, quartered, guilty, and yet we have seen no trial. We have seen no trial. The police, as I understand it, the parliament is responsible for making the laws of our country. The police are responsible for enforcing those laws, and the judiciary is responsible for adjudicating on those laws. We need that process, not to supplant it by a, a, pro, a process within this parliament. That is why I oppose it, and that's why I want justice to run its course. We see the Greens as, as abusing parliamentary process. Petitions do not decide ministerial appointments and do not decide whether a minister stays or is removed. That's why we oppose what the Greens are trying to do. So there being no other contributions, I will put the amendment moved by Senator Waters to the amendment moved by Senator Dunningham. So this is the question on Senator Waters' amendment. Those in support of that amendment say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. no. The noes have it. Aye. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
Lock. Sorry. Lock the doors. The question is the amendment moved by Senator Waters be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator Urquhart, tell off the ayes. Senator Dean Smith, tell off the noes. The result of the division is ayes 29, noes 31. The matter is resolved in the negative. Senators, I give this warning. The bells are only going to be rung for one minute for what will be a series of divisions, so do not leave the chamber. Um, the question now is that the amendment moved by Senator Dunningham be agreed to. Is everyone clear? The question is that the motion moved by Senator Dunningham be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. Aye. The ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Lock the doors. The question is the, mo the amendment moved by Senator Dunningham be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair. The noes to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator Smith tell off the ayes and Senator Urquhart tell off the noes.
Sorry, one more. The result of the division is ayes 32, noes 30. The matter is resolved in the affirmative. Senator Rustin. Oh, sorry, Senator Steeljot. Uh, move an amendment. Yeah, sorry, uh, I was going to deal with the next government amendment, then come to your amendment, Senator Steeljohn. Yep, sorry. That's why I called Senator Rustin. It's just next in my pile. Senator Rustin, do you want to? Oh, thank you, Mr. President. Um, uh, can I please move the following amendment to the Selection of Bills Committee Report No. 6 of 2021, um, and at the end of the motion add, and the following bills not be referred to committees? Uh, A. The Fuel Security Bill 2021, Fuel Security Consequential and Transitional Provisions Bill 2021, uh, and the Water Legislation Amendment Inspector General of Water Compliance and Other Measures Bill uh, 2021, please, Mr. President. So, unless there's any contributions, I'm going to put that amendment. Does your your amendment doesn't relate to that one? It's a separate amendment, isn't it, Senator Steeljohn? So, I'm going to put the amendment moved by Senator Rustin. Those in support of the amendment say aye. aye. Is the contrary no? no? The ayes have it. No. Oh, sorry, Senator Patrick, you're seeking the call. I just wanted to say something very briefly about the amendment. Uh, one of the concerns I have in relation to the fuel security bill, uh, I'm actually generally supportive of that particular bill, but I'm worried that uh, at some later stage we're going to get to a, a point on a Wednesday where a time motion is going to be moved. We won't get to have this uh, looked at at the committee stage or by way of a Senate committee, and then we won't get to, to debate it in the chamber because I note every Wednesday we're seeing a, we're seeing a, uh, a motion moved that deals with with time motions, and uh, we have to rethink that. In, in relation to the Inspector General uh, of the Murray-Darling uh, Basin, uh, that's a really, really important role. I note that the bill is quite complicated. It involves uh, uh, pe penalties uh, uh, and uh, indictable offences. Time, time for this debate has expired. Uh, it being 12.45, I intend to deal with the questions before the chair, which include the selection of bills committee report, and uh, that will include your amendment coming next, Senator Steele. John, I'll give you if, with the consent of the chamber. So I'm going to put the amendment moved by Senator Rustin. Those of that opinion supporting the amendment say aye. aye. The contrary, no. Aye. The ayes have it. No. Division required. No. I would like it. Yep. So the Greens would like their dissent to that amendment acknowledged. Senator Patrick, are you the same? Same for Senator Patrick. I appreciate, the Chamber appreciates that. Senator Steelejohn, your amendment. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. I'd like to move uh, an amendment to the government uh, scrutiny uh, bills report uh, to amend uh, that, but in respect of the provisions of the National Disability Insurance Scheme Amendment, improving supports for at-risk participants bill. 2021, the Community Affairs Legislation Committee report by the 12th of August 2021. Question is, that amendment be agreed to? Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. So I'll now put the adoption of the selection of bills committee report with the amendments of Senator Dunningham, Senator Rustin, and Senator Steele John Incorporated. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Now I'll call Senator Rustin to, or Senator Dunham to deal with the matters to be dealt with from now. Senator Dunham. Uh, thanks, Mr. President. I move that a government business orders of the day, as shown on today's order of business, be considered from 12:45 p.m. today, and b government business be called on after consideration of the bills listed in paragraph a and considered till not later than 2 p.m. today. 
and C. General business notice of motion number 1144 be considered during general business today. And D. Following the private senators' bills be considered on Monday. The following private senators' bills be considered on Monday, the 21st of June 2021. The Migration Amendment New Maritime Crew Visas Bill 2020, Coag Reform Fund Amendment No Electric Vehicle Taxes Bill 2020, and the Snowy Hydro Corporatisation Amendment No New Fossil Fuels Bill 2021 Number no. 2. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. With the consent of the Chamber, I'm going to deal with leave of absence for senators. Senator Smith. Thank you, Mr. President. I seek leave to move a motion relating to leave of absence for Senator Askew. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Senator Smith. I move that leave of absence be granted to Senator Askew for today for medical reasons. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Urquhart, do you have any similar? No. I'll call the clerk. Government Business Order of the Day number six, Education Legislation Amendment uh, 2021 Measures number two, Bill 2021, resumption of second reading debate. Senator Brown. Labor supports this bill. This bill makes administrative changes to the Higher Education Support Act and the Education Services for Overseas Students Act designed to fix uncontroversial and recognised issues in the existing legislation. The bill amends the citizenship requirements within the Higher Education Loan Program to ensure that students on humanitarian visas do not lose access for travelling overseas after spending five years in Australia and empowers the Minister to extend availability of help from 1 January 2022 to students who have previously held permanent humanitarian visas. This is a worthwhile change that improves access to Australia's world-class higher education system for visa holders. The bill also contains a number of other technical amendments which... Oh. I'm sorry, uh, could we just have everyone who is not participating in this debate please clear the chamber and could we make sure the microphone is working for Senator Brown? Hello? Can you hear that now, <laughs> Senator Seward? Go ahead, Senator Brown. Um, which remedy the nomenclature of the university funding club? clusters where Indigenous languages are classified as foreign languages, streamline the operation of grant funding, clarify the operation of grant funding arrangements under the Liberals' increased university fees and extend the ESOS Act to, in, to former registered providers to strengthen the operation of the tuition protection scheme. Labor does not oppose any of these measures. Minister. I commend the bill to the Senate. Mm. The question is that the bill be read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. Again, say no. The ayes have it. Clerk. The bill for an act to amend the law relating to education and for related purposes. As no amendments have been circulated unless a senator requires that we go into committee stage. We will move to the third reading. Minister. I move the bill be now read a third time. The question is that the bill be now read a third time. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. Clerk. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to education and for related purposes. Government Order of the day number seven, Competition and Consumer Amendment Motor Vehicle Service and Repair Information Sharing Scheme Bill 2021, resumption of second reading debate. Senator Brown. Uh, thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. No matter what make, a, uh, make or model of the car they own, Australians should be able to choose where they get their car serviced or repaired. For years, car manufacturers and large dealerships have tightly guarded the technical information required by independent mechanics to safely carry out servicing and repairs on motor vehicles. Labor supports the Competition and Consumer Amendment Motor Vehicle Service and Repair Information Sharing Scheme Bill 2021. In fact, we have been calling for this very change for a long time. In 2011, the Parliamentary Secretary to the Treasurer, the Hon. David Bradbury, requested the Commonwealth Consumer Affairs Advisory Council report on the consumer harm caused by the lack of access to service and repair information. As a result of that report, the Gillard government endorsed the need for a code of conduct between independent automotive repairers and car manufacturers to allow repairers across to access to the data they need from manufacturer to service modern cars. Unfortunately, the progress on a compulsory scheme stalled under this government. That is why in May 2018, Labor announced that following the Australian Competition and Consumer 
Commission's 2017 report, its new car retailing industry market study, Labor would put in place a mandatory code requiring manufacturers to share with independent mechanics the information they need to fix modern cars. We proposed a mandatory code because it was clear that the voluntary code had been put in place in 2014 requiring manufacturers to share data and technical information with independent mechanics wasn't working. Over the past 10 years, Labor has been advocating for fair access to data. We have listened to and met with a larger number, number of automotive and consumer organisations and independent mechan mechanics advocating for the provisions of this bill. We know that more choice gives consumers a better deal on car service and repairs, and that's more money back in the pockets of car owners. This bill amends the Competition and Consumer Act to establish a scheme that mandates all services and repair information provided to car dealership networks and manufacturer of preferred repairs be made available for independent repairs and the registered training organisations to purchase. This bill will level the playing field by addressing some of the power imbalances between multinational manufacturers, independent mechanics and small business repairers. Although relevant across Australia, this power imbalance is particularly evident in re regional, rural and remote Australia, where vehicle owners have fewer choices for servicing and repairs. In some locations, there are no authorised dealers, so consumers must travel long distances or tow vehicles to other locations, causing them time and money, while smaller local repairers lose out on business. After Labor flagged the, un the underlying reasons and need for this bill with a policy announcement in May 2018, we are pleased to see the government has finally acted. The government's decision to adopt Labor's policy is an, over, is an overdue win for consumers, for small business repairers and car owners who have been campaigning for this change. It will encourage competition and give Australians greater choice around where they service and repair their vehicles. Minister. And the bill to the Senate. The question is that the bill will now be read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. Then say no. I believe the ayes have it. Uh, as no amendments have been circulated. Oh, sorry, Clark. A bill for an act to amend the Competition and Consumer Act 2010 in relation to sharing information for motor vehicle service and repair and for related purposes. As no amendments have been circulated, does any senator require a committee stage? If not, then I shall call on the minister to do the third reading. I move the bill be now read a third time. Uh, the question is that the bill be read a third time. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Clark. A bill for an act to amend the Competition and Consumer Act 2010 in relation to sharing information for motor vehicle service and repair and for related purposes. Government Business Order of the Day number 8, Higher Education Support Amendment, extending the Student Loan Fee Exemption Bill 2021, resumption of second reading debate. Senator Brown. Uh, thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Labor will support this legislation. This legislation makes sensible amendments to extend the ex extension of the fee help loan fee. Under the current arrangement, students who require financial assistance through fee help to study at a private non-university higher education provider must pay a 20 per cent loan fee on top of the loan. And Of course, Labor supports this bill because the benefits of this ex exemption flow to the students. Minister. Uh, I commend the bill to the Senate. The question is that the bills now be read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. I think the ayes have it. Clark. Bill for an act to amend the Higher Education Support Act 2003 in relation to the amount of fee help debt and for related purposes. No amendments have been circulated. Does any senator require a committee stage? If not, I shall call the minister to move the third reading. I move the bill be now read a third time. The question is that the bill be read a third time. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. I think the ayes have it. Clark. The bill for an act to amend the Higher Education Support Act 2003 in relation to the amount of a fee help debt and for related purposes. A message. Uh, the President has received a message from the House of Representatives forwarding the Medical and Midwife Indemnity Legislation Amendment Bill 2021 for concurrence. Minister. I move that this bill may proceed without formalities and be now read a first time. Uh, the question is that the bill be now read a first time. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. Uh, Clark. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to medical and midwife indemnity and for related purposes. Minister. 
I move this, uh, that this bill be now read a second time, and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated in Hansard. Uh, is leave granted? Leave is granted. Uh, Senator Brown. Um, Labor supports the medical midwife uh, indemnity, indemnity legislation amendment bill 2021. This bill amends the Allied Health High Costs Claims uh, Scheme and the Allied Health Exceptional Claims Indemnity Scheme to ensure businesses and employ midwives, regardless of the endorsement state status will be covered by the scheme. This bill will expand the coverage of the professional indemnity insurance schemes to a group of midwives who, due to gaps in the current legislation, have been excluded due to their endorsement status. This bill extends the midwife professional indemnity scheme, or the MPIS, to cover midwives employed by private practice and removes the requirement that midwives must be the sole owners of a practice to receive the cover offered. That's it. Minister. I commend the bill to the Senate. The question is that the bill be now read a second time. Those that have opinion say aye. Against say no. The ayes have it. Clark. The bill for an act to amend the law relating to medical and midwife indemnity and for related purposes. No amendments have been circulated. Does any senator require a committee stage? If not, I shall call the minister to move the third reading. I move that the bill be now read a third time. The question is that the bill be now read a third time. Those of that opinion say aye. I get say no. The ayes have it. Clark. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to medical and midwife indemnity and for related purposes. Oops, a bit. Government Business Order of the Day number nine, Narcotic Drugs Amendment Medicinal Cannabis Bill 2021, resumption of second reading debate. Senator Brown. Uh, Labor supports the Na Narcotic Drugs Amendment Med Medicinal Cannabis Bill 2021. These still there still remains much to be done in the emerging area of the therapeutic use of medicinal cannabis. The legislation implements a number of recommendations from the Macmillan review of the original legislation that was passed in this place in 2016 and streamlines various processes for industry participants. Medicinal cannabis is a very fast developing therapeutic product not just here in Australia but across the world, a product derived from the cannabis plant which has some 80 to 100 different um, cannabinoids, only two of which are used for medicinal or, th or th therapeutic purposes as opposed to recreation. Labor acknowledges Australia is outstanding me medicines approvals authority, the Therapeutic Goods Administration, which has re the responsibility for assessing and then approving a therapeutic goods and registering those goods on the a ARTG, the Australian Register of Therapeutic Goods. Currently, the lack of affordable, safe approved products available as part of the existing legal framework for the TGA and this legislation are all leading to the vast bulk of Australians using medicinal cannabis products to access them outside the legal framework. Senator Seward. Chair, I rise today to speak on um, the Narcotic Drugs Amendment Medicinal Cannabis Bill 2021. This bill implements a select number of the recommendations from the review of medicinal cannabis of the scheme um, undertaken by Professor John McMillan in 2019. It makes a number of administrative changes to the licensing scheme and application process for medicinal for medicinal cannabis suppliers. It will introduce a single licence for cultivation, production, manufacture and research of medicinal cannabis. This bill creates a perpetual licence and periodic permit structure for most activities for which a medicinal cannabis licence is required. This should reduce administrative burden on the industry, but it's unclear whether these benefits will result in better processing times and reduce costs for patients. This bill also provides that assessments relating to supply chains are to be undertaken later in the application process, at the permit, sta at, at the permit stage instead of the licence stage. This is a positive change as it's difficult for medicinal cannabis suppliers to identify supply chains at the start of their licence application process when their business is still developing. It makes sense for the department to evaluate supply chains later in the application process at the time when permits are being sought. The Greens do support this bill. These changes will improve application times and reduce the regulatory burden on the applications and licensees. In theory, reducing the burden on industry will result in lower-priced medicinal cannabis drugs. But 
Will the regulatory costs for industry really be reduced to such an extent that the benefits will flow through to Australian patients? Will this bill really result in expanded medicinal cannabis supply pathways? This, of course, remains to be seen, and we'll be watching it closely. The government claims this bill reaffirms their commitment to patient availability of safe, legal, sustainable supply of cannabis um, derived medicines. However, it is clear from my discussions with stakeholders that this bill does little to meaningfully improve patient access to medicinal cannabis. The government needs to take further practical steps to ensure more affordable, accessible local products are available for Australian patients. Medicinal cannabis is an important drug used to treat or alleviate many health conditions and circumstances, including epilepsy, multiple sclerosis, chronic pain, chemotherapy-induced nausea and in palliative care. Yet most Australians who need access to medicinal cannabis have no choice but to access it through the black market, as the committee inquiry last year heard. Researchers predict that over 600,000 Australians are using cannabis for medicinal reasons, but the vast majority are forced to source medicinal cannabis illegally. The Community Affairs committee in, uh, Senate Committee inquiry into current barriers to patient access to medicinal cannabis in Australia reported in March last year. During this inquiry, we heard from patients across the country who had been unable to access medicinal cannabis treatments um, that they need due to regulatory barriers and enormous cost. Cost is a hugely prohibitive factor for patients needing access to medicinal cannabis. It's completely unacceptable that people can be out of pocket thousands, that's what we heard, thousands of dollars for trying to access legal medicinal cannabis products through a regulate, for the regulate, regulated system when the black market is far cheaper. Doctors are interested in prescribing medicinal cannabis but they say they don't have the skills or knowledge required. There is no streamlined program for delivering education in this area. Doctors shouldn't be turning patients away because of the complexities of prescribing medicinal cannabis and um, their lack of training in how to, how to prescribe and, uh, and use medicinal cannabis. Nothing has progressed to meaningfully improve patient access to medicinal cannabis since the Senate inquiry reported last year. When the government handed down its response to the Senate inquiry, I was very disappointed to see that they did not accept some of the key recommendations, including Recommendation 5, which stated, if the TGA failed to address barriers to regulation, then a new independent regulator should be considered. It's clear that we haven't fixed the issues around regulation yet. Again, I'm calling on the government to fix these issues around regulation or put in place the independent regulator immediately. Patients are sick of waiting and they shouldn't be kept waiting any longer. Ignorance, and I have to say, perhaps an area of ideology here, are getting in the way of patient care, and this has to stop. We know what to do. Medicinal cannabis is safer than many prescribed drugs, such as opioids, which can be diverted and cause fatal overdose. And we've seen lots of media about the problems there. Yet Australian patients are needlessly suffering because they can't access affordable medicinal cannabis. The current system doesn't work. It's broken and patients who need medicinal cannabis are paying the price. It's time for the government to implement all the recommendations of the Senate inquiry into medicinal cannabis to ensure that all Australians have access to the medicine they need. It's just plain cruel, in our opinion, to deny people access to treatments when we know they work, when we know that it gives people better quality of life. Unfortunately, this bill has missed an opportunity to put patients at the centre. It's time to take action and transform, and, and transform these symbolic steps into meaningful change. The Greens are ready to work with all sides of this place to make medicinal cannabis more affordable and accessible to all patients who need it. Having said that, we will be supporting, as I articulated, we will be supporting this bill, but this cannot be the final word. We need more urgent action so that patients can access medicinal, medicinal cannabis that is uh, affordable. Thank you, Senator Seaworth. Senator Wish Wilson. Good acting, Deputy oh, President. sorry, Senator Roberts, um, I think, was the next on the speaking order. Senator Roberts, my apologies. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. 
As a servant to the people of Queensland and Australia, we support the Narcotics Drug Amendment Medical Medicinal Cannabis Bill 2021 because it does implement a large number of the recommendations of the Macmillan Report, and that's why we will be supporting this bill. Implementation of medicinal cannabis in Australia was reviewed by Professor Macmillan of the Australian National University in 2018, and the report presented to the government in July of 2019, almost two years ago. One Nation has been attempting to get this legislation before the parliament since November 2019. Finally, after almost two years, here it is. And what a moribund display. Professor Macmillan's report looked at the supply side of medicinal cannabis, not the medical decision making. That was a shame, as the pathway system is heavily flawed. Medicinal cannabis will remain out of reach of everyday Australians who are unable to navigate the obstacle course put in place by the government that was seemingly designed to prevent large-scale access. They want to stop this. My constituents in rural and regional Queensland find it especially hard to access a doctor approved to prescribe medicinal cannabis. It would appear that prizing the pharmaceutical industry's hands off prescription pads is a task for which this government lacks the will. In fact, we've seen an orgy of spending on pharmaceutical industry products in recent months without the slightest attempt at safety testing. Products that the Chief Medical Officer, the Therapeutic Goods Administration and the Secretary of the Department of Health refused to endorse as 100 per cent safe. Compare that sloppiness and lackadaisical approach to the rules applied to medicinal cannabis, where thousands of years of experience and 30 years of research established the safety of medicinal cannabis is far in excess, far in excess of the experimental, provisionally approved vaccines that this government rushed to purchase and is now forcing on an unwilling population. This bill, though, is long overdue. The changes to licensing will have a significant impact. Previously, anyone wanting to invest in medicinal cannabis production needed to apply for separate licenses for growing, processing and production, each lasting 12 months and issued at different times. Each license had fees and endless rules which created a huge compliance cost and introduced a substantial risk. Any cannabis business was in danger of losing their license at any time, through no fault of their own. It takes a year to build out a production facility, with no guarantee that the license would be renewed. What incentive was there for small players to invest in medicinal cannabis? As a result, the industry has become dominated by a small number of publicly listed companies. As with any industry, Madam Acting Deputy President, competition is king. A heavily regulated industry occupied by a small number of corporates is not in Australia's best interest. And I'm pleased that Professor Macmillan saw that. This legislation combines the three licenses into one and extends the term to five years with no automatic renewal for companies with, sorry, with an automatic renewal for companies with a good record of governance. This will encourage new and smaller entrants to enter the market, and in turn, prices will fall, and that's what we need. The new license for research is also a good measure. Research is currently funded by powerful interests associated with maintaining the status quo, no medicinal cannabis, rather than those seeking to expand human knowledge of the wonderful new world of the human endocannabinoid system. I look forward to new findings on the effects of the 460 compounds in cannabis that interact with the human endocannabinoid system to help our bodies heal themselves. Heal themselves. That's what's beautiful about medical can medicinal cannabis. The benefit of medicinal cannabis documented in pharmacopoeias dating back 200 years is now proven with medical research around the world. So very little of that research, though, is Australian. This new research licence should create a new avenue for Australian academics to do something useful for a change. There's still much to be done when cannabis comes under the pathway system in Australia costs 100 times what the same item costs in the United States, 
Australians deserve far better. A One Nation initiative last year saw a relaxation of the licensing system for the production of cannabis for export. Now, I do believe the cannabis community missed the huge benefit in the Export Control Act 2020 amendment. Australia is now seeing the benefit of that legislation with new facilities under construction, increasing supply and lowering the retail price for domestic sales. Not to mention bringing jobs and wealth into local communities legally. A new $400 million facility has been announced near Wellcamp Airport in Toowoomba, set to open the, the year after next. This facility will export $1 billion worth of cannabis to the world market. With those export volumes will come further reductions in the price charged to Australian patients. Now with the sensible changes to licensing in the Narcotic Drugs Amendment Medicinal Cannabis Bill 2020, 2021, sorry, price reduction should flow through quite quickly, and we're pleased to see that. One Nation is proud of the work we've been doing these last two years to bring Australian whole plant natural medicinal cannabis to anyone with a me medical need by doctor's prescription supplied by a chemist. We also note that the government is looking to reschedule low THC cannabis into Schedule 3 as an over-the-counter chemist-only medication. One Nation supports that reschedule, enthusiastically supports that reschedule, and would ask the government to get on with it. And we are happy to work with the government improving, in improving in any way medicinal cannabis access to the, by the people of our country. Thank, Thank you. you. Senator Roberts. Senator Wish Wilson. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Uh, just last week, I was presenting to the National Farmers Federation uh, National Conference in Launceston, where I live, uh, their regionalisation agenda 2030, uh, the potential benefits uh, to Tasmanian uh, primary producers of the industrial hemp industry and the medicinal cannabis industry. And it was ironic that one of the things that we discussed was that the last time we saw the Narcotics Act amended, was to allow uh, Australian uh, growers to export medicinal cannibal products, medicinal cannabis products to the world, uh, particularly to the Canadian market and, of course, to the US market in California. Uh, and yet, while the minister, the primary uh, production minister, uh, Dave, Mr. David Littleproud, uh, was bagging that. Australians are the fourth big, now the fourth biggest exporter of medicinal cannabis products to the world, Australian farmers and companies, uh, and we could potentially be the biggest, according to the minister. Uh, he won't let those companies and those primary producers sell their products to Australian consumers, except under extremely restrictive, strict conditions, uh, which my colleague Senator. <laughs> Mind blowing, <laughs> which my colleague Senator Seawert has already gone into today. Um, and it, it's ironic that while uh, if, if, if you have a moral issue uh, or an ideological issue with uh, you know, making cannabis products available to medical patients, why would we be uh, bragging about the job that Australian farmers and companies are doing in terms of their export numbers without actually thinking, well, shouldn't we be making those products? Uh, more easily available to Australians who are suffering and who need them. Um, Senator Seawitz also mentioned uh, how expensive these products are. Uh, it makes perfect sense that if we have uh, that production diverted to local sources, uh, that of course we're going to have more supply and it's going to make those products uh, more accessible and cheaper to Australian, Australians who need to use them. Uh, I also pointed out to the Tasmanian producers, and I've been in trouble for talking about this before, Acting Deputy President, but Tasmania is the poppy state. Tasmanian farmers have made a lot of money over many years, uh, not only growing poppies and exporting to the world, but Australian companies like Tas Alkaloids were actually the companies that invented painkillers like OxyContin. That in fact, that was synthesised and invented in Tasmania and exported to the world. And that particular drug and others of that family have been linked recently in massive US court cases uh, with some of the biggest court cases, liability court cases, in US history 
hundreds of billions of dollars of damages being sought from pharmaceutical companies for, for selling and distributing OxyContin, because it is so highly addictive. It's one of the most addictive narcotics that a human being can take, and yet it's legal. It's legal. Um, so I don't blame Tasmanian farmers for growing poppies, uh, but I know many of them are struggling with the moral dilemmas that the product that they've been making, that was invented and synthesised in Tasmania, has been linked to this plague of death and addiction in the US. And um, just from a risk diversification point of view, I was encouraging Tasmanian farmers to look at industrial hemp and its many applications, as well as uh, the medicinal cannabis market. But they're restricted to exporting it. They can't make it at the moment for local consumption. So I think that's a, that's a really important point. And I was joined in my presentation by Tim Schmidt, who's the head of the Tasmanian Hemp Association and also on the national board of hemp. Now, while uh, Tim's group advocates for industrial hemp, and industrial hemp can be used uh, to make medicinal cannabis products. It can be used. There is an industrial process for that. Uh, and his organisation doesn't strictly advocate for medicinal cannabis in, its, uh, in terms of other species of cannabis. Um, he recognised the profitability for farmers. And, and of course, talking to farmers, you've got to talk to them about uh, why this crop could make the money versus what, what, what else they're using in their paddocks. And Tim said, just in the industrial hemp market alone that's being used for cannabis in Canada, so good quality uh, industrial hemp that's being used for medicinal cannabis, farmers are receiving up to $12,000 a tonne for their product that's being sold into those medicinal markets. And that's, that's actually for hemp. Uh, cannabis products can actually uh, yield even more. Um, and some of the, the figures that Tim talked to Tassie farmers about was up to $20,000 per hectare for growing good, high-quality cannabis for the medicinal market. So it's a win-win if farmers can, uh, can see that this is sustainable for them and it's worth them actually doing this. Uh, and it's a win-win for Australians that actually need to access these products. And why not access locally sourced products rather than import products from overseas? Now, Senator C would also mention that the illicit market just for medicinal cannabis products is around 600,000 Australians. Uh, it's estimated that only 4% of those are receiving their products via prescriptions. And this bill does go into some details about why it's so restrictive for Australians to uh, access medicinal cannabis or CBD products. Um, and I know in Tasmania it's been near impossible. I've been trying to get some people onto trials in Tasmania and it's been near impossible to do that. Some of them have had to source uh, their prescriptions from Victoria and other places. So I ask myself, why is it so difficult for a product that uh, we know works, uh, and that is a good alternative for um, other dangerous narcotics that are legal, like opioids. Well, it's this, it's this mentality uh, and this ideology around. We go back to the days of reefer madness. Uh, you know, the 1930s, uh, arguably one of the worst films ever made. Nevertheless, uh, tied in with a prohibition uh, on marijuana back in the 1930s, which almost destroyed the hemp industry, uh, let alone. Uh, obviously cannabis for medical purposes, uh, and it's still alive and well. Uh, in 2012, I was asking questions to Fazants in estimates. In 2012, why Tasmanian farmers and Australian farmers couldn't grow industrial hemp for food? Hemp uh, is one of the highest sources of omega-3. It's a really profitable and good product for farmers to be growing. Um, and I couldn't get a straight answer out of Fazant's, but as it's turned out later, the police had issues with farmers growing industrial hemp because uh, they didn't believe that they could control, the, you know, there was risks with the illicit narcotics market being associated with that. And one of the things the police apparently had raised, as we saw later, was that um, people might hide uh, illegal uh, cannabis crops inside uh, industrial hemp. And it's ironic that. Um, when I raised this with Tim, he said, well, actually, it's a, it's a joke because um, the plants will cross-pollinate each other. Uh, and after I visited uh, Tim's industrial hemp crop, I then went to visit a local sawmiller in, in Meander, Deloraine. He said, where have you been today? And I said, I've been visiting Tim, Tim Schmidt and his hemp crop. Um, and then this sawmiller said to me, he'd laughed, and he said, Tim's not very popular around here, Peter. 
And I said, why? And he said, because all the local pot growers don't like him because his industrial hemp's ruining their pot crops. That's what the sawmiller told me as well. So I think the idea that somehow uh, this, this amazing product that we've used for more than 10,000 years uh, needs to be restricted in terms of its access because someone might grow a pot crop nearby, it's ludicrous. And it, but it's typical of the attitude that we've seen that has restricted the growth of this amazing industry that has so much potential. So I just wanted to bring it back to uh, talk about the Australian uh, the market for, uh, for medicinal cannabis. Um, we are seeing uh, a lot of private equity interest in companies that are going through the process to, to register. Um, obviously, uh, working out the cultivation side of that, which is your primary production side, through to um, licensing and permits, and of course the supply chain. Um, but the market is estimated to be $171.7 million in Australia at the moment, and uh, has been forecast to grow at 42% per annum. Um, and of course, uh, you know, there's a reason for that, and that's because there's a very strong demand for this product. There's people out there that need it, and they know it works, and they want to get off opiates, and they want to try uh, alternatives. And while the TGA has reduced, uh, has, has recently uh, changed um, CBD product uh, in terms of its, uh, its scheduling, um, once again, uh, unlike other countries that list CBD products as food products, so they're available for the medicinal market. Australia is going through a very restrictive process for any company that wants to register a CBD product to be available over the counter uh, at, at your local pharmacy. Uh, it's going to be very difficult for them to do that, and they're going to have to do it at such a low level of efficacy that it's virtually going to be hard to prove that has any effect. Believe it or not, the target is mostly grumpy middle-aged white men like me who want to sleep better at night time. That is the international market for CBD. Uh, and actually, it was interesting, Tim, Tim Schmidt, who's a very well-respected farmer, he's a beef farmer, he farms a lot of crops, uh, said to uh, the audience uh, in Launceston that um, CBD is, is not a dangerous product in any way, shape or form. Um, once you take the THC out of it, uh, it has a lot of, uh, a lot of really good benefits. Uh, and um, it was interesting to hear Senator Roberts talking about that too, too today. So um, this, is, this, is, this is a debate that's really important uh, for Australians who need access to this product, uh, and I think it's an enormous opportunity for uh, Australian uh, for innovation, research and development with the thousands of applications of cannabinoid products that we haven't really even began to understand yet. Uh, and of course, it's really important in a state like mine of Tasmania, where we can't necessarily compete on the world stage in commodity products like, um, like intensive cropping. Uh, it's even been difficult with vegetables in my home state because we're a small island on the bottom of the world. But um, high value uh, crops that can be grown in smaller plots, in, in, uh, in uh, smaller acreage, um, is the future for my state. And it's where we've actually been able to uh, leverage our reputation over the years. So this is an enormous opportunity and I think a lot of people in this place would like to see this kind of reefer madness attitude change and uh, as to actually uh, give suffering Australians what they need. Thank you, Senator Wish Wilson. Minister. Thank you, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. I don't think anyone could accuse Senator Wish Wilson of being grumpy. But, and on that I commend the bill to the Senate. Thank you, uh, Minister. Uh, no amendments uh, have been the oh, question is uh, that the bills be now read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. Clark. A bill for an act to amend the Narcotic Drugs Act 1967 and for related purposes. Uh, no amendments have been circulated. Does any senator require a committee stage? If not, I call the minister to move the third reading. Minister. I move that the bill be read a third time. The question is that the bill be now read a third time. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Clark. A bill for an act to amend the Narcotic Drugs Act 1967 and for related purposes. Government Business Order of the Day number 10, Private Health Insurance Amendment Income Thresholds Bill 2021, resumption of second reading debate. Senator Brown. Labor supports the Private Health Insurance Legislation Amendment Age of Dependence Bill 2021 and has not sought to delay its passage through the Parliament. Unfortunately, the government failed to meet their own 
one eight April deadline for the passage of this bill, and now Australians have been left waiting for this important reform. Labor understands the frustrations of families who were promised a one April start date for extended health insurance coverage for young and disabled dependents. I commend the bill to the Senate. Minister. The bill to the Senate. Uh, the question is that the bill be now read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Clark. A bill for an act to amend the Private Health Insurance Act 2007 and for related purposes. Uh, no amendments have been circulated. Does any senator require a committee stage? If not, I shall call the minister to move the third reading. Minister. I move that the bill be now read a third time. The question is that the bill be now read a third time. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Clark. The bill for an act to amend the Private Health Insurance Act 2007 and for related purposes. Uh, the President has received a message uh, from the House of Representatives forwarding the Social Services Legislation Amendment Portability uh, Extension, Extensions Bill 2021 for concurrence. Minister. I move that this bill may proceed without formalities and be now read a first time. Uh, the question is that the bill be now read a first time. Minister. Are all those of that opinion say aye. All those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Min uh, Clark. The bill for an act to amend the law relating to social security and for related purposes. Minister. I move that this bill be now read a second time and I seek leave to have the second reading speech incorporated in Hansard. Is leave granted? Uh, leave is granted. Senator. Uh, thank you, um, Madam Acting Deputy President. Labor supports this bill. Pensioners have worked hard and contributed all their lives. They deserve our respect. The age pension is a proud legacy, Labor legacy. Labor will always work to strengthen and improve the pension. And over the past eight years, the government has sought to cut the pension, and Labor has fought the government's pension cuts tooth and nail. I commend the bill to the Senate. Thank you, Senator Brown. Minister. I commend the bill to the Senate. Uh, the question is that the bill be now read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Clark. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to social security and for related purposes. No amendments have been circulated. Does any senator require a committee stage? If not, I call the minister to move the third reading. Minister. I move the bill be now read a third time. The question is that the bill be read a third time. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. Clark. The bill for an act to amend the law relating to social security and for related purposes. Government business order of the day number 11, Sydney Harbour Federation Trust Amendment Bill 2021, resumption of second reading debate. Senator Brown. Uh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. This bill ensures that a number of nationally uh, significant sites in the Sydney Harbour area will remain publicly owned and managed by the Sydney Harbour Federation Trust. The legislation will enable the Harbour Trust to operate as an ongoing entity as a Commonwealth statutory authority. The, this is key to ensuring that the assets of the Trust, the 11 sites of historical, environmental and indigenous, indigenous cultural significance, remain under the control of the Commonwealth in perpetuity. Preserving the sites is in the public interest. They hold stories of our past, however dark at times, and our nation's cultural, industrial and military history. The bill will also update a long-term lease and licence provisions to maintain strong controls of trust lands consistent with com community feedback. The need to protect these lands from det detrimental community commercial interests and ensure continued public access is guaranteed. We are pleased that the government has agreed to our suggestion regarding community consultation on any proposed leases of longer duration. Any further activities proposed for trust sites, including commercial, must be compliant with the Act's objectives of public access and amenity. Across all 11 sites, the Trust welcomes 1.8 million visitors each and every year. The bill also revised eligibility requirements for Harbour Trust board appointments. This measure will help ensure me members are suitably skilled in regard to forward planning and local government engagement and, courage for, and encourage First Nation representation. Updating the threshold above, which, uh, which ministerial approval of contracts is required, will assist the Trust in making operational decisions in a timely manner. 
Labor will always stand to protect Australia's natural heritage. We also recognise the need for greater understanding and recognition of the very sig significant First Nations cultural heritage across the Sydney Harbour Federation Trust estate. As my colleague, the member for Fremantle, said in the other place, and I quote, Labor supports the imperative to deliver greater emphasis and recognition of the very significant First Nations cultural heritage on trust site. End quote. We urge the trust to make this a priority going forward. The members for Sydney and Grainley have, be have been strong advocates for proper com Commonwealth protection and management of these sites. It was only in 2020 that the Sydney Harbour Federation Trust turned down a proposal to privatise Cockatoo Island, a UNESCO World Heritage Site. The plan would have required a grant for a whole of island lease. As Labor leader Anthony Albanese said of the proposal, and I quote, Sydney Harbour is a national asset, a precious resource, not a plaything for corporate interests. End quote. The work of Tom Wren, sometimes called the father of Sydney Harbour, is evident in the establishment of the Australian Heritage Commission and in his dedication to extending and preserving public access to the foreshores of Sydney Harbour. Mr Wren, the former Federal Labor Deputy Leader and the Minister for Urban and Regional Development in the Whitlam Government and beyond, spoke often of the value of our world-renowned harbour, and I quote, There is such a gentleness about Sydney Harbour, such a softness. There are important parts in the river system that surround our Sydney that are still in near pristine state. It hurts you when you see the scars inflicted by insensitive developers. The harbour is more than a jewel. It is Sydney's heart. End quote. We recognise Tom's vision and his contribution to the conservation of the Sydney Harbour foreshore. He was a tireless campaigner and advocate for the presentation, preservation of these beautiful areas so that they may be available to all residents and visitors. Labor supports the purpose of this legislation. We will look out for funding announcements for, or a plan from the government to address the shortfall between the $40.6 million in the 2020 budget and the $164 million um, value of outstanding restoration works on trust sites. I commend the bill to the Senate. Thank you, Senator Brown. Senator Faruqi. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I will rise to briefly speak on the Sydney Harbour Federation Trust Amendment Bill 2021. The bill will implement various recommendations of the review of the Sydney Harbour Federation Trust conducted in 2019. The central finding of the review was that the trust should become an ongoing entity, retaining responsibility for the sites. And this bill um, does give effect to this. Um, so let's start at first principles here. The lands around Sydney Harbour under the care and oversight of the trust are public lands, which should be fully accessible to the people of Sydney um, and th those who live around the country. They are lands with many thousands of years of First Nations custodianship and care. For so many thousands of migrants to Australia, the harbour foreshore is the first thing that they see when their flight descends to land at Kingsford Smith Airport. Indeed, that is the first thing that I saw when my flight landed um, at Kingsford Smith Airport in 1992. And of course, the lands have unmatched natural beauty and historical significance. There is no room here for privatization and sell-offs of a priceless public land. Community over the decades have fought hard against privatization and for the preservation of the environment and heritage, and especially First Nations cultural her heritage around the harbor. With that in mind, I do raise my concerns with the Trust's recently published draft concept vision for Cockatoo Island. While there's certainly scope for rethinking how Cockatoo Island can best be revitalized and used for the future, any moves towards activities such as new retail precincts and hotels must be seriously interrogated and carefully considered. And we must reject privatization by stealth. I understand this bill's drafting was done in consultation with key community and advocacy organizations, including the Headland Preservation Group, and constructive work was completed to ensure that the group's concerns were met, particularly with regard to the leasing provisions. Parliamentary oversight will be retained for longer-term leases, and leases will be completely capped at 35 years. Um, the Greens support the bill. Thank you, Senator Faruqi. Senator Bragg. 
Thank you very much, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. Yeah, good. Um, thank you very much. Well, uh, this is a, a, a good bill and a, a, a bill which um, means a lot to the people of Sydney, particularly those that live uh, around the magnificent Sydney Harbour. Now, Sydney Harbour uh, would have probably the world's um, most recognisable shoreline. Certainly, in terms of this country, it would be uh, amongst the very best of our natural assets. Now, the, the Harbour Trust itself was an election commitment from the Howard years, back in the 1998 campaign, where the Howard government committed itself to return the Sydney Harbour I'm quoting here from the statement in 1998, the Sydney Harbour foreshore defence sites to the people of Australia uh, in order to protect the national uh, heritage values of these sites. The Howard government initially provided a $90 million contribution from the Federation Fund, which established this trust. Now, it was established as a transitional body designed to protect and preserve the former defence lands, which are scattered around Sydney Harbour. Um, we've just been living in the last 18 months through a, a serious pandemic, um, and the last serious pandemic we had, which was broadly known as the Spanish flu, um, about 100 years ago, uh, there was a quarantine station set up um, up at uh, Manly, which is uh, still still used today, not in its original purpose, but it is a magnificent, um, pristine uh, land up at North Head. Now, um, the sites, as I say, are scattered around Sydney. Uh, we protected and preserved them in the initial legislation back in uh, the beginning of the century. And so it's been extended as a transitional body um, again and again through various acts of this parliament. Uh, the minister, Susan Lee, uh, commissioned a review about 18 months ago to have a look at the appropriateness of the trust. And the review recommended on the base, basis of significant community input um, that the trust ought to be established as a permanent ongoing entity and arrangement. Now that, that, is, the, that is a central point here, that um, we are committed to conserving these sites, not just because they're beautiful, but because they give the public access. They provide public, public access to sites which are not available anywhere else in the world. North Head, Middle Head, Platypus, uh, so on and so forth. And so that, that was a central recommendation, or one of the central recommendations of the review. Now, there was a lot of scaremongering at the time uh, from various people, including the member for Warringah, saying that it was going to be the end of the world, that we, do, we were doing a review. Uh, but we decided that it was the right thing to do to have a look at the structure that was there and the review recommended uh, a permanent solution and that is what the government's policy is. Now, I also put in a submission to that review um, in consultation with the community and the community here is really key. Um, there is no question that these lands were preserved because of the actions taken by the executive government of the day, the Howard government, subsequently extended um, several times and now made permanent by this government. Uh, but that is only one side of the story. And yes, there has been, uh, to a large degree, bipartisan support. But the community here is at the heart. And uh, I've had the great pleasure to be able to work with the Headland Preservation Group. Uh, with uh, Jill Lestrange and J Julie Goodsir and the community there and the committee. And, and these people have gone above and beyond in terms of representing the interests of their community uh, by engaging deeply on these issues in terms of um, how these unique si sites can be preserved and protected uh, from a military perspective, from an Indigenous perspective, from a community perspective. And uh, we wouldn't be here today without these community groups, without in particular the headland Preservation Group, which continues to do a great body of work, not only on advocacy, but also in terms of um, providing volunteers to maintain the sites. I mean, there are, there are hundreds of volunteers that work on the trust lands, 
uh, that keep the trust uh, lands beautiful and viable. And so, uh, apart from establishing the trust in perpetuity, uh, this bill also ensures uh, that there is a, a clearer governance framework. Um, it sets out that the trust lands will be maintained by the Commonwealth. Uh, they must be held in public hands. Um, but we're also striving to improve the, the board uh, and the governance and the functions. Um, there has been a lot of discussion about, about leasing, and I, I hear the comments around the chamber that uh, a long-term lease could be a de facto way of privatising public lands. And, and that is a concern that has been shared by the Morrison government. And what we have tried to do with this bill is draw a line in the sand about long-term leases. So uh, the trust can conduct leases up to 25 years under this legislation, which has bipartisan support. Um, and if, the, if there is a desire to have a longer-term lease out to 30, 35 years, then that can be done. But it can only be done uh, under a legal instrument which is disallowable after there's been extensive community consultation. And again, that is at the heart of this. We wouldn't be here without the community advocacy. And so we must always ensure uh, that if there, if there are to be leases longer than 25 years that are desired by the, by the trust and the community groups, uh, that there is an extensive process that also results in the, those legal arrangements being subject to disallowance. And the bill does also uh, state very clearly that you cannot have a lease longer than 35 years. So, uh, I mean, the, the case in which you might find a lease that is longer than 25 years uh, may well be that uh, there is a need to get uh, more private capital to rehabilitate a site on the trust lands. Now, we are also putting our hands in our pocket, as we have uh, in the last budget, to help remediate some of these former defence lands. In the last budget, uh, we've committed $40 million to help remediate, uh, but there is more work that needs to be done uh, on all these sites. And so there is, there is money um, in the budget uh, to keep on looking at the, the plans that are required to be um, delivered with community consent. So, in summary, uh, this is a very important piece of law, or will be, I hope, a very important piece of law for the people of Sydney and the people of New South Wales and the people of, of Australia. When people think about Australia, they think about these sites. And we are ensuring that these sites will be in public hands forever and ever. And that is a great win for the community. And I want to thank again uh, all the community advocates that have spent an enormous amount of time on not only public advocacy but in preservation and grassroots conservation. Thank you, Senator Bragg. Minister? I commend the bill to the Senate. The question is that the bill now be read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. I call the clerk. A bill for an act to amend the Sydney Harbour Federation Trust Act 2001 and for related purposes. No amendments have been circulated. Does any senator require a committee stage? If not, I shall call the minister to re move the third reading. Minister. I so move the third reading. The question is that the bill be read a third time. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. I call the clerk. A bill for an act to amend the Sydney Harbour Federation Trust Act 2001 and for related purposes. Government Business Order of the Day number 4, Online Safety Bill 2021 and a Related Bill, resumption of the debate on the second reading and the amendment moved by Senator Pratt. Senator Rice. Thanks, Acting Deputy President. I'm rising today to highlight in particular the concerns that the Greens have heard from the LGBTIQ plus community about the Online Safety Bill. As my colleagues have said, the Greens support the intent of these bills to protect the safety of people online, particularly women and children. But as my colleagues have also said, we do not believe these bills are a well-designed suite of measures to address this serious issue. I mean, given the rush for the development of these bills, it's probably not a surprise. So the Greens will be moving amendments to address the flaws that we and many of the organisations that we have spoken to have identified. 
In the excellent submission from the Victorian Pride Lobby to the Senate inquiry on the bill outlines their concerns about this bill as it stands because it's got the potential to have very significant adverse effects on the lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, gender diverse, intersex and queer communities. Their submission said the objects of the bill are to improve online safety for Australians and to promote online safety for Australians. Censorship of consensual adult material does not improve online safety for Australians. The online content scheme in part nine of the bill appears to be an attempt to implement a classification-based censorship scheme, which is incongruous with the bill's objectives and entirely unrelated to protecting Australians from online abuse. We applaud the work of the eSafety Commissioner in providing online safety advice and support for the LGBTIQ community, including being out online and dealing with image-based abuse. In this regard, it should be noted that the United States Gay and Lesbian Alliance Against Defamation is developing a social media safety index to rate social media companies on how well they protect LGBTQ people from abuse. While we strongly support reforms to improve and promote online safety, on the basis of the foregoing, we recommend that part nine of the bill be deleted in its entirety. The issues raised herein should be addressed through the ongoing review of Australian classification regulation. And similarly, an article in Junkie summarised a set of key concerns for the queer communities. And they, their submission said that, oh, that that article said the trouble is whether content is likely to cause offence to a reasonable adult. That's pretty subjective, and you can see how it favours majority groups. When asked, Communications Minister Paul Fletcher singled out fetishes like bondage, fisting and water sports as offensive. Not everyone's cup of tea, sure, but two guesses which community has in mind. The Commissioner's broad powers and the bill's regressive definition of adult content put LGBTQ rights and visibility at enormous risk of coordinated attacks. In a country prone to moral panics about anti-bullying programs and trans kids, this is hardly speculative. And given some of the motions, the transphobic and homophobic motions that we have seen from One Nation senators and others and supported by many in this government, we share those profound concerns. The article continues. The current eSafety Commissioner has said that she won't use these powers to persecute sex workers and one would hope queer people. However, it doesn't really matter what she plans to do. The point is that they don't need these powers in the first place. It's dangerous to make laws as if they'll only ever be used by people currently in office. A future administration could appoint an anti-sex work crusader or a career homophobe who would use these powers with malicious intent at any time. From competent lawmakers, we'd expect to see safeguards, sunset clauses and built-in appeals processes. Instead, we've seen a sweeping set of powers rushed into parliament a week after consultation closed, ignoring many of the 370 public submissions. And there's another interrelated significant suite of concerns, and that's the impact of this legislation on sex workers, particularly those who are working online. And as the Victorian Pride Lobby said in their submission, the effect of these provisions is that any sexually explicit content will be subject to unilateral removal from Australian internet hosting service providers. This unfairly and unreasonably targets legal and consensual adult media for arbitrary removal. If taken to its logical conclusion, the bill will attempt to censor any online media depicting any sexual activity between consenting, ad consenting adults. And similarly, the submission from Scarlet Alliance commended some aspects of the bill but said, we have significant concerns, however, with the way the bill frames online harm and safety and with the way it fails to consider the impact of action taken under the bill on sex worker safety, both online and in real life. We urge consideration of the chilling effect likely to result from the intersection of the online content scheme and the basic online safety expectations, for which there is already significant precedent in similar legislation, i.e. Foster, SESTA, in the United States. By positioning all sexual content as potentially damaging to and giving the eSafety Commissioner power to investigate at will and issue notices as they think fit, the bill fails to differentiate between actual harm and a subjective, moralistic construction of harm. 
The bill does not define harm itself, nor does it create a provable threshold of harm that can be used in the Commissioner's decision-making processes. In concentrating power in a single, unelected office, it silos power and control over perceiving and acting upon harm in a way that lacks transparency or accountability to the Australian public or connection to the intersectional Australian community. And these are really serious issues, and it's because of these serious issues, and particularly as I've outlined here, really significant impacts on the LGBTIQ community and the sex worker community that my colleague Senator McKim has moved a second reading amendment calling for the bills to be withdrawn, reconsidered and redrafted. And we will also be moving other amendments to address concerns, including inserting a review process and changes that would reduce the risk of consensual, sexually explicit content being removed. And these in include major amendments to part nine of the bill, which is where the online content scheme and classification code are set out. These include measures that would prevent unintended consequences that would adversely affect advertising of legitimate and lawful sex services and products and sexual health programs and provi providers. And the other significant area of concern that we've got, as has been um, referenced in the excerpts from the submissions that I've read out, that our Greens amendments are going to address, is the far-reaching powers of the eSafety Commissioner, which effectively gives them the power to act as Australia's chief censor. So I want to be really clearly on the record here. The Greens support the intent of this bill. We support the intent of a bill to be creating safety, online safety for Australians. This is absolutely undeniable. This is a serious issue. It needs to be addressed. But the way this bill is currently drafted has got incredibly serious flaws that it can have, are going to have major unintended consequences on rafts of people, but particularly, as I've outlined today, on LGBTIQ people and on, on sex workers. So, I really want to say, look, we hear those concerns, and for me, particularly as the Greens LGBTI spokesperson, I want to say that we hear the concerns of those communities about this bill, and we share them. So we do not support these bills in their current form because of these issues, and we look forward to receiving support for our amendments, which are very sensible amendments, to address these un, hopefully un, un, um, <laughs> what's the word? Unintended, that's the word, thank you, unintended consequences and would enable the intent of the bill to improve online safety for Australians to be achieved without these significant adverse and unintended consequences. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Senator Rice. Senator Walsh. Thank you, Acting Deputy President, and I too rise to speak on the online safety bill and the online safety transitional provisions and consequential amendments bill. Uh, 2021. Labor supports measures to consolidate and strengthen online safety laws for Australians. Uh, and this is an area of bipartisanship, and Labor has engaged constructively with the government to address concerns with this bill. This bill seeks to create a new online safety framework for Australians. By consolidating various online safety laws and introducing some new changes, this bill will create a modern regulatory framework that builds on the existing online safety scheme and ensures that these laws are kept up to date. This bill will retain and replicate provisions in the Enhancing Online Safety Act of 2015, provisions that are working well to protect Australians from online harms, such as the non-consensual sharing of intimate images scheme. It will also replace the content schemes in Schedules 5 and 7 of the Broadcasting Services Act of 92 to address harmful content such as refused classification material. Labor supports the new elements of the online safety scheme that this bill seeks to establish. We know the devastating impact that online abuse and bullying can have. We know the harm that is caused by inappropriate and graphic material being shared online. So Labor supports the articulation of a core set of basic online safety expectations and the creation of a new complaints-based removal notice scheme for cyber abuse when it is perpetrated against an Australian adult. However, we do have a number of concerns with this bill. 
uh, concerns that Labor shares with stakeholders regarding consultation, regarding transparency uh, and regarding review mechanisms. And while some necessary amendments have been made, the government's delays have risked undermining confidence in what is, of course, very important work. Uh, and it has been over two and a half years since the Briggs review that recommended a single up-to-date online safety act. Um, two and a half years. Uh, and let's look at what has happened since that Briggs review. Um, it was back in October 2018 that Linnell Briggs handed down the review of Australia's online safety laws. Uh, in May 2019, during the election, the government makes its first promise to introduce a new online safety act. In July 2019, the minister stood up in question time and again promised an online safety act was coming. In September 2019, in response to Labor's questions about online hate speech, racism and the rise of right-wing extremism in Australia following the Christchurch terrorist attack, the minister stood up in this parliament and yet again promised that a new online safety act was coming. Uh, in December 2019, another announcement, another promise that an online safety act is coming. Uh, September 2020. When asked about what they were doing to curb graphic content on social media in the wake of a self-harm video on Facebook and TikTok, they stood up again and promised a new online safety act. Um, October 2020, this time an op-ed uh, in the West, another promise that an online safety act was on the way. Then in December 2020, just two days before Christmas, this government finally released their exposure draft with the consultation process ending only eight business days before they tabled the bill in the parliament. So the government is asking us to believe that it took two years to draft a bill, but only eight days to read and consider 376 submissions. This short time frame at the end of a long, drawn-out process has undermined confidence in the government's exposure draft. And stakeholders are therefore rightly concerned that submissions have just not been given proper consideration. And the department confirmed that from 376 submissions, they had identified 56 issues that warranted further consideration. Uh, and from those 56 issues, only seven amendments have been made. So the government has spent years talking about this bill just to rush through the work at the last minute. Uh, and of course, this government has spent the last two and a half years talking about the importance of keeping women and children safe online. But how can this government claim to care about creating a safe space online? How can this government claim to care about women's safety while it allows the member for Bowman, Andrew Lamming, to remain in their party room? while it allows the member for Bowman to remain as chair of a parliamentary committee with the support of the Liberal National Party. The member for Bowman has a history of trolling and abusing his own constituents on Facebook. So while we discuss the importance of online safety in this chamber today, the government sits here and in the other place turning a blind eye to one of their own who, in his own words, engages in trolling on Facebook who, in his own words, has undermined the safety and the mental health of at least one woman in his own electorate. And in estimates last Order. month— Order. Senator Walsh, you will be in continuation when debate resumes. Two questions about notice. Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck, and I refer to reports that advice provided by ATAGI is that AstraZeneca should only be recommended for use in people aged 60 and over. I ask the minister to confirm in this place that the government, this is the first time the government has been advised in any form that the AstraZeneca vaccine should not be a preferred COVID-19 vaccine for Australians under the age of 60. The minister representing the Minister for Health and Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. Thanks, Senator Wong, for the question. Uh, can I advise the Senate that the Health Minister received this morning, or today, the 17th of June, um, advice from ATAGI that indicated that uh, the COVID 
19 Pfizer vaccine is the preferred vaccine for those under 60 years of age. The recommendation was revised due to a higher risk and observed severity of thrombosis and thrombocytopenia syndrome TTS, in the 50 to 59 year old age group than reported internationally and initially estimated in Australia. Mr. President, and I am reading from the Otagi advice that was received this morning uh, or today. For those aged 60 years or above, Mr. President, well, I'm, well, I'm saying that we received this advice today, Senator. Uh, so, so for those, those aged 60 years or above, the benefits of receiving a COVID-19 vaccine are greater than in younger people. The risks of order. severe Senator outcomes. Colbeck, have Senator Wong on a point of order. Senator Wong. Thank you, Mr. President. I thank the minister for reading out what is on the public record. The question we actually we actually asked was whether or not this was the first time the government had it, had been advised in any form that the AstraZeneca vaccine was not the preferred COVID-19 vaccine for those Australians under the age of 60. Senator Wong, I've allowed you to restate and re-emphasise the question. I believe while the minister is specifically talking about such advice, and he did talk about the day in which it had received, to instruct him any more strictly would go to how to answer a question, which I cannot do. Um, so if the minister is sticking to the advice and the timing of it, then I believe that is directly relevant. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, my understanding, my advice is that this, this advice was received uh, and decided at a meeting of ATAGI this morning. So this is uh, when we have received this advice today, Mr. President. Um, and we have at all times through the duration of this pandemic followed the health advice uh, and we've taken action once we have received that advice, Mr. President. So, uh, this, this, this correspondence came to the Health Minister from ATAGI today uh, and, uh, as I understand it, very quickly after that advice being received, the Minister has made his public statements with respect to that advice. Senator Wong, a supplementary question. Uh, will the Minister guarantee that the Australian Government will have sufficient supplies of other vaccines? to ensure all Australians who want a vaccine will be able to get a vaccine by the end of this year. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. Thanks, Senator Wong, for the question. Uh, and uh, Minister Hunt has confirmed this morning, and I'm happy or this afternoon at his press conference, and I'm happy to confirm uh, that our objective remains to make available to every Australian who wants a vaccine uh, wants access to a vaccine by the end of the year that they have access to that vaccine, Mr President. Uh, that's been our statement all along. Uh, that was confirmed by Minister Hunt this morning, Mr President, and was also confirmed order. Uh, by uh, um, uh, Lieutenant General Fruin, who is also assisting with the vaccine rollout, Mr President. So uh, we have uh, significant supplies of vaccine coming into this country, Mr. President, uh, and the objective remains that every Australian who wants a vaccine will have access to one by the Order. end of this year. Se Order on my left, Senator Wong, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Final supplementary. I refer to reports that Pfizer approached the government 12 months ago, offering Australia the opportunity to be among the first nations in the world to have access to the Pfizer vaccine. Is that right? Why did the Morrison government fail to secure an early agreement for Pfizer vaccines when it had the chance? Senator Colbeck. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, the, 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 advice, the advice that I have is that, uh, Mr. President, uh, Pfizer has at all times met the agreed delivery arrangements that they have provided to us, uh, and, we have, and we consequently have real confidence in the projected, uh, projected deliveries that they are proposing to provide us through to the end of the year, Mr President. Uh, I don't have any further information with respect to uh, the reports that Senator Wong refers to. I'm happy to take that notice and come back to, on notice and come back to the chamber. Order. Order. Senator Henderson. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. 
Can the minister inform the Senate on how the Morrison government's economic recovery plan is working to create more jobs and strengthen Australia's economy? The minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks, Mr. President. I thank Senator Henderson for that question. A, uh, a strong champion of small businesses across Australia, and I know deeply concerned to ensure to ensure the security of employment opportunities for all Australians. And, Mr. President, against a backdrop of enormous global uncertainty, global pandemic, the first in 100 years, uh, indeed an economic shock to the world, the greatest since the Great Depression, our government has sought at every juncture to ensure the economic security. Uh, of Australia and Australians and its economic recovery from the shock of COVID-19. Uh, our budgets handed down last year and this year framed the direction for our economic recovery plans to make sure that we kept as many Australian businesses as strong as possible, as many Australians in work as possible and that we continued to grow employment opportunities wherever possible. And in the face of these enormous global uncertainties, it is pleasing to see the strength across the Australian economy. Mr. President. Australia's economy today is now larger than it was going into the pandemic. This is a feat that no other major advanced economy has achieved to date, to have recovered their economy to a bigger size than it was pre-pandemic. Over the last three quarters, we have seen some growth of 8.7 per cent, the strongest growth in Australia in more than half a century. Mr. President. And today, we have seen the dividend that that creates for Australian and Australian workers, with the unemployment rate falling to 5.1 per cent in May. There are now fewer unemployed persons in Australia than there were prior to the pandemic. We have seen jobs growth of 115,000 people for the month, well above expectations, demonstrating that across Australia the economic recovery is going strongly and creating opportunities for Australians. Senator Henderson, a supplementary question. Can the minister outline some of the key job creating measures that underpin the government's economic recovery plan? Senator Birmingham. Well, Mr. President, in the last budget, we, we announced our plan to get more people back into work. Budget projections to show 250,000 further jobs to be created, and that plan is working. It's working strongly. It's underpinned by policies that drive investment by the private sector across the Australian economy. Our full expensing measures, all about encouraging Australian businesses to invest in their competitiveness, their productivity, and creating jobs for Australians across those sectors. And it's paying dividends. We've equally, of course, put money back in the pockets of hard-working Australians and their families by bringing forward income tax cuts, by providing the financial support for families to be empowered, to make their own decisions and to get and keep more from their hard work. And on this side of the chamber, we are resolutely committed to lower taxes as a continued driving vehicle for economic growth, for business investment and to support Australian families, and it's a stark contrast Order. to the uncertainty Senator on taxes Birmingham. of those opposite. Time for the answers expired. Senator Henderson, a final supplementary question. Minister, can you outline how the government's commitment to reducing taxes is creating more jobs and is strengthening Australia's economy? Senator Birmingham. Mr. President, we're providing 10 million low- and middle-income earners with additional taxation relief to help with the economic recovery, to help create the support across the Australian economy to keep this jobs growth going. And Mr. President, the jobs growth we're seeing and the unemployment rates that have been achieved, it's little wonder there's a fair bit of silence from those opposite, because of course we can all recall the mayhem and catastrophe, the doomsday predictions that were coming from those opposite. The doomsday predictions of those who said that, of course, millions more would find themselves on unemployment, that millions more would be in difficulty. Those opposite, Mr. President, had no faith in Australia, Australian businesses, Australians, or the economic plans that have been proven to work. Economic plans Order. that have been proven to work, Order. Senator Wong. I know it breaks your heart Order. to see record numbers of Australians in jobs, but we are proud to have record numbers of Australians in jobs Order. and have Senator the Australian Birmingham. economy Time coming back so strongly. Has expired. Order. Order. Order.
Senator Sheldon is on his feet. Senator Sheldon. Good, thank you, um, Mr. President. Um, my question. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Agriculture, Senator Rustin. In recent days, the Morrison government has announced significant changes to the Working Holiday Maker Scheme and arrangements for foreign workers. The United Kingdom's Department of International Trade has published a glossy document boasting that, and I quote, Aussie firms will no longer have to prioritise hiring Australians nationals first. Why is the Morrison government taking jobs away from Australians and giving them to UK citizens? The Minister representing the Minister for Agriculture, Drought and Emergency Management, Senator Rustin. Well, thank you very much, Mr. President, and I thank Senator Sheldon for his question. Well, um, given the information that's just been provided to the chamber by Senator Birmingham, I think we should all be delighting in the fact yeah. that we're seeing more Australians back in work uh, than, than the before the pandemic. And you know, we should all be celebrating the fact that we have got an unemployment rate of 5.1 per cent today. I mean, who would have thought when we went into the pandemic that the economic recovery in this country was going to be so strong as to see 5.1 uh, per cent unemployment in Australia? And in the home state of Senator Cash, who's sitting next to me, yes. down to 4.4 per cent, getting very, very close to full employment. But making sure, making sure that we provide a balance bin and ensuring that Australians who wish to get into the workforce are able to take that opportunity is a very, very important platform of the Morrison McCormack government's uh, economic policy. We want to see every single Australian who is able to work in work. And that's why we have put in place so many programs, particularly in recent times as we come out of the COVID pandemic, through the, uh, the job maker programs, making sure that we've got skilling and retraining programs to make sure that Australians who find themselves without work have a pathway back into the workforce. But we also hear on the other side of the equation that we are finding businesses that are struggling to be able to get employees, and we need to make sure that we provide them with a pool yeah. of resources so that they can get yep. workers. That in no way denies, in no way denies that our absolute fundamental Fundamental policy position of this government is to make sure that Australians who are unemployed. Senator Keneally, on a point of order. The, the question was, is relevant, and the question was quite specific from Senator Sheldon. Uh, the British government has said that Aussie firms will no longer have to prioritise uh, hiring Australian nationals first. The minister hasn't addressed the question, Senator why is Keneally, the government giving away Senator, Australian jobs? Senator Keneally, the, the latter part of your point of order there means while the minister is talking about the matters she is, that is a quite right, wide-ranging part of the question at the end that Senator Sheldon asked. So I think that while the minister is talking about... Is Senator Wong. Clarify, Mr President, which is the wide-ranging bit? Why is the... I'm, I'm trying, Morrison please. government taking jobs away from Australians okay. and giving them to UK citizens. Okay. It is well, clearly about well, one the, issue. Well, if the minister's talking about prioritising jobs for Australians, I don't wow. think... I, the, the, this is not a time for a broad... Um, can I finish? I, I'm happy to... Please, just, I'll just finish my explanation and people can take issue with it. I view that question as giving the minister some latitude to answer and to challenge it and to explain why they are doing the opposite. Um, be, as long as it's not a general commentary on the unemployment or employment market, if the minister's talking about why they disagree with that question or talking about prioritising in government policy, I think, I think that's relevant. Do, Senator Rustin. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Mr. President. The Australian government will always prioritise jobs for Australians. We will always prioritise jobs Order. for Australians. We want to make sure that every Australian who has wishes to have a job Order. is able to. Se Senator Keneally. I seek leave to table the ten key benefits of the UK. Australia Free Trade Agreement, where it clearly says Aussie firms will no longer okay, have to prioritise sure. hiring I, I, Australians I have allowed, first. I have allowed. Well, I have. If I'm, um, I can only deal with questions in the. Sorry, Senator Birmingham, you're on your feet. Well, Mr. President, I was just going to respond. Senator Keneally well knows the protocols and etiquettes in relation to the tabling documents in this place. If she wishes to follow those protocols, then of course the government will look at it in accordance with those protocols rather than seeking. You have sought leave. You haven't shared the document with the, with the government, to my knowledge. 
It's, it's order. You're waving a document around order. the government has not seen. You know the protocols. If we were doing the same, you would deny leave. The clerk has um, advised me that one can't interrupt a speaker to seek leave to table. Um, I was not aware of that particular procedure. Senator Wong, to, the, to your point, I could, I can only deal with. Oh, please do. I oh, sorry. I thought I was dealing with it. Well, I, I hadn't actually stood stood to make a point sorry. again. Uh, my point mm -hmm. is, if you if you read it that broadly, Mr. President, with all due respect, the minister to do what, precisely what she is doing, which is to engage in parenthood statements. We all will prioritise Australian jobs. It is unsurprising that you are then going to get a response to the opposition seeking to table documents. Uh, uh the direct relevance means dealing with the issue at hand. Just because something says jobs doesn't mean a minister can stand up and answer a question by saying we all love jobs. Okay. Can I, um, I, order, order. On the, we're wasting. I, I, I'm happy to rule. I've taken submissions. Now, on the point of order, I can on the on the point of order. Can I can I answer, Senators McKenzie? I'm not complaining about the opposition objecting to the nature of a question, Senator Wong. Um, I've allowed the opposition to restate and to make its uh, emphasise the part of the question and to take points of order. I was just pointing out to Senator Keneally that I was corrected by the clerk. I wasn't aware that you couldn't interrupt to seek leave. That was something I learnt. When it comes to the point of order, I can only deal with questions the way they are asked. I submit, Senator Wong, that you are asking me to go to the content of a minister's answer and how they might answer a question rather than when they are directly relevant. When a question is, why is the government, if I read it correctly, taking away jobs from Australians in favour of someone else, the minister is entitled to say otherwise. And as long as it's not a general commentary on unemployment or employment, I think when the minister was talking about that bit, when, you raise, when the point of order was raised, that constitutes direct relevance. There's an opportunity to debate the content and what of answers after question time and whether or not the chamber thinks the content of those answers is sufficient or satisfactory. Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr President. And to be directly relevant to Senator Sarah Sheldon's question, the Australian government will always prioritise Australian jobs. Order. Um, uh, your point of order, you are seeking leave? Mr. President, I seek leave to table the document from Number the United two, Kingdom one. government that I have just cited Number here in the two. chamber that Aussie firms will no longer have to okay. prioritise hiring Se Aussie Senator nationals Keneally, first. Um, you, is, is leave granted? Yes, leave is granted. Uh, so, Senator Sheldon, a supplementary question. Good, thank you. Uh, well, yesterday, when announcing the new agricultural visa, Minister Lily, Lily Proud stated it would both, and I quote, "Little Proud, there you go." Order. Mirror the. This is what he said. I'll mirror the existing seasonal worker program, and it is really an extension of the working holiday scheme. Given these are entirely different standards and requirements between these programs, which is it? Senator Rustin. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. Um, well, both of the programs to which Senator Sheldon refers are very, very important programs to support Australia's agricultural uh, sector. And, um, and in, in announcing yesterday um, the agreement that we're putting in place with our, our Asian friends um, to make sure that we are able to support Australian farmers who are often looking for labour. Uh, and unable to fill their labour short shortages in Australia, uh, I think it is, uh, it is an exceptional uh, initiative for us to be able to support our region, support people in our region, but at the same time support our farmers who are crying out for labour at Senator the moment. Senator Wong, on a point of order. Thank you, Mr. President. The point of order is direct relevance. The question goes directly to whether or not this new agricultural visa will mirror the seasonal workers program or extend the working holiday scheme. They are different schemes with different conditions. So we have not asked about those existing schemes. We've asked the new, whether the new scheme, which, of the, which, of the, which architecture will it follow? So I would ask you to remind the minister 
that she is not being asked to give us an explanation on why the SWP or the working holiday visa are such great things. She's being asked to explain the new agricultural visa. And on that point, if, it, uh, if I'm being asked to order the minister to go to explain the differences, um, I think that is going to the content of an answer. However, to be directly relevant, let me finish, please, Senator Wong. To be directly relevant, because it was a tightly worded question, the minister must speak about the new scheme. But I can't direct the minister to answer about the content or the type of answer, which is when you're asking about differences. The minister can be directly relevant. Well, Senator Wong, I'm listening very carefully. I will admit this is not a, an area of policy that I am as aware of details as others in the chamber, but I'm listening very carefully. I've allowed you to restate the question, and I have made, I have made, you, I've made my ruling. Senator Rustin, you have 23 seconds remaining. Thank you very much, uh, Mr President. Well, my understanding is that the new scheme will work alongside both the seasonal workers program and the working holiday makers, and that the details around the exact and specific details of the new scheme are currently being worked out. Uh, so I'm happy Order. to come back to this chamber with more information Order. around the exact details Order. around the working of the Order, new program. Order, Senator Rustin. Not the order on my left. Uh, uh, order. Senator Sheldon, if I could have a moment, please. I know it's... Uh, senators on my left, we're wasting question time, which is traditionally a period for the non-government parties. I would not have been able to rule on a subsequent point of order then because I could not hear Senator Rustin. So there is way too much noise in the chamber. Senator Sheldon, a final supplementary question. Can the minister confirm that in recent days the Morrison government has undermined Australian workers, undermined the Pacific step up and worsened the risk of worker exploitation in Australia? Senator Rustin. No, we have not. No, here, here. Um, Senator Sheldon, Order we absolutely have not. What we have sought to, to do is to make sure that we support Australians through a number of initiatives here, here. who wish to get into work, but at the same time we also recognise that there are some sectors of the Australian economy that are crying out for workers at the moment and are unable to fill those particular positions within Australia. So what this government has sought to do is have a suite of measures that support everybody in the Australian economy, whether it be Australians who find themselves out of work and making sure that we provide them with Order. the skills and the retraining so that Senator they can get Watt. back into the workforce, but at the same time support, our farmers, and to Senator support McKenzie. our farmers who are crying out for labour. So what we will do is we will continue Order. to make sure that we address all of the issues that our economy faces going forward and not just one of them, by making sure we support our businesses Order. to make sure they've got employees and in support our Australians into Order. jobs. Senator, <coughs> Senator Watt, Senator Keneally, Senator Rennick. Senator Watt, count. S Senator Rennick, Senator M Watt, remember my rule about counting to ten after your name is called? Senator Wish Wilson. Thank you, President. My question is to Senator Rustin, uh, acting for the Resources Minister. You know, worked very hard to make this question very short and very straightforward. Order on my Minister. right. Order. Stop the clock. <laughs> Senator Wish Wilson. Thank you, Minister. Minister, do you accept the science that burning fossil fuels is a significant contributor? to greenhouse gas emissions and that rising greenhouse gas emissions are linked to the warming of the world's oceans. The Minister representing the Minister for Resources in Northern Australia, Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, um, Sen uh, Mr President, and I thank uh, Senator Wish Wilson for his question. Um, if you are asking me whether I am a climate denier, Senator Wish Wilson, no, I'm not. Uh, so, Senator Wish Wilson, though, um, one thing that, that this government has always been absolutely clear about Senator and Watt. remains absolutely committed to is to make sure that we support Australians with reliable, affordable, dispatchable power, but at the same time. Order. Senator Wish Wilson <coughs> on a point of order. Just want to stress how hard I work, President, to make uh, this very, very simple question. Um, the point of order is Directly. saying you're not a climate denier is not answering the question. It was really a yes or no question. Um, President, I asked the minister to be relevant. Order. Um, 
Just as you were trying to write a tight question, Senator Wish Wilson, I was trying to hear the minister, but I couldn't, despite my numerous calls to order across the chamber. However, um, while I couldn't hear part of the minister's answer while I was calling the chamber to order, I, I can't accept your submission that I can direct a minister how to answer a question. I will listen carefully. You've reminded the minister of the question. I do so again. She has 91 seconds remaining. Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Well, I am more than happy to uh, to give you the government's policy as a, as it relates to supporting Australians, as supporting Australian industry, and making sure that we also are in a position where we protect Australia's environment and and also take our responsibility for the protection of the world environment as well. Uh, if you wish to um, to to ask things in relation to oceans, maybe you should be considering asking your question uh, to the minister for the environment. But what I will say about Australia's <laughs> energy policy is that we are absolutely absolutely committed to meet every single obligation we have, an obligation to the Australian public, reliable, affordable and dispatchable power, an obligation internationally to the, the targets order. that we— Senator Rustin. Senator Bush Wilson, on a point of order. On a point of order, President, with only 49 seconds to go, could I just ask the minister to answer my question? Um, I, I do think that was a fair point of order on direct relevance, Senator Wish Wilson. Um, Senator Rustin, the question related to the various concepts rather than government policies. So I take the opportunity to remind you you can answer in a personal capacity or a government capacity because it did say, do you accept? Um, so to that extent, um, it wasn't a broad question on government policy. Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr President. Well, I, I think I did answer um, Senator Wish Wilson's question in my first response uh, immediately after him asking the question, uh, and I'll stand by that. Uh, I am not a climate denier. Uh, however, um, I also am a very strong believer in all of the policies that are put in place by the government of which I am a member to make sure that we meet our obligations and support. We support a future in this country and this world uh, that makes sure that our environment is protected for our children and for their children, Senator Wish Wilson. But we as a government are not going to undertake that, those policies at the detriment to Australia, to Australians, to the Australian economy. But we will make sure in the process of going forward into a, to a future uh, that I think every Australian wants. We will Order, do. Senator Rustin. Senator Wish Wilson, a supplementary question. Thank you, Chair. I'll take the fact you're not a climate denier as a, as a yes to that question. Um, do you also accept that scientists are linking the warming of our oceans to catastrophic changes and impacts we are seeing in our marine habitats, such as three mass coral bleachings on the Great Barrier Reef in the last five years, the loss of Tasmania's giant kelp forests, the vanishing of seagrass beds around the country and the loss of thousands of kilometres of mangrove habitat? are linked to climate order, change. Senator, Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr President. Once again, thank you very much, Senator Wish Wilson, for your question. Um, I can only answer the question as it relates to a per, uh, requesting me to provide you with my answer, uh, you know, with my opinion, which I'm quite happy to say that uh, I am not a climate denier and I believe that it is extraordinarily important that we make sure that we look after our environment. But if you want to ask specific questions in relation to the environment and many of the, the, the things that were in the substance of your question, order. Senator Wish Wilson, related to very, very specific aspects of environmental policy, and I do not represent the Minister for the Environment. However, I am more than happy, I am more than happy to take on notice the questions that you have asked in relation to the environment and refer them to the Environment Minister to provide you with an answer to your question. Senator Wish Wilson, a final supplementary question. Minister, I remind you that you're the Minister for Burning Fossil Fuels, which impact the environment. Can you then explain to coastal communities? ocean lovers, tourism operators, surfers, divers, fishers, right around the nation, why you are responsible for releasing 80,000 square kilometres of new ocean acreage to oil and gas companies to explore for the exact same fossil fuels that are responsible for killing our oceans. Senator Rustin. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. Well, I'll just point out, Senator Wish Wilson, I am the minister in the Senate who represents the Minister for Resources, Water and Northern Australia. Just to be absolutely correct about the title uh, of the of the particular ministry of which you're directing this question. Um, and and as of yesterday, as you, yesterday, I answered the question in relation um, to um, the the opening up of a particular area of ocean between Victoria and Tasmania. Um, but once again. 
once again Order. the uh, independent assessment of the environmental uh, impact of anything that occurs Senator, is undertaken Senator by an independent organisation, not SEMA, which I'm sure you, Senator Wishwilson, Wish will be Wilson. very well aware of the the, uh, the obligations under the NOPSEMA of NOPSEMA under the Act about making sure that they do not enable or do not allow exploration to be undertaken in a way that is Senator detrimental Wish to Wilson. the environment in which Order. that is being undertaken. Order. Senator Patrick. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, my question is to the attorney and relates to whistleblowers. The Commonwealth, uh, the, the Commonwealth Director of Public Prosecution's po prosecution policy provides a two-stage test that must be satisfied before a prosecution is commenced. There must be sufficient evidence to prosecute the case, and it must be evident from the facts of the case and all of the surrounding circumstances that the prosecution would be in the public interest. When asked about the impact of the prosecution of Bernard Collieri and Witness K on the relationship between Australia and East Timor uh, at estimates, the acting CDPP said that uh, that would be a step beyond the scope of the, mat the matters that we have or we normally consider. So it's clear that hasn't been considered properly. Uh, attorney, can you please provide this chamber with an explanation as to why it is in the public interest? to, uh, to uh, prosecute Bernard Collieri and, and Witness K for calling out uh, unlawful activity. The Attorney General, Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr. President, and I thank Senator Patrick for the question. And Mr. President, uh, this matter is currently before the court. In fact, it is in the court today. So I will be very cautious in the comments that I make to Senator Patrick. Uh, Senator Patrick, you did ask questions. Uh, at Senate estimates, and you were provided with the responses that you have referred to. Uh, what I can now say in relation to your question is this. The Commonwealth Director of Public Prosecutions considered the brief of evidence and made an independent decision that a prosecution was the appropriate course of action in relation to this case. As you have stated, this was done in accordance with a prosecution policy of the Commonwealth that requires the CDPP be satisfied that the prosecution would be in the public interest. Mr Kaliri was charged with an offence of conspiracy to communicate Australian secret intelligence service information, contrary to section 11.5 of the Criminal Code Act 1995 and section 39 of the Intelligence Services Act 2001 and with further offences of communicating Australian secret intelligence service information contrary to section 39 of the Intelligence Services Act 2001. You would also be aware Witness K has been charged with an offence of conspiracy to communicate Australian secret intelligence service information contrary to section 11.5 of the Criminal Code Act 1995 and section 39 of the Intelligence Services Act 2001. As I said, this is an independent decision that the CDPP made in terms Order. of— Senator Cash, time for the answers expired. Senator Patrick, a supplementary question. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr President. I understand Witness K has actually pleaded guilty in the uh, ACT Magistrates Court to conspiring to reveal classified information. Clearly, the government has worn uh, Witness K uh, down uh, over the years, including the removal of his passport in 2013, so he could not leave this country. He, uh, he, of course, took that matter to, to, to the AAT. What's the current status of his passport? Will he, be, will he have his passport returned to him? Senator Cash. Uh, thank you. Uh, in the first instance, Senator Patrick, you have provided a commentary in relation to this matter. That is merely your commentary. The government does not agree with what you've stated. In relation to the issue of the passport, that is a matter, Mr President, uh, more appropriately dealt with by the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, and my understanding is they would not normally comment on the status of a person or Australian's passport. Senator Patrick, a final supplementary question. 
So we've got uh, the government prosecuting uh, whistleblower David McBride after he revealed uh, war crimes in Afghanistan, which of course have been the subject of the Brereton uh, report. There's no question what he claimed uh, did occur. We also know of uh, Richard Boyle, who uh, called out the uh, uh, improper use of garnishee notices. He blew the whistle. He's being prosecuted. What's it, what is the public interest in prosecuting these whistleblowers? Senator Cash. Uh, thank you, Mr President. And as I've already stated uh, in my answer to Senator Patrick's first question, these matters are all currently before the court. What I will say, though, in relation to the two further matters uh, that Senator Patrick has raised, is that the prosecutions, as you are aware, Senator Patrick, you asked questions at estimates, uh, have been brought because the Commonwealth Director of Public Prosecutions made an independent decision that the prosecutions are in accordance with the prosecution policy of the Commonwealth. Senator Brockman. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Employment, Workforce, Skills, Small and Family Business and my fellow Senator from WA, Senator Cash. Can the Minister please update the Senate on the state of the labour market following today's ABS labour force figures and how the Morrison government's 21 budget is securing Australia's economic recovery? Minister representing the Minister for Employment, Workforce, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr. President, and I thank Senator Brockman for the question. And, uh, Mr. President, the labour force figures uh, have been released by the Australian Bureau of Statistics today uh, in relation to May 2021. What we have seen today is as follows. The unemployment rate has decreased to 5.1 per cent. The participation rate, colleagues, has actually increased to 66.2 per cent. So Australians are saying, I'm out there, I'm ready, willing and able to undertake work. Employment itself is now at a record high, Mr President, in Australia. 13 million 125,100. The employment to population ratio has itself increased to 62.8 per cent. Underemployment, which we often uh, talk about in this chamber, has actually decreased to 7.4 per cent, and the monthly hours worked for May increased by 25 million hours. So, Mr. President, what we saw in the release of the Labor Force statistics today was employment in the month of May increased by 115,200, and that exceeded all market expectations. There are now more than 13.1 million Australians in work, and that is a record number of Australians in employment. And when you look at where we were 12 months ago, that is a good thing that we can stand here 12 months later and say we have a record number of Australians in employment. What it actually means is that the level of employment is now 130,300 above the pre-COVID level that was recorded in March 2020. And in fact, it's now 987,200, or 8.1 per cent higher than the trough in the labour market recorded in May 2020. And pleasingly, in terms of full-time job creation, the majority of jobs created in May were full-time jobs. Senator Brockman, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Amazing testament to Australian businesses and Australian workers, Minister. Can the Minister outline how the government is continuing to support our labour market to recover from the once-in-a-century economic impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic? Senator Cash. And thank you, Mr. President. And Senator Brockman, you are, it is right. You are absolutely correct. It is a testament to all of the employers out there. The employers who are working with the government, looking at the government's policies, investing in the government policies and creating more employment. And as I was saying, Mr. President, in answer to uh, Senator Brockman's first question, in the month of May, what we saw is that 97,500 of those jobs that were created were full-time jobs. That is a good thing, and it is all due to the employers out there taking on people, giving them those full-time jobs. In fact, in Australia now, we have full-time employment at a record high, 
965,200 Australians. And that is why, as a government, and certainly in the budget uh, that we recently brought down, we continue to put in place those policies that businesses in Australia can lever off to prosper, grow, and as today we've seen with the labour market figures for, for May, create more Order. jobs Senator for Australia. Cash. Senator Brockman, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. As the COVID-19 pandemic continues to have a devastating impact around the world, can the minister explain why Australians can continue to have confidence in the resilience of our labour market and our economic recovery? Senator Cash. Well, Mr President, again, when you look at where we were 12 months ago and then you look at where we are today, Treasury was modelling at the height of COVID-19 that unemployment could potentially go to 15 per cent. Two million Australians could have been out of work. In May 2021, what we are now seeing is a drop in the unemployment rate to 5.1 per cent. We're seeing an increase in the participation rate. We're seeing an increase in the number of full-time jobs that have been created. And again, we're seeing employers working with the government, utilising the government's policies that we've put in place to ensure that they are prospering, growing and creating more jobs for Australians. But, Mr President, we always acknowledge that people are still doing it tough out there. There are businesses out there that are still doing it tough. And that is why we continue to put in place those policies, for example, the instant asset write-off. For those businesses who do have that ability to invest, we are saying to them, invest in your business, grow your business and create more jobs for Australians. Senator Ciccone. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Colbeck. Minister, yesterday the acting Premier of Victoria, James Molino, said, and I quote, Victorians have turned out in their thousands to get vaccinated, but we just can't maintain this rate without certainty about supply from the Commonwealth. Why has the Morrison government failed to give certainty of supply and forced the Victorian government to stop taking bookings for the first dose of the Pfizer vaccine? The Minister representing the Minister for Health and Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. Mr. President, thank uh, Senator Giacconi for the question. Mr. President, uh, the Australian government has in fact provided additional resources and vaccines to Victoria to assist them through their current circumstance, Mr President. Um, and so we've worked very closely with the Victorian government. We, we've, we've supported them in, in vaccine supply, Mr President. Yeah, and, and so, Mr President, so th there are a significant number of additional vaccines that have been supplied to Victoria to assist them with the rollout. So I don't, I don't accept the premise of the question that's been put by Senator Ciccone uh, that we are trying to starve Victorians of vaccine supply. In fact, we've worked very cooperatively to provide additional capacity and additional vaccines in the tens of thousands to Victorians so that they have additional supply to support Victorians who are looking for a vaccine. And Mr. President, the announcement today Order. is also obviously going to create some, uh, some further challenges Order. with the changes in the advice that were received with respect to the, to, to the uh, Pfizer and the AstraZeneca vaccines. Mr. President, we will follow that advice and we will continue to work with the states Senator towards supporting them in, in the role. Senator, Senator Colbeck. Senator Ciccone. Uh, look, thank you, Mr. President. On relevance, um, and I don't want to repeat part of the question, but the quote that I had asked the minister was, was directly from the acting premier about the, the lack of certainty about the supply from the Commonwealth. That was the acting premier's direct quote. Thank and you. ask him to, to address that part of the I question. You've emphasised part of the question. I think, with respect, the minister was talking about uh, the supply of vaccines to the state of Victoria, so I think he is directly relevant. Um, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. Mr President, um, well, we have worked very closely with Victoria to support them in, with, with supplies, Mr President. Uh, and, Mr President, we have provided uh, additional vaccines to the tune of 150,930 over four weeks to vaccine to, to Victoria for Pfizer vaccines. Mr. President, we've provided them 170,000 doses over six weeks of AstraZeneca, uh, and we've provided an additional 330,000 AstraZeneca into our primary care clinics into Victoria, so that they can be assisted with the current issues that they're dealing with. Mr. President, uh, we will continue to work closely with the Victorian government and all of the other states. Uh, to ensure that they have the maximum available supplies to support people to get vaccinated as quickly as possible. 
Senator Ciccone, a supplementary question. Can the minister confirm that at National Cabinet the Commonwealth committed to ensuring a supply of the second dose? And why has the government failed to meet this commitment? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Thanks, Senator Ciccone, for the question. Uh, the, the Commonwealth government has given supply indications for vaccines to each state out over a considerable period of time, Mr. President. We continue to work with the states as those vaccine supplies are confirmed from our suppliers. And we will continue to do that, Mr. President. So we have given supply indications to each of the states. Uh, we have uh, met those supply indications and we continue to work with the states in circumstances as we are working with Victoria right now to ensure that they have the maximum available supply that we can, we can provide to them uh, to support their vaccine rollout. Mr. President. Additional 150,000 <laughs> Pfizer vaccines to Victoria over four weeks, Mr. President. 170,000 additional Astra AstraZeneca to Victorian state government over six weeks, and over 330,000 additional doses, Mr. President, to our primary care providers. Senator Ciccone, a final supplementary question. Thank you. How many aged care workers have been turned away from Victorian vaccination centres as a result of the Morrison government's failure to provide certainty of supply, as it promised at National Cabinet? Senator Colbeck. Mr. President, my advice from the Victorian government, from Order. three sources, Mr. President, is that uh, uh, aged care workers remain a priority category uh, for vaccination in Victoria. That advice has been provided to me by three sources within the Victorian government, so I don't accept that uh, the, that uh, the workers are not being. Uh, not, I don't have vaccine available to them, Mr President, because I've had it confirmed from three sources within the Victorian government that uh, they, remain, they re remain a priority uh, and there still are bookings available for aged care workers if they want to go and get a vaccine. Senator McMahon. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Energy and Emissions Reductions, Senator Seselja. Given the importance of diesel to Territorians, particularly those in remote locations who rely on diesel to run power generations and critical machinery. Can the minister outline to the Senate the importance of diesel to our economy and what action the Liberal and national governments is taking to ensure we have an affordable and secure supply of diesel? The minister representing the Minister for Energy and Emissions Reduction, Senator Seselja. Uh, well, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. President. I thank Senator McMahon for the question. The Liberal National Government is taking strong action to further boost Australia's long-term fuel security, and we're doing it by locking in the future of our refining sector. Now, our economy relies heavily on energy from liquid fuels, and this will continue to grow. Diesel is our most important transport fuel. And Australians use more diesel than electricity. It's also the critical fuel source during an emergency, powering the trucks that move our food, our pharmaceuticals and our emergency Order. services vehicles. That's why we're increasing Senator the amount of diesel Ayers. we keep on shore. Holding more diesel in Australia will increase our resilience to supply disruptions, protecting consumers and the economy from fuel shortages. We're investing $200 million through a competitive grants program to build new diesel storage. But, Mr President, this is just part of our plan to ensure that Australians have access to the affordable, reliable and secure supply of fuel they rely on. We're ensuring we have access to the fuel Order we need to keep Australia moving. Our comprehensive fuel security package will also lock in around 4,000 jobs and through both, both new construction jobs and protecting those at refineries. Now, the Greens may not like it, Labor may not like it, but this will be done through a variable production payment, meaning the refineries will only be paid when they Order. need it, not when they're making profits. And our package will also enhance Australia's national security. Keep fuel prices for consumers among the lowest in the OECD. Now, the events of 2020 have reminded us that we can't be complacent. We're taking the action now to shield us from potential shocks in the future and enhance our national security. Our plan will help ensure Australia has the appropriate sovereign capability it needs for any event. We're protecting families and businesses from higher prices and supporting thousands of jobs across the economy as we Order. recover from COVID-19. Senator McMahon, a supplementary question. Order on my left. Thank you, Mr. President. 
Can the minister outline how the government's fuel security package will help secure the diesel that we rely on? Senator Seselja. Uh, well, yes, I can, and thank, I thank the senator for the question. The Liberal National Government's fuel security package will help secure Australia's fuel stocks through a minimum stockholding obligation that will protect our ability to produce vital fuels like diesel during an emergency. Now, in a worst-case scenario, even if oil imports uh, are disrupted, our refineries will have the ability to provide the fuel needed to run our critical services. The minimum stockholding obligation will also safeguard levels of petrol Order. and jet fuel and see a 40 per cent increase in our diesel stocks from 2024 to be kept in Australia. Now, we know that this is the least distortionary way of working with industry to improve supply chain resilience and protect consumers. Delivering secure liquid fuels such as diesel goes hand in hand with ensuring Australian households and businesses have access to cheap and reliable power. All of these measures are critical to recovering from the pandemic, protecting jobs, growing our economy and keeping all Australians safe, including those in the top end. Senator McMahon, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Can the minister outline how the government is working to build our sovereign fuel re refining and storage capacity. Senator Seselja. Well, yes, I can. And we have this is about sovereignty. Order. We have delivered on our promise and locked in Australia's Order. refining capacity Across and its 1,250 employees. Now, Senator the Greens Thorpe. may not like it, uh, but with the Ampol Order. refinery in Brisbane and the Viva Energy refinery in Geelong both remaining in operation until at least mid-2027, and I know it's been warmly welcomed by the AWU. Now, supporting our refineries will ensure we have the sovereign capability needed to prepare for any event, protect families and businesses from higher prices at the Bowser, and keep Australians moving as we recover. Now, this is a key part of our plan to, to secure Australia's recovery from the pandemic Order. and prepare against any future crises. This builds on the action we've already Senator taken Ayers. to boost our fuel security, taking advantage of record low global oil prices to purchase Australia's first government-owned crude oil stocks for domestic security. We're taking action to ensure we have the fuel Order. we Senator need Seljo, to keep Australia the moving and to protect expired. our— Senator Kitching. President, my question is to the Minister for the National Disability Insurance Scheme, Senator Reynolds. In defending her heartless failure to pick up the phone and personally apologise to the family of Liam Danher, after 78 days in the portfolio, the minister asserted that, and I quote, if my chief of staff does something on my behalf, then I consider that is the case. Why won't the minister just pick up the phone and apologise to Liam's family? The Minister for the National Disability Insurance Scheme, Senator Reynolds. Uh, well, I thank the senator for that question. And can I just say, first and foremost, in all of these circumstances, and, there, and tragically there are more than one case, my first and foremost uh, consideration is the, the, is the respects and the wishes of the family. As I have previously advised this chamber, uh, my office has contacted uh, Mr Danher's family, his father in fact, and offered a call or a meeting with me. It was agreed at this meeting it would best take place once more information is available and when that has occurred. The NDIA Chief Legal Counsel is reviewing um, Liam Danher's case and will provide a report on the detail and any learnings that the NDIA can take from this case. And the outcomes of that uh, will be communicated to the family prior to any public uh, comment on this case. Senator Reynolds, I have Senator Kitching on a point of order. Senator Kitching. Mr President, it was, the question was very clear. Why hasn't the minister picked up the phone and apologised to Liam's family? Um, and I, I, I think, with respect, I've allowed you to remind the minister of the answer. The minister is entitled to answer the question in the terms that she sees fit. Um, and she is talking about this particularly unfortunate event, and in that sense, she is directly relevant, uh, answering the question as she deems appropriate. Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. And as I, I did answer the question uh, first up, and I'll just say it again, is first and foremost, I believe it's important for me to respect the wishes of the individual families, and including Liam Danher's family. And that is exactly what I'm doing in relation to this case and also to, to other cases that have come, come to my attention.
Senator Kitching, a supplementary question. What other actions has the minister asserted were her, were her own, when in fact they were the actions of her chief of staff? And if you can't answer it all now, you can take it on notice and come back to, to the chamber. Senator Reynolds. Uh, well, I thank uh, the senator for that question, and uh, as she knows, she's already put those questions on notice to me. So, of course, I will answer those uh, in in the normal course of events. Uh, as as I said yesterday, and as I've repeated again today, first and foremost, it is important for me to respect the wishes of individual family members, and that is what I always Order. do. I have directly talked to some family members where they have wished to do so and when and how they wish to do so. And Senator again, Kitching, my Chief of Staff a, Senator Kitching, uh, acted um, on, on a, my behalf. Senator Reynolds, I have Senator Kitching on a point of order. Senator Kitching. I did give the minister an option that if she couldn't remember everything that she had said that she did, but if in fact it was her Chief of Staff, she could come back and re report to the chamber. But if she can give me some of that now, that would be helpful. Um, with respect, I think the minister did say, oh, the minister's concluded, but did refer to questions on notice being answered as well. Senator Kitching. It's a very bad memory. Senator Mr. Kitching, a final um, supplementary question. Given the actions of her staff are in fact her own, can the minister confirm that rather than becoming aware of Ms Higgins' allegation of rape progressively over days, as she has claimed, in fact, she became aware at the same time her chief of staff became aware, that is, three days after the alleged rape, on the 26th of March? 2019. Senator Reynolds. Uh, well, look, thank you very much. Um, I would argue that that is not in any way a supplementary question uh, in relation to the, the Danhurst case. But as I have said uh, in many forums, in this chamber and also at Estimates, I'm currently assisting the AFP with their inquiries into these matters, and they are subject of a statement that I've provided the AFP, and it would be entirely inappropriate for me to comment further. Senator O'Sullivan. Mr President, my question is to the Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Can the Minister please update the Senate on the rollout of the cashless debit card? Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr President, and I thank Senator O'Sullivan for his question. And can I also acknowledge the fantastic work that you've been doing, Senator Order, O'Sullivan, Senator Rustin, uh, please, to help— Please resume, sir. I can't hear— Senator Rustin, who is as close to me as any other senator in the chamber, physically only a seat away. Can I please hear Senator Rustin's answer? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr President. And can I thank Senator O'Sullivan for the work that he's doing to make sure people on the cash that's kept card move along the pathway to employment. It is really important because, in your own words, Senator O'Sullivan, the government does not believe that the cashless debit card is a destination. It is a tool to help people take control of their own lives, become job ready and get into work. Because having a meaningful job uh, is, uh, is what we believe uh, can be a destination for all working age Australians. Since the 17th of March, people on income management uh, using the Basics card in the Northern Territory and Cape York have been able to make the switch to the CDC. And I'm pleased to update the Senate that the transition in the Cape York has now been completed, with all 88 people using the Basics card now across onto the cashless debit card. And uh, the Families Responsibility Commission does a fantastic job in Cape York to help their people stabilise their lives. And I was fortunate enough to see some of the Commission hearings uh, while I was there, where a lady in the community actually chose to go onto the cashless debit card uh, to have some of her social security payment uh, quarantined so she could pay for the maintenance of her, her home. In fact, she's one of 47 people in the Cape who volunteered to go on the card. That's people who were not required to be on it. They have voluntarily done so. In the Northern Territory to date, we've seen 108 people make the switch from the basics card to the cashless debit card. And while I was in Darwin, I was fortunate enough to sit with somebody who went through the process uh, at the Casuarina Service Centre. And he told me Order. that he Senator wanted to Watt. make the switch because the CDC is a debit visa card which would allow him to pay his bills online, have more independence over uh, his, uh, his settings on his budget, and we will continue to work uh, to ensure people in the Northern Territory are armed with factual information about the cashless debit card. Order. Senator Brockman, a supplement, oh, sorry, Senator O'Sullivan, a supplementary question. Can the minister please explain how the cashless debit card is providing income management participants with more choice and freedom? I'll call the minister to answer when I'll be able to hear her.
Is there any ability to restrain oneself on the left of the chamber at the moment? Senator Rennick, please, as well. Senator Watt, Senator Ayres. Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr. President. The cashless debit card is a debit visa card and it works just the same as any other key card in your purse or your wallet. The only difference is you cannot buy alcohol, most gambling products, or get cash. It can be used in over a million shops across Australia. It can be used online in comparison to the just 17,000 outlets which accept the basics card. Order. Senators uh, Watt and Rennick. The Based on the cashless debit card, unlike the basics uh, card, can be used at pubs, clubs, restaurants and cafes to buy meals and non-alcoholic drinks. Senator it can also Green. be used to buy lotto tickets and scratchies. The government wants participants Senator to have Watt. choice and freedom, and we have no issue at all with people who want to buy a beer or have a punt from time to time. This program is about helping people to stabilise their lives become job ready and hopefully hopefully get back into the workforce. Senator O'Sullivan, a final supplementary question. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. Uh, Minister, you mentioned you've been out on the ground. Can you please advise what feedback that you've received when you've been in these communities about the cashless debit card? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr President. Well, overwhelmingly, we heard that people were really excited about the fact that they can use their cashless debit card when they travel, whether it be Cairns to Sydney to Adelaide or Perth or anywhere else. But the other issue they raised, Senator O'Sullivan, was the number of uh, times it was around the misinformation that is out there. The opposition are running an absolutely shameful scare campaign aimed at aged pensioners. Order. They are lying Order. to them. Let me be Order. absolutely crystal clear. The government has Order. no plan to force aged pensioners onto the cashless debit card, and we will Order. never have such a plan. The cashless debit card Order is for on working aged payments to help to people stabilise their lives, become job ready and get back into the workforce. Those opposite must cease Order. telling Australians lies. They must tell Order. the truth, which is something that they are not doing at the Order. moment. Senator yeah. Birmingham. Mr President, much as it's nice to watch uh, Senator Rustin call out the lies of those opposite, I ask that further questions be placed on notice. Sorry? Um, I'm going to ask you. I'm going to ask you to withdraw that word because it did refer to specific people. I, 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 I withdraw. Thank you, Senator Birmingham. So the uh, question is, are there any motions to take note of answers? Senator McCarthy. Um, Madam Deputy President, I rise to take note of the answer given by Senator Colbeck to the question asked by Senator Wong. Just three days ago, on June 14, the Minister for Health told Australians in terms of the vaccines that are available at this point, the Commonwealth has made AstraZeneca available on the medical advice for those that are over 50. He also said regarding the vaccine rollout, supply dictates the rollout, and we provided advice on all of the confirmed supply that we have. So we obviously have very clear line of sight with regards to AstraZeneca. The states and territories have ample volumes of AstraZeneca. End of quote. Now, just a few minutes ago in question time, we had the minister representing the health minister tell us every Australian who wants a vaccine will have access to one by the end of the year. But what they can't tell us, Madam Deputy President, is how they are going to do this. Thoughts and prayers isn't going to cut it. Wishful thinking certainly won't deliver an adequate supply of the Pfizer vaccine, especially now we have changed health advice, meaning more Australians will be wanting the Pfizer vaccine. Now remember, this was the health minister that told Australians last month that for anyone hesitant to get the AstraZeneca shot, there would be enough Pfizer for everyone by the end of the year. He then had to come out and correct this statement, telling us that we in fact shouldn't be waiting for Pfizer stocks to increase. Is your head spinning? Mine certainly is. But isn't it any wonder Australians have lost trust in what this government is telling them about the vaccine rollout. Trust in the public health system is absolutely crucial 
to support vaccine uptake, and we cannot afford for this to be damaged by the bungling of the Morrison government. Improving access to COVID-19 vaccines is crucial to increase uptake. It's crucial the government is honest with us about how long those under 60 may now have to wait to access the Pfizer vaccine. And I know this is a big ask of the Morrison government to stop the spin machine and just tell us simply and clearly when all Australians under 60 can get their Pfizer shot. They also need to tell us exactly when they were first advised by a TAGI that they should be considering raising the age for the AstraZeneca vaccine. This inability to be clear and straight with us is impacting individuals and communities. There's already vaccine hesitancy among some of our most vulnerable populations. Just last week, a Central Australian Aboriginal uh, Medical Centre was avoiding Pfizer vaccine waste by offering vaccines to non-Aboriginal people over the age of 50. Dr John Boffer, the Chief Medical Officer of the Central Australian Aboriginal Congress, conceded there had been vaccine hesitancy among the Aboriginal population. In order not to waste a single dose, Congress put friends and family of staff on a waiting list to, to use up any of the leftovers. I'm very pleased there was take up here, but I'm also concerned that there was so much vaccine left over. And this is for Pfizer. We can't get figures on what percentage of the population in remote communities have taken up the vaccine offer. We just can't get them. I've tried. Australian Medical Association Northern Territory President Dr Robert Parker has said concerns about the AstraZeneca vaccine had already sparked fears and hesitancy. That was before today's announcement about the medical advice to raise the age. Now, I've been out there talking to families, talking to Territorians, urging them to get the jab. I've also been urging the Morrison government to do its job and invest in a nationwide public awareness campaign, including translation into First Nations languages. The mess messaging by the federal government to the community, let alone the First Nations and uh, those with second languages who are not First Nations, obviously multicultural communities, has really been lacking in this whole process. First Nations media did an amazing job at the start of this pandemic getting out messages about hygiene and movement restrictions to keep people and communities safe. Their efforts have been recognised internationally and held up as best practice, but they have not been funded to do the same thing when it comes to the vaccine rollout. There have been restrictions on the ability of First Nations media and other organisations to craft their own messages in language and at the community level to encourage vaccine take-up. Thank you, Senator McCarthy. Senator Davey. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you to Senator McCarthy for raising this very important issue and highlighting the vaccination rollout across the country. Um, I acknowledge uh, Senator McCarthy's concerns about uh, the different vaccines that are available, the new health advice that we have. Um, relating to the AstraZeneca vaccine. But I also want to reassure the Australian people that this government is on the job. We are getting the vaccines out there, and uh, vaccinations are predominantly very safe, and we don't want to engage in this rhetoric that leads to and adds to the vaccine hesitancy. I want to thank the millions of Australians that have already put their arms out and received their vaccinations. I note that we are getting better at our vaccination rollout. Whereas in the early days of the rollout, it took 45 days to reach the first million doses, it took only 10 days to get the last million. We've got over 6 million doses out into people's arms across the country. We have more than 60 per cent of people aged over 70 are vaccinated and protected. More than 40 per cent of people aged over 50 are vaccinated and protected. And we have about one in four of the eligible po population, that is people aged over 16, who have at least one dose of the vaccination. We will see our first arrivals of the Moderna vaccination from September and October this year. 
and we are already getting more GPs the vaccinations they need so they can give their, uh, their patients, their clients um, the vaccination and we can really ramp up the rollout to get more and more people vaccinated throughout the country. We are expanding access to Pfizer across Australia and that's why we're using the valuable GP workforce. This expansion was planned to coincide with our highest expected arrival of Pfizer doses so far, and during July we expect another 2.8 million doses to come. Uh, we're continuing to work very closely with the states and territories uh, and, and supporting their vaccination hubs, which are hugely successful. And, uh, I know all New South Wales and Victoria are seeing record vaccinations going out the door. Our core infrastructure is now well established and well tested. Um, and I do also want to uh, come to the point raised by Senator McCarthy about um, educating the community across our multicultural community. Our government has provided 1.3 million for peak multicultural organisations to help reach culturally and linguistically diverse communities, including First Nations communities. Our ethnic media includes press, radio, social and out-of-home campaigns to ensure that people in linguistically diverse communities understand the vaccination rollout, they're aware of what their rights are um, and they're aware of how, uh, the importance of getting vaccinations. Um, campaign assets have been translated into 32 languages, while other materials are in over 60 languages across Australia. We are very aware that in our multicultural society it is very important that we don't limit ourselves to a homogenous uh, education and communications campaign. But our research also shows that people want the facts, and that is why when people go to um, Australia's COVID vaccination rollout website, they will be able to find out are they eligible, where they can go to book a vaccination, how to book a vaccination. And they can also access advice from trusted people such as the head of the Therapeutic Goods Association, John Skerritt, and the former Deputy Chief Medical Officer, Nick Coatesworth, and our Chief Nurse, among other experts. This campaign is working. Our record vaccination day saw over 120,000 vaccinations in one day. Um, I encourage anyone listening to go to australia.gov.au to find those facts, to check if they're eligible, to find their local clinic and to book now, put their arm out, get their vaccination and join in with the one in four people in Australia who've already got a vaccination dose. Thank you, Senator Davey. Um, Senator Green. Government, it is clear that this vaccine rollout is bungled, botched and a bloody mess. Because what we know is that under this government, we have seen a vaccine rollout that has been delayed, played down and even, we've been told from the, the Prime Minister, isn't a race. Well, I want to join with my colleague, Senator McCarthy, in encouraging the government to deal with vaccine hesitancy and be clear that in standing in this chamber today, we are not seeking to downplay the importance of the vaccine. And anyone that tries to say that is absolutely wrong. We have always, always supported the vaccine itself. But it is absolutely fundamental that we should be able to come in here and criticise the government's vaccine rollout because they are doing a shoddy job. We have sat, Senator McCarthy and I have sat in Senate estimates and asked officials of your departments what they are doing to deal with vaccine, vaccine hesitancy, particularly in First Nations uh, communities. And the answers have been absolutely galling. I, made sure that those department officials knew that there was a problem with vaccine hesitancy in the Torres Strait and throughout the Cape. And what I got told was that it wasn't a problem, but the figures uh, show that it is. So instead of just trying to pretend like everything is okay, what we want to see from this government is taking this seriously. 
taking this seriously and understanding that no amount of spin can make this any better. Because we've been in this pandemic for more than a year, and Scott Morrison still can't get quarantine right, and he still can't get vaccines right either. There's no excuses anymore when it comes to what this Prime Minister is responsible for. And yet, again today, we've seen the Prime Minister and the government trying to make sure that people know that this isn't their fault, that they're not responsible for the vaccine rollout. Well, Australians feel incredibly different. We found out today that AstraZeneca vaccine will only be recommended for the use in people aged 60 and over due to the concerns over rare blood clotting. And that is medical advice, and we accept that advice. But can I be very clear about this? We're now only producing a vaccine type in Australia that can only be used for people over the age of 60. So the majority of people are not, uh, not able to get the vaccines that we are producing here in Australia. If only we could have foreseen uh, the need to produce a vaccine here on shore 12 months ago. That's what other countries did. They foresaw that issue. And the government likes to talk about statistics a lot, but they definitely cherry pick the best ones. Because when we look at what's happening in other countries, what is happening in other countries, the US has uh, vaccinated 44% of its population. And Donald Trump was their, their um, uh, president. 44% of, of the population has been vaccinated. In the UK, 45% of people have been vaccinated. And their government's been described as a shop, shopping trolley smashing between aisles. What does that say about you lot and your vaccine rollout? The worldwide average is 6.2% of vaccine population. But Australia is sitting at just under 3 per cent of the population being fully vaccinated. And while the government talks about doses, what they're not talking about is people who are fully vaccinated, because they want to believe, they want to back in the Prime Minister when he says that this is not a race. The Prime Minister says that the vaccinations are not a race. We'll tell that to aged care workers still waiting to be vaccinated and the disability workers who are still waiting to receive a single dose. The Prime Minister says that this is not a race. We'll tell that to communities still facing lockdowns. They have had enough. The Prime Minister says that this is not a race, but tell that to international tourism businesses who have been told that they will have to wait until mid-2022 before international tourists return to our shores. They think that this is a race. The Prime Minister says that this is not a race, but tell that to the 36,000 Australians waiting to come home because this government refuses to take responsibility for national quarantine. Well, they think that this is a race. The Prime Minister said that this is not a race. Well, tell that to the Indigenous communities, the remote Indigenous communities who have not received a single dose of this vaccine but remain incredibly vulnerable to COVID-19. They think that this is a race. Vaccinating our country and making quarantine safe is a race, and we are dead last. We don't even have our Thank shoes on. We Thank haven't even you, got Senator ready Green, yet. Your time has expired. Senator Brockman. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. Well, I think thou dost protest too much, Senator Green. You stand up and you begin your speech here today by saying, oh, no, Labor is not politicising this. Labor's not politicising this issue. We're not trying to make political point scoring out of this issue. And then you spend the next five minutes, and you spend you know, many hours in estimates, are doing exactly that, politicising this issue, trying to make what is a very complex and, and technical um, uh, undertaking um, into a political point scoring exercise. I would encourage all Australians to get out there and get a vaccine. I'm on the list to get my vaccine. Uh, it was going to be AstraZeneca. It was going to be AstraZeneca, um, and, and now that may have changed, depending on what happens over the next few months, and timing will obviously potentially uh, shift in terms of my booking. But the point is—and I don't often quote John Maynard Keynes in this place. I don't think I've ever done it before, and I don't plan to do it again, probably. But when the facts change, I change my mind. That's what John Maynard Keynes said. And what have we got? We've got today from Atagi the expert medical group, the group that Labor constantly tells us that they are seeking to do the right thing and follow the medical advice, uh, has, has changed the recommendation 
on the AstraZeneca vaccine. Now, this is the second time the recommendation has been changed. The government has been completely upfront about that. Uh, it's the second time the age recommendation on the AstraZeneca vaccine has been changed as new information has come to hand, which is exactly appropriate. It's ex the, exactly the way that this rollout should be managed. And it is the government taking note of the change to the recommendation, the updated advice on the Pfizer vaccine for adults aged under 60. Now, until today, ATAGI's advice has been the Pfizer vaccine was preferred for adults under the age of 50. This updated advice, taking that age to 60, is based on new evidence demonstrating a higher risk than originally thought of a rare blood clotting condition. Um, I'm not even going to try and say that uh, the condition's name for the 50 to 59 year old age group. Um, but those opposite also don't like the facts of the vaccine rollout. Uh, the facts that include uh, a, a total number of vaccines uh, of six, over 6 million, a daily increase of, of 152,000 uh, as of uh, midnight the 15th of the 6th, 2021. In the last seven days, 738,000 doses. In the last eight days, almost 900,000 doses. In the last nine days, a million doses. And the rollout has, as we always said it would, uh, and, um, and, and as uh, we, our, the Australian people would expect, has significantly boosted over time. So the first million doses took 45 days. The second million doses took 20 days. The third uh, a million doses took 17 days. The four million dose mark was hit 13 days after that. The five million dose mark nine days after that, and the six million dose mark uh, around 10 days after that. So the rollout has significantly uh, ramped up over time. But obviously the government has taken note of the medical advice and has acted on that expert medical advice and has altered the program accordingly. Uh, you know, I, I'm uh, extraordinarily proud of um, what we've managed to do uh, in response to an international pandemic, the life of, like of which the global community has not seen for a hundred years. Australia has responded uh, extraordinarily well in so many ways, and I think that the Australian people, as um, as they are choose to do so will become vaccinated. And I certainly, again, I would encourage all Australians who are currently eligible for a vaccine to make sure they are using the appropriate websites to register for those vaccines. I went through the Department of Health website to register for my own vaccine uh, through the Western Australian Department of Health uh, website. And I would encourage all my fellow citizens of Western Australia to do so. Um, if you are eligible to have a vaccine, you should register, you should get vaccinated. This is the quickest path to continue the very solid foundation we have of recovering from this once-in-a-century global pandemic and uh, getting life as much as possible back to normal as we all want it to as quickly as possible. Thank you, Senator Brockman. Senator Ayres. Madam Deputy President, well, <clears throat> Senator Brockman says that he's proud of the Australian government's response. Stone cold motherless last. Uh, that is where Australia is and the Morrison government is in terms of vaccine schedule and vaccine delivery. And that has real consequences for ordinary Australians and ordinary people. Real consequences in terms of their health, real consequences in terms of the economy. And we've seen from the budget projections of this government that it knows that because of its vaccine failure there will be at least one citywide lockdown every month for the duration of the financial year. Now, I watched Senator Colbeck's performance answering questions about these issues uh, uh, in, in this afternoon's question time. Now, Senator Colbeck does very much give the impression of a bloke who needs a hand crossing the road. He doesn't inspire confidence. Uh, he doesn't know the answers to basic questions. Um, he doesn't appear to have the capability or the guts to face up to the big issues that face Australia 
in the vaccine rollout in our response to the pandemic. But Minister Hunt belled the cat in the other place this afternoon when he was asked the question. He confessed that there were discussions with Pfizer in July of last year. Well, why on earth don't we have the proper levels of supply and the right vaccine options, enough vaccine options, for Australians to make sure that we're in the right position, that we're not sitting at the bottom of the queue, outside the league tables of the top 100 when it comes to vaccine delivery? In July, the government had it within its grasp to secure enough Pfizer vaccines to vaccinate Australians. But instead, who knows why? Instead, we put all of our eggs in the AstraZeneca basket. And how on earth are we going to get out of this mess? The vaccine rollout catastrophe hurts ordinary Australians. This disease, there will be more of this disease because of the government's vaccine failure. That means more Australians will die uh, of the COVID-19 virus. Others will be disabled. Many, many who didn't need to be ill will be ill. There will be more outbreaks. They will spread faster because of the government's vaccine failure. It will have significant economic impacts and we will be held back in terms of our living standards, in terms of jobs, uh, in terms of economic growth because of the government's failure. Now, ordinary Australians pulled their weight. Ordinary Australians pulled their weight. They deserve a government that actually pulls its weight. Now we've heard all of the excuses, all of the language designed to deflect and blame others. We even heard the minister representing the health minister, Senator Colbeck, yesterday say that the government was re-pivoting. I mean, what on earth does that mean? A re-pivot. The truth is. We've gone from I don't hold a hose mate to I don't hold a dose mate. And Scott Morrison, the Prime Minister, is running out of other people to blame. We are in a post repivot analysis now. And the truth is, the Prime Minister, when it comes to organising a press conference or a photo opportunity, is always there with bells on. There were 16 press conferences to make announcements over the course of last year and the first part of this year. 7 September, a big press conference to announce the AstraZeneca deal, hundreds of, uh, of uh, photos, big announcement. The 19th of August, another announcement. The 13th of November, another announcement. 16 of November, announced CSL as a local manufacturing site. I think that's where he held up with his Australian flag face mask, an empty vial of vaccine. Well, nothing could more symbolise the jingoism and the announcement before delivery approach of this government than holding up an empty vial at a press conference. All announcement, Thank no you, delivery. Senator Ayres. Your time has expired. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator McCarthy to take note of answers be agreed to. <clears throat> Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator Wish Wilson. Uh, I seek, uh, sorry, I rise to uh, take note of answers uh, to my question to Senator Rustin. Um, while I was waiting for my chance to, t to take note, um, I was looking at Senator Birmingham and I just remembered a question I asked in the Senate at, to Senator Birmingham five years ago, uh, where I read a tweet from Professor Terry Hughes. Uh, one of the world's global uh, coral experts. He just got back from surveying the Great Barrier Reef, and he said that his students looked at the survey results and they wept. Um, and of course, Professor Hughes has been a very outspoken uh, advocate for action on climate change because of his connection to the oceans and the Barrier Reef. Well, I won't go into Senator Birmingham's response, but I did want to frame it in the sense that. Uh, we have one coalition senator in here today talking about or quoting John Maynard Keynes, uh, when the facts change, I change my mind. Well, I would ask 
coalition senators, surely the facts before us are very obvious. Devastating indeed when you look at the information that's coming through on the changes we've seen in our oceans in just the last five years. Yet their approach to climate change and tackling the greatest challenge of our time hasn't changed at all. Hasn't changed at all. No action except distraction. No action except distraction. Any excuse except to take action. While we've had three mass coral bleachings on the Great Barrier Reef that's led to 50 per cent loss of coral cover on this greatest, most international, global wonder, a wonder you can see from space, while with the majority of the world's coral reefs have suffered even more significant damage from warming oceans, while Tasmania's giant kelp forests have vanished in the last five years, as have many seagrass beds around the country. Over a thousand kilometres of mangroves in the Northern Territory and Northern Queensland lost from warming oceans, in an environment that's already adapted to warm oceans. These are the extreme facts that we need to face. So why aren't we changing our mind? Why is it that our Resources Minister and Prime Minister have just given 80,000 square kilometres of our oceans for the oil and gas industry, including some of the world's biggest polluters, to carve up, to blast the hell out of them with seismic surveys, to risk these oceans and their values and their habitats with oil and gas drilling, to get established industrial production at our coastlines. And I asked the minister today whether she accept, accepted the simple, established scientific fact that burning fossil fuels leads to more greenhouse gas emissions, and more greenhouse gas emissions are directly correlated and causated to warming oceans. And what do we get out of the minister? All she could say is, I'm not a climate denier. Well, that's just not good enough. She could easily be a climate sceptic. I know there are senators in this chamber, like Senator Abetz, that don't call themselves climate deniers. They like to call themselves climate sceptics. Why didn't the minister just come out and say, yes, Senator, that is exactly right? Burning more fossil fuels leads to warming oceans. And warming oceans has led to these catastrophic impacts. And it doesn't matter if we get our emissions under control this week. We've still got 20 years of ocean warming to come from what we've already burnt. That's how dire it is. Just, I just want to repeat that for senators. Even if we take radical action, as David Attenborough tells us we have to do, as the Greens have been saying for decades, we still have warming locked into our system. Our oceans absorb 80 per cent of this planet's heat, and they've already absorbed a substantial amount of heat. So that means more changes, more impacts. And yet the minister couldn't answer the concerns of communities. Ocean lovers, surfers, fishers, divers. She couldn't come in here and explain why she's continuing with this insanity of issuing fossil fuel permits for the exact same product that, when it's burnt, is actually killing our oceans. It's the time in history to stop this madness. Thank you, Senator Wish-Wilson. So the question is that the motion as moved by Senator Wish-Wilson to take note of answers be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. That concludes that matter. And just before we go to tabling and consideration of committee reports, we're just going to pick up a ta um, committee extensions of time, which was missed this morning. So, for the information of senators, uh, because extensions of time for committee is to report was not reached before 12:45 p.m. today, I will now call the clerk to read items for postponement. For postponement, clerk. Committees, um, <clears throat> committees have lodged extension notifications as shown at item 7 on today's order of business. Community Affairs References Committee inquiry into the possible cancer cluster on the Bellarine Peninsula from the 17th of June to the 22nd of June 2021. And I remind senators that the question may be put on the proposal at the request of any senator. Um, <clears throat>
We will now move to tabling and consideration of committee reports and government responses. And I want to um, <clears throat> just uh, table the procedure report. So I present the procedures committee's second report of 2021, and I move that the Senate adopt the recommendation in paragraph 1.2 of the report. In June 2020, the Senate adopted temporary orders limiting the number of general business motions that may be proposed as formal. These orders also placed a limit of 200 words on such motions and asked the Procedure Committee to review the changes. The committee has met to review the orders at meetings in February, March and June this year and hopes to consult with senators <coughs> on alternative arrangements early in the 2021 spring sittings. The motion I have moved would extend the current temporary orders until 9 August 2021 to enable that consultation to take place. I commend the report to the Senate. Oh, Senator Waters. Hi, Deputy President. I wish to take note of that report. Am I able to do that now? Yes. Great. All right. Thank you. Um, so what we've just seen is a rollover of a one-year change to a process of this chamber um, to continue that restriction on motions for another couple of months, after which time we fully expect that there will be an even less democratic change to the Senate program. Now, we, we know that both of the big parties um, frequently vote together, and uh, this is just yet another issue that they are in lockstep on. Um, and they're wanting to diminish the rights of all senators, but the impact will be felt most disproportionately on the crossbench, um, to bring matters of uh, importance to the attention of the Senate, um, they want to put restrictions on that. It's known as motions. It's obviously a highly procedural issue, but it's a really important method for accountability and for bringing to the attention of the chamber issues that the government doesn't want to put on the agenda. There's very few options that the crossbench have to raise an issue that's not already the subject of a government bill and to require parties to vote on that issue. We get very few opportunities to do that, but it is a crucial accountability mechanism. It is a crucial transparency mechanism. This government, in extending this temporary order, which restricted senators' ability uh, to move as many motions as we used to be able to, um, and in flagging that there'll be some future uh, change, which we have very little hope would be an improvement, um, this is a, uh, an attempt by both of the big parties to be able to set the agenda and not have any power of the crossbench to raise additional issues. Now, as senators, we represent constituents. We want to put issues on the agenda, and we want the public to know what the policy position of the two big parties are. Well, that doesn't suit them because they don't actually want to be held to account. They don't want to be forced to tell the public what their position is. Now, I want to run through some of the really positive reforms that motions have been able to achieve just to make clear what's at stake here and why the crossbench are fighting so hard to keep our ability to move formal motions and to force the big parties to vote on the policies that, they are, that, that are mentioned within those motions. Perhaps the most famous, uh, uh, mo the most well-known one is the fact that motions led to the Banking Royal Commission. The Greens moved motions in this chamber and con um, concurred down to the House calling for accountability for the awful behaviour of banks. The very existence of those motions and the fact that um, folk in fact crossed the floor, uh, the former Senator um, Wacker Williams crossed the floor to support that uh, banking motion, increased the pressure and led to the government creating the Banking Royal Commission reluctantly, I might add, and after far too long a delay. But it was, this, it was those motions that were the genesis that led to a royal commission into the banks which has improved uh, some of the regulations that pertain to the conduct of banks. Now, motions also culminated in the Disability Royal Commission, following a similar process. Marriage equality, we fought for many years for that, and much of that began with motions in the Senate. Um, in fact, Senator Lam uh, a few other examples now. Senator Lambie's recent concurrence motion calling for a Royal Commission into defence and veteran suicide. Um, that 
uh, passed the Senate, and the government then allowed it to pass the House after the threat of uh, various members crossing the floor. And shortly after that, the government again announced that they would, in fact, call a royal commission. Um, a motion that we passed in March of 2021, a Greens motion opposing the Crib Point gas import terminal, um, was supported by all parties. And shortly afterwards, the project uh, was then rejected by the Victorian state government. Motions can lead to real outcomes, and the very existence of the crossbench being able to raise issues that might not suit the political agenda of the government of the day or even of the opposition and require that those parties put on the record what their policy position is on that issue, that is a crucial part of accountability. That is a crucial part of being open and honest in a representative democracy. So for both of those reasons, we will fight to keep motions and to keep our ability as representatives of our states uh, and territories to raise issues of importance that the government of the day might not see fit uh, to, to move legislation on or doesn't want mentioned or wants to try and um, stay quiet about their real policy position. We think transparency is actually a really good thing. And yet this government, with the move here to extend on the restriction of motions and the, um, uh, the likely restriction that will come after that, this government just doesn't want the accountability. It doesn't want the transparency. We've seen an hour's motion to ram legislation through. Um, we see an increasing trend to have uh, policy changes made by instrument. Sometimes that instrument isn't even allowed to be disallowed. And we've seen members of the government's own uh, uh, party raise their concerns about this trend towards executive power and the lack of accountability, the lack of the role of parliament to have a say in important policy changes. This is another example of that. And sadly, it seems to be done with the full support um, of the opposition. This is the two big parties ganging up against the crossbench to stop us from raising politically inconvenient issues to stop us from raising those issues that our constituents care about, um, that, that uh, future generations care about, that are important for matters of public interest, because they don't want to be embarrassed into saying what their real position is on those topics. Well, are you embarrassed about what your policy positions really are? Well, if so, change your policy positions. Rather than running and hiding from the accountability that motions forces you uh, to reveal your policy position, just change your policies if you're that embarrassed by them. So uh, we are very concerned at this trend of uh, manipulating the chamber and an attempt to restrict the rights of the crossbench to use what measures are available to us to hold to account uh, the government but also the opposition. And we will fight these measures. Now, this is a procedure committee report, and not many folk are on that procedure committee. But the other members of the crossbench have been very strong for the last year in resisting these restrictions, also. And I fully anticipate that that will continue. And we will await what proposal is to come um, to further change how motions operate. But I have a sneaking suspicion that it will result in less accountability, and that it will be an attempt to restrict the crossbench's ability to force a vote on issues, to force both of the big parties to reveal to the public what you actually think about issues. Now, I know you don't like transparency, and this government are just taking secrecy to a whole new level, but it's not right. It's anti-democratic, and I think it will be seen for uh, you trying to consolidate power and shield yourself from accountability and transparency. Um, so be, be very wary. This is the biggest crossbench that we've ever had in the history of this nation. There's a reason why people are not voting for the two big parties. Um, and I think though, you will simply give them more reason if you continue to try to shut down the crossbench from representing our constituents and raising issues that we think the public want to know the answers to and that you might not want to go on record with what your position is. Um, but the Australian people actually deserve to know what it is that you stand for. Motion serves that purpose. Motions also have led to real outcomes, which I've listed off before. It's led to several royal commissions. It's led to changes of policy at the state level. Um, it is a real force for change and a force for accountability. 
And so it is desperately disappointing that both of the big parties want to continue to shut them down and to silence the crossbench um, and to continue to try to sew up procedure in a way that gives even more power to the government of the day. So much for being um, a, a house of review. It's almost like you're treating the Senate like a tick and flick. And that the tragedy is the opposition seems to be fully on board with that proposal. Well, we will continue to fight this. I know the rest of the crossbench will continue to fight this, and we await this future proposal on the whatever it is, the 9th of August, to see just what nefariousness you hope to have in store. Thank you, Senator Waters. So the question is: the recommendation from the report be adopted. Those of that opinion say aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. <clears throat> uh, I will now call the government whip. Uh, thank you. Um, on behalf of the Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade Legislation Committee, I present the report of the Committee on the Customs Amendment, banning goods produced by Uyghur Forced Labour, Bill 2020, together with the Hansard Record of Proceedings, additional information and submissions. Thank you. And I did advise people that that's the report that's from Business of the Senate Order of the Day earlier. Um, thank you, Senator Davey. Um, on behalf of the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Human Rights, I present the Human Rights Scrutiny Report 7 of 2021. Uh, thank you. And, um, on behalf of the Joint Standing Committee on the National Broadband Network, I present a progress report of the committee and I seek to take note of that progress report, if I may do so now. Yes, certainly. Thank you. Um, as the progress report notes, this committee has had 11 public hearings in Canberra, uh, and we've called for and taken submissions from across the community. I would like to thank the work of the member for Barker in chairing these proceedings, as well as the work of the committee's secretariat in ensuring the important work of this committee runs smoothly. The committee originally sought to inquire solely on uh, the business case for the NBN and the experiences of small businesses with an emphasis on regional areas. Now, this is a vital um, piece of work that is being conducted by the committee because as someone who comes from the bush, it cannot be understated how important it is for us to ensure communications and connectivity remain not only constant but also accessible in the bush. There is nothing worse than small businesses for a small business than to come to a store willing to buy but unable to pay because an FPOS machine has come down. We've learned during COVID people have transferred away from cash. More and more people are relying on their debit card or their credit card or even indeed their um, telephone pay, pay apps. Uh, we, we have heard and we, we received 34 submissions, including from the Hayshire Council, just an hour north of my hometown of Deniliquin, the experiences of small business when things like their FPOS machine goes down, how much money they lose uh, just by that one small piece of infrastructure going down. The rollout of the NBN is a major task and it is vital to ensure um, to continue looking at ways to improve its service for our regional and small businesses. But it's also important to look at where, how far we've come in rolling out the NBN network. We have more than 8.1 million premises across Australia now connected to the NBN. 11.9 million premises are ready to connect. And as at the end of 2020, there was only 34,000 premises remaining to be made ready to connect. It is expected that by the end of this month, that will be down to 10,000 premises. In fact, today, 71 per cent of homes and businesses are on a 50 megabit per second or higher NBN plan. In the March quarter of this year, the number of house superfast services increased from 11,136 back in December to almost 490,000 at the end of March. 
Home ultra-fast connections in the same period grew from 9,900 to 83,000. This is a monumental effort by the NBN Co to complete their rollout and also complete and provide improved, better services. Um, having successfully rolled out the network, our government's priority is now to continue to leverage the NBN for the social and economic benefit of all Australians, especially those in regional areas. And that is why last September we announced $4.5 billion network investment to provide a 75 per cent of the fixed line network access to ultra-fast broadband, that is the one gigabit per second, by 2023. This investment is pivotal because through COVID <clears throat> we learnt how important connectivity and access to the World Wide Web is. In May last year, 46 per cent of Australians were working from home. That, that is 46 per cent of Australians regularly using video conferencing such as Zoom, Skype, Teams, Webex and many others uh, that rely on reliable and stable internet connectivity. The NBN saw an increase of up to 70 per cent in traffic volume on pre-COVID levels. COVID-19 <coughs> COVID resulted in a spike of demand in the NBN uh, and its uh, service partners handled this very effectively. At peak, there was up to 40,000 new connections in one day. In regional Australia, the NBN is investing more than $2 billion to strengthen the digital backbone through the implementation of on-the-ground support teams focusing on assisting to resolve community issues, helping to provide advice and representing regional customers and businesses and working with them on finding solutions for their needs. NBN Co has also established a 300 million co-investment fund and through this fund they will partner with governments at federal, state and local government levels to deliver access to higher speed broadband services to households and businesses in regional and rural Australia. The NBN is just, though, one of many networks available across Australia, and our government is committed to encouraging innovation, competition and choice. And that is why we developed the Regional Connectivity Program. Under this program, we've already seen 16 new co-funded projects rolling out that will help enhance connectivity for rural, regional and remote Australians. The, the locations of these uh, successful projects range from remote communities in East Arnhem Land in the Northern Territory to rural communities in Western Victoria and the Huon Valley in Tasmania. One fantastic example from this program was the Costa Group Regional Connectivity Program project that saw $570,000 of co-funding in conjunction with the Armidale Regional Council. So this Australian world-class leading fresh fruit and vegetable company, the Costa Group, uh, can improve the connectivity and their connection uh, on their regional sites. The Costa Group employs more than 700 hardworking Australians across two regional sites and they contribute about $31 million annually on wages and salaries into these local communities, one of which is in Guyra, in Armidale, uh, just outside Armidale in New South Wales. And I've been to see their facilities up there, the largest uh, glasshouse tomato production in our country, and what an efficient and exciting um, place it is. And this project will see these sites gain access to NBN technology and support the cost group to expand their business operations at their facilities, including research, administration and horticultural production. This will result in significant benefits to those local economies around Gyra and Falconer and through incre increased employment opportunities and regional output. I also want to hi highlight the Mosgiel Regional Connectivity Project in the Carathool Shire Council, which is um, just up the road from me uh, in the Western Riverina. 269,000 
has been committed to upgrade their local community antenna equipment and backhaul capacity at the existing Telstra 3G base. This project will give local families and travellers uh, Telstra 4G and internet coverage into the broader area along the Cobb Highway. And this is just an example where connectivity is not reliant on cables. Connectivity is a combination of fibre, of cables, of wireless and of mobile technologies, um, because we need the mix to keep our regional areas connected so that our farmers, our regional businesses and our travellers and our tourists going through the regions are connected, have access to the internet, can continue to do their business remotely um, and can continue to be productive uh, participants in our society. Our government is committed to continuing to invest in the NBN and projects that directly improve connectivity and quality to all businesses in rural and regional Australia to ensure every Australian has access to quality services, irrespective of where they are. And I uh, will continue to actively participate in the uh, ongoing work of the Joint NBN uh, Standing Committee as it finalises its inquiry into this um, into the NBN services uh, and look forward to being able to present the final report at a later date. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Davey. Are you seeking to continue your remarks? No. No. Okay. Thank you. So uh, the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Davey be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. We will now move to consideration of <coughs> documents. The documents listed on pages 10 and 11 of the notice paper, and if we start with the documents on page 10, Senator Urquhart. Thank you, uh, uh, Deputy President. I take note of documents 1, 4, 5, 7, 10 and 11 on page 10, and seek leave to continue my remarks. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Thank you, Senator Urquhart. Any other Senators wish to take note of any documents on page 10? No. Nope. I'll just move to the uh, documents listed at numbers 13 to 16 on page 11. Senator Seward. Thank you. Could I uh, take note of item 16, Medical Research Future Fund Act 2015, and seek leave to continue my remarks? Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. So we will now. Um, and just remind senators, uh, any document uh, which no senator rises to speak about or take note of will be discharged from the paper. So we will now look at um, committee reports, government responses and auditor general's reports listed on pages uh, 11 and 12, and we'll just do the ones on page 11. Oh, Senator <laughs> Urquhart, I saw Thank you standing there. Thank you, um, Deputy President. I take note of... Um, Committee report and government documents on page 11, numbers 1, 3 uh, and 4. At, sorry, and I seek leave to continue my remarks. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Senator Seward. Thank you. I uh, seek to take note of uh, item 5, Environment and Communications Reference Committee Freedom of the Press report and seek leave to continue my remarks. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. And then we'll do uh, the rest of those reports, 7 to 15. Senator Wish Wilson. Thanks, uh, thanks, Deputy President. Um, I seek leave to take note of document 7, Environment Communication Reference Committee, Impact of Seismic Testing on Fisheries in the Marine Environment. Um, thank you. I uh, thank the, the Senate and the uh, Environment Communications Committee for an excellent report, uh, and uh, I'm very, very proud. Uh, the Australian Greens uh, initiated this inquiry uh, and chaired, chaired this inquiry. Um, it ranged for uh, over two years, uh, partly because of COVID, but also because of the uh, substantial response the committee received around the country um, to community concerns uh, around the impacts of seismic testing. Um, and also the lack of understanding, the lack of research that had been done into the impacts of this activity. 
Um, I uh, wanted to see this inquiry happen because over many years a number of uh, stakeholders, including um, fishers and, and commercial fishing industry stakeholders, have continually raised their concerns and anecdotal evidence of the direct impact that seismic testing uh, was having on their fisheries. Now, seismic testing or seismic surveying relies on some of the loudest noises produced by human beings uh, to be blasted from a sonic gun, uh, potentially down a water column, uh, kilometres deep, uh, into the Earth's surface. So you can imagine how loud that these noises are uh, if they're actually going to be able to penetrate the Earth's surface and be used by fossil fuel companies to find the next fossil fuel bonanza. Uh, we even heard evidence that seismic blasts uh, off the coast of Victoria, or Great Australian Bight, in the right conditions can be heard as far as the Antarctic. These are very loud noises that are blasted continuously every 10 seconds, potentially for weeks or days on end. But here's, here's the catch. When I asked about the impacts of seismic surveys back in 2013, the Liberal government at the time told me there was no evidence that these seismic surveys did any damage to fisheries. And as it turns out, they were pretty much right. There was no evidence. But that's not because they didn't damage fisheries. It's because no one had done any research into the impacts of seismic testing on uh, commercial fish species. So, Following the loss of a $50 million scallop bed off northern Tasmania, um, finally some money was allocated for the University of Tasmania and Marine, uh, Institute of Marine Antarctic Studies and other universities to start looking at uh, these uh, impacts. Now, it was done in the lab initially, and of course the results were concerning. Um, and I'm very also, very, also very proud to say that, um, and Senator Urquhart was part of the committee, that I believe the pressure that was brought to bear by this committee did lead to the first ever studies of seismic testing on marine life in the environment, actually in situ uh, in the ocean, uh, including before and after studies. And the first, of its kind, the first study of its kind in terms of a before and after population study on a commercial fish species, in this case on the whiting species in the Otway Basin in this area that had been blasted for three months, uh, showed that 99 per cent of the population of whiting left the area. Now We haven't had the final report yet in terms of the long-term impacts of that, but I understand that many of those fish still haven't returned. And when I asked Nop Seema, the regulator, about this, they said, well, yeah, of course we understood that. Fish swim away from loud noise. But nowhere could I find that they'd ever assessed the impact of these tests on the commercial fishing sector or, more broadly, on the community, on the tourism operators, on the recreational fishers, on the first Australians or anyone. So uh, we've had a number of tests done now. They certainly suggest concern. And the committee produced an excellent report with 19 recommendations. 19 recommendations uh, that I believe will reform the sector, uh, including that uh, we need to see a lot more research and this research needs to be funded by the fossil fuel industry before any more of this activity occurs. These uncertainties are significant and while the regulatory framework, according to NOPSEMA, is there to manage these risks, there is no community confidence around this country that NOPSEMA manages these risks in the public interest. There's a very strong perception uh, that the regulator is managing these risks for the oil and gas industry. In other words, it's up to you to prove that damage is being done before NOPSEMA step in and stop an activity. It's not up for the oil and gas industries to actually do the research and prove they are doing no harm, especially considering initial studies suggest directly that this activity is harming marine life. Um, I'd just like to finish by saying, uh, whereas the committee report was excellent, um, it took three attempts to get this up. We know the government went to great lengths to avoid this inquiry. That evidence was given by some stakeholders. Um, the Greens don't believe the committee report went far enough. Indeed, it couldn't go far enough. We would like to see this activity banned from our oceans until the research has been done. Thank uh, you. Uh, <coughs> Sorry, uh, Deputy, Acting Deputy President, I seek leave to continue my remarks. Thank you, Senator Wish Wilson. Are there any other documents? Senator Macdonald. I rise to speak on the Select Committee on the Effectiveness of Australia's Government's Northern Australia Agenda Report, please. Thank you. Thank you. Now, this coalition government is filled with doers, especially in relation to Northern Australia. And it's just unfortunate I only have five minutes to highlight the huge strides being made in our great north. 
I think the most important element, though, is the structural changes that we are making to those things that have been holding Northern Australia back. Uh, two things in particular. One is the access to capital, and the second is the complete market failure for insurance. Now, on insurance, we have acted on this market failure in Northern Australia by announcing a reinsurance pool, a reinsurance pool for $10 billion. And Warren Ench, as the member for Leichhardt, has been working hard on this for the last 10 years. And now he uh, and George Christensen, uh, Philip Thompson and I have leaned in. And this terrific announcement has made an unimaginable difference to businesses that couldn't get insurance, to retirees and owner of strata title units who couldn't get insurance, and of course families where the cost of insurance has become so eye-wateringly crippling that they have been either uninsured or underinsured. Now, some put, it, put the estimates on the reductions of insurance premiums at 50 per cent, uh, which is a huge result on the back of this advocacy by our northern members. Again, this is in stark contrast to the Queensland's Labor government, which continues to charge northern Queensland residents predatory rates of stamp duty on their premiums, on their ever-increasing premiums, where they're now having a windfall gain estimated at around some $60 million a year being gouged out of the North Queensland economy. Water. We have been working hard on establishing uh, feasibility studies and preparing water projects. Uh, the Big Rocks Weir near Charters Towers, $30 million in federal funding, but we are still waiting for the state government to finalise their decision to get the project started. There will be 200 jobs in construction and ongoing agriculture on 5,000 hectares of high-value land. Uh, work has begun on Rookwood Weir near Rockhampton, thanks to $176 million in federal funding. Urana Dam work is progressing northwest of Mackay. This is a terrific project, and it will require continued support to get it to construction stage, along with dams at Huendon, the Richmond Irrigation Scheme and, of course, the Hells Gate Dam. We have also funded a study into a water project on the Cloncurry River. There is the Lakelands project on the Tablelands and, of course, the Mariba Dimbula Irrigation Project, just to name a few. Last week I was fortunate enough to be at Kidston for the sod turning on the more than $650 million of, in federal funding project. This is the largest loan to date from the Northern Australia Infrastructure Fund facility, and that made up $610 million. The coalition has restructured the NAIF's lending criteria to allow smaller projects that will create jobs and boost regional economics in the north. And in Queensland, the NAIF has supported projects with a total value of around $1 billion, supporting around 3,500 jobs and returning an estimated economic benefit of more than $2.3 billion. NAIF now has reached a contractual close of $989 million in transactions in Queensland alone, a critical point of economic enablement where design and construction activities commence and job creations starts. Some of those opposite like to throw stones at the NAIF, uh, some from their cushy inner-city offices, but this is not just an insult to the coalition. It is an insult to the hard-working NAIF staff who are based in the regions and making a real difference. And It is despite the numerous roadblocks to development put in place by the Queensland Labor government. There is so much more that has been done to increase the livability and uh, ability for people to live and work in North Queensland and Northern Australia. The increase of the Medicare rebate, regional connectivity, the investment of more than $6 million in the latest round of regional connectivity programs to improve internet access for people in Northern Australia. Uh, resources, the, the expansion of the geosciences program, major transport corridors of growth, our record in Northern Australia is plain to see and is a result of action from this Thank government. Thank you, Senator Macdonald. Senator, M Senator McMahon. <laughs> Thank Max. you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I, I rise to speak on the uh, effect of the Australian government's 
Northern Australia Agenda, the Select Committee Final Report. Um, Northern Australia is often regarded as having the greatest potential for development and prosperity in the country. Agriculture is one of the main economic activities in the North, and it does have enormous scope for expansion and development. Uh, the Northern Territory, in particular its agriculture sector, continues to prosper under the policies of a coalition government. But uh, agriculture in the Northern Territory, along with many other industries, is struggling at the moment um, and, in fact, is, is going backwards in some cases due to workforce issues, labour shortages. Um, farms are struggling to get workers, properties are, are struggling, um, there's no pickers for our seasonal mango and melon crops. And uh, this is something that's echoed across many industries in the Northern Territory. In fact, tourism and hospitality is booming and doing so well at the moment, uh, but they've got no staff. Some hotels in Darwin and Alice Springs are operating at 25 per cent capacity, not because they don't have the rooms, but simply because they don't have the staff um, to, to work in the industry and they are in fact turning away people. The Northern Territory is turning away um, the economy that they could have because there's just this massive labour shortage. Um, yesterday, the Agriculture Minister, the Honourable David Littleproud, confirmed that there would be an agriculture visa as part of the give and take of negotiations with the UK over the Free Trade Agreement. UK backpackers will no longer be required to fulfil uh, the requirement to work in the agriculture industry to extend their visa. Uh, now, while to some this may seem like a decision which will adversely impact the agriculture sector, the changes negotiated by Minister Littleproud on behalf of the sector he represents will also have a positive flow-on effects for other industries like tourism and hospitality. Uh, hospitality Northern Territory Chief Executive Alex Bruce believed the Territory's tourism and hospitality industry may not get earlier access to UK backpackers whose first preference was to work in the sector but were not keen on spending the 88 days required in agriculture first. Um, if that's the case, and time will tell, then this will be the double win on the back of changes the federal government made to lifting restriction on the hours international students can work to existing visa holders. Um, Madam Acting Deputy President, the new agricultural visa is a massive, massive win for the Territory in securing the labour force needed. We will no longer have the UK backpackers, but to be honest, not many of them worked in the Northern Territory anyway, uh, and they uh, were often unsuited to the harsh climatic conditions associated with picking melons and mangoes in the Northern Territory. So this new agriculture visa has been a long time in the planning. This has been a country Liberal Party policy for many years, and it is something that I have been working on in this place with various ministers uh, for the last two years that I have been here. Um, and this has been supported by my National Party colleagues who have also called for an agriculture visa. So um, this is going to be an incredible win for tourism, for agriculture and across many industries in the Northern Territory. UK backpackers will be freed up to go and work in, in cafes or, or bars or work that they're used to doing and that they're good at and uh, we can extend visa arrangements to our ASEAN neighbours to our north, that people that are used to working in the agriculture industry, people that already are used to picking mangoes, um, people that have worked on farms, have run farms, can now come to Northern Australia, Northern Territory, and they can fulfil this massive shortage that we have. Uh, last season, we saw $15 million worth of mangoes out of a $50 million industry rot on the ground simply because there weren't the workers to pick those mangoes. 
This will revolutionise our agriculture industries. Thank you, Senator McMahon. Senator Hughes. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. And I rise today to speak on the Women's Budget Statement 2021-2022. Uh, the women's. If you were, we're, we're looking at documents on page uh, 12. Oh, sorry, I jumped in at page 10. Sorry. Sorry. Sorry, I'm just about to uh, put the question in uh, that. Uh, both Senator McMahon and Senator Macdonald uh, uh, spoke to. So I put the question um, that the Senate take note uh, of the report uh, of the Select Committee Effectiveness of Australian Government Northern Australia Agenda. All those in favour say aye. Those against, the ayes have it. Senator Brockman. Uh, yeah, Senator Urquhart. I just wanted to seek some clarification. I wasn't sure whether um, Senator McMahon sought leave to continue her remarks on that. If uh, Senator <laughs> uh, Senator Macdonald, so, well, yes. Senator Urquhart will do that. Senator Urquhart, you wish to take uh, you seek leave to continue your remarks on, on that document? On yes, that document. on take Thank note you. and seek leave. I had a few other committee well, reports perhaps. before. If you if. Senator Hughes was going to seek leave to go with, back. Why, why don't we do that? Uh, deal with your. Is that what? Uh, two of uh, page eleven. Might I suggest that we finish, we finish committee reports and government responses and then by leave go back to documents? Senator Urquhart? Uh, yes, because I, I would Senator like Brockman, to— You're happy with that approach? Good. Yep. Thank you. I would like to take note on—I I presume we're up to page 12. We're on page 12, yes. yes. Um, so I, uh, Senator Wish Wilson kept, um, took note of and sought leave to continue his remarks on number seven. seven. I've now done that on document nine. Mm -hmm. um, and can I also take note of document 11, 12 and 15 on page 12 and seek leave to continue my remarks? And with your indulgence, Madam Deputy uh, President, um, I, when we were on page 11, I forgot to put number six on, so I'm wondering if I can take note and continue my remarks on that one. Thank you. Thank you. There are no other documents. Uh, Senator Brockman? So I, I, I wish to take note of um, document number two on page 11, if I haven't missed the opportunity. The, um, the, uh, no, you haven't. Please do so, Senator Brockman. OK, thank you very much. Sorry? I'm a very likeable person, Senator Patrick. Um, uh, I rise, uh, uh, Madam Acting Deputy Chair, to speak to the government response on the um, Senate Rural and Regional Affairs and Transport Legislation Committee report into the performance of the Australian Maritime Safety Authority. As those um, of you who have, have um, no perhaps noticed, I've, I've taken a, a strong interest in this issue from my time on that committee, even though I'm not on that um, committee anymore. Uh, I continue to be very interested in this issue. Uh, obviously, what spurned that inquiry was a particular tragic set of events in uh, Western Australia. Uh, it goes back a while now, but um, and I won't um, I won't go over those events again. Um, they, they've been well ventilated in this place and in other forums. However, those events uh, have been the trigger for a significant report um, by the Rural and Regional. Uh, Affairs and Transport Legislation Committee into AMSAR, and uh, 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 in May uh, of this year, the uh, Australian government tabled its response to those recommendations. And, and I just wanted to speak very briefly to that uh, response and to the process. Um, AMSAR, obviously, part of its role is to regulate um, commercial shipping. And part of the recommendations that came out of that report was a review of the regulations surrounding commercial shipping within Australian waters. Uh, so obviously this relates to both um, uh, 
uh, recreational vessels, such as um, the, the, um, the one in, in which the tragic events uh, uh, took place, and the regulation of the way uh, passengers are, are, um, are counted on and off vessels, and to make sure that every possible opportunity when uh, uh, an accident does occur is that everybody gets home. Um, so that's very important. But when I was recently down in uh, Esperance in uh, the far south of Western Australia uh, with my colleague Senator Small, we spoke to a, um, a, a small a fishing vessel operator who highlighted another potential issue. And I wish to, to raise it here because one of those recommendations was a thoroughgoing review of the, um, the law and the associated legislative instruments. Uh, and marine orders. And another issue came up, and it's that the certification of uh, safety management systems, particularly for our smaller commercial marine operators, uh, is proving um, both difficult and expensive, and often uh, extremely unclear in terms of the way the law uh, needs to be complied with. So, as it was described to us, uh, a small commercial shipping uh, vessel, in this case a shipping vessel, uh, has to produce a safety management system. Uh, often uh, the owners and operators of those vessels don't necessarily have the technical skills to produce such management systems, though they can obviously comply with them uh, and implement them. They don't necessarily have expertise in drafting them, so they often will outsource these work to consultants, experts in the field. Uh, the trouble is that that um, that is a costly exercise, and then those documents are submitted to AMPSAR, and then uh, there, as described to me, uh, is is no uh, no necessary rhyme, reason, or explanation as to which marine safety uh, safety management system uh, will be approved and which will be rejected. So, particularly smaller operators are put in an absolutely invidious position where they are submitting. A very expensive documentation to a regulator, and they're not getting clarity or feedback on uh, whether that uh, marine safety management system uh, is going to be acceptable to AMSAR or not in advance. And obviously, that makes it very difficult for them in terms of cost and time and keeping their boats on the water, which, as small businesses trying to operate in a very changeable and, um, and potentially costly market, is a very difficult environment in which to work. So I'll be communicating uh, this concern directly to the minister, obviously, but I think it is important as we go through this uh, thoroughgoing review of the legislation and legislative instruments uh, and marine orders in this area that we do need to consider all of these kinds of problems that currently uh, exist in the system and address as many of them as we possibly can. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Brockman. Uh, Senator Hughes, before I come to you, I just want to uh, deal with the Auditor General's reports. That no one's seeking leave to take note of that. Sen Senator Seward. So I am. Uh, see, I would like to talk to the Auditor General's report, which is number thirty-nine. Is that the one that you were referring yeah, to? On Chief? page twelve. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Um, I rise this afternoon to speak to um, the Auditor General's report. Sorry, Auditor General's report uh, number 39, which is the performance audit of the COVID-19 procurements and developments of the national medical stockpile um, the by the Department of Health, the Department of Industry, Science, Energy, and Resources. Um, this report was. Uh, released on the 27th of May and I think is a, a very important report because it highlights uh, the, some of the issues now around our national medical stockpile. And through the COVID committee, we tried to find out quite a lot of detail about this stockpile. And at the time, uh, we had some difficulty about finding out how it was operating and getting to uh, how effectively and how uh, accountable um, it was in terms of distrib distributing at very critical times the national medical stockpile. And the conclusion of this report found that the, the procurement processes for the COVID-19 national medical stockpile, or NMS, 
procurement was largely consistent with the proper use of management of public resources. And you think, oh, great, but then it goes on. Inconsistent due diligence checks of suppliers impacted on procurement effectiveness and record keeping could have been improved. It then goes on to make the point. In the absence of risk based planning and systems that su sufficiently considered the likely ways in which the national medical stockpile in NMS would be needed during a pandemic. Health adapted its processes during COVID-19 emergency during the COVID-19 emergency to deploy the NMS supplies. And then it says large quantities of PPE were deployed to eligible recipients. Due to a lack of performance measures, targets and data, the effectiveness of COVID-19 of the COVID-19 MNS deployment cannot be established. One of the most critical elements and that we were asking constantly about was the deployment of PPE. And for a start, uh, during the pandemic, I was on the phone a lot asking about what's happening with PPE for aged care, in particular into remote communities, because they were having trouble accessing in a timely manner PPE. And heaven forbid, should there have been an outbreak in the PPE, because what they are first told to do is, if they see signs of an outbreak, if COVID got in, well then ring, and then we'll get you some PPE into remote areas. Come on, that was ridiculous. Um, I will acknowledge that further down the track, the PPE through the National Medical Stockpile became much more available, but you would have thought straight away that you'd get that PPE out into remote communities because we all knew what would happen in remote communities if COVID got in, because they, some of those remote communities and aged care remote communities are some of the most vulnerable people in Australia. The report goes through um, quite a lot of detail, but also found record keeping for procurement was for procurements was partially fit for purpose, which impeded review and transparency. Public reporting of the procurement uh, complied with requirements. Um, in many of our opinion, they, it didn't uh, comply uh, with the level of information that was not that should have been known to the community to see how quickly and effectively um, these uh, PPE, in particular, were being, deployment, being um, deployed. Uh, that's about procurement. Then it talks about deployments, and it, and it goes on to say health deployment planning was partially effective. And it, go, and it talks about risks to effective deployment in a pandemic of any magnitude were not sufficiently considered in the years preceding the COVID-19 response. Pre-pandemic planning was based on a narrow definition of stockpile aims and eligibility. Because this did not align with the way in which the MNS was used during the pandemic, operational plans and systems were changed and additional plans were developed during the course of the pandemic. Hopefully, we have now learned from this to ensure that we are always ready for a pandemic. It goes on. Health deployment of MNS supplies to various health provider groups during the pandemic was consistent in principle with its responsibilities to these groups under national health emergency agreements. In practice, health limited eligibility to prioritise subgroups, disaggregated and unanalyzed data about eligibility outcomes impedes transparency about these eligibility decisions. In other words, we just Thank you, don't Senator know. Senator Seawood. Now, Senator Hughes, you seek leave. Thank you. Leave is granted. Uh, Senator Hughes. Madam Acting Deputy President, I seek leave to return to page 10 and speak to the Women's Budget Statement 2021-22. Leave is granted. Thank you. The Women's Budget Statement was a $3.4 billion package that's focused on supporting all Australian women. It's investing in facilitating respect and dignity, choice, equality of opportunity and justice to safeguard women's safety, their economic security and status. The Morrison government is committed to taking action and enhancing, in particular, women's economic security. We're investing to remove barriers and improve choices and chances for all Australian women. And this is one of the pillars that we in the Liberal Party believe very, very strongly in, that this is not about equality of outcome, it's about equality of opportunity and making sure that that playing field 
is as level and as even for women in Australia to be able to participate. So in order to do that, the Morrison government is investing even more money into childcare, and this will help remove any disincentives for women to take on extra days of work. We know that we hear from families regularly that women return to work part-time, but they take up limited days when they return to the workforce because the costs of childcare are prohibitive or, in fact, a deterrent for taking up more days. Mind you, there are some mums that almost think it's worth paying for just to get that day back in the office with some adult conversation and away from Bluey on the television. But we're also helping single parents to achieve that great Australian dream of owning your own home, and this is through the Family Home Guarantee. Now, owning your own home for a woman particularly a single woman, one who's been through divorce or found themselves later in life without stable accommodation. Being able to own your own home is a form of security that is incredibly important, particularly when we consider some of the greatest levels of homelessness are now occurring in the single women over 50 age group. So we want to make sure, by boosting women's opportunity to enter the housing market, even if they have been forced previously to leave it, to be able to re-enter that housing market to provide them with some security and stability, particularly of accommodation, as they move into their later years. But when we come back to women at the start of their career, the women and girls that are still studying, we are looking to develop and are continuing to develop opportunities for women to access the jobs of the future. We know that the workplace is going to look different in the next five to ten years. I know looking at Senator, Rex, uh, Senator Patrick over here. God, I did a lot of Senator Holly style over there. Senator Patrick, or, or should I say hashtag Senator Single, is that right? Senator Single over there, Senator Patrick. <laughs> I don't know, we might work with some of these single women over here. <laughs> Sorry, it is Thursday afternoon, Senator Patrick. <laughs> But I'm sure Senator Patrick could confirm that working on those Oberon submarines looks very different to being on the Collins class as workplaces continue to evolve and the technology continues to change. We are looking to develop opportunities for women to ensure that they have equal access and, uh, and a real interest that's able to be cultivated into STEM and making sure that that interest starts in school and carries on beyond that. These measures are, of course, part of the broader women's economic security package, and this will ensure that we enhance women's workforce participation, which won't only benefit women. It's not just the mums that go back to work that benefit from this uh, increased ability to participate in the workforce. It's actually the entire Australian economy that benefits all families, Every single uh, person in Australia benefits with more Australians in the workforce, and that's why we are determined to see the increase in women's workforce participation by 5 per cent increase in real terms of GDP by $20 billion over the next five years. So this landmark investment of $1.9 billion in women's economic security will improve choice and opportunity for Australian women who are key to the Morrison government's commitment to create more jobs and continue our economic recovery from COVID-19. Thank you, Senator Hughes. Uh, are there, we now move to ministerial statements. Are there any ministerial statements? No. Uh, the Senate will now proceed to the consideration of general business. Clark. General business debate on notice of motion number 1144 in the name of Senator Patrick on Timor Lest. Senator Patrick. Uh, I move the motion. And look, I'm very pleased that uh, the Attorney General has joined us in, in the chamber to listen to this debate. It is uh, uh, a very important discussion that we're going to have. Uh, I'm going to talk about betrayal betrayal of a country and then betrayal of, of whistleblowers. Now, 
Uh, Australia's relationship with Timor-Leste has been a long history of betrayal on our side of the ledger. In 1942, the Timorese people paid a terrible price for supporting Australian commandos fighting the Japanese in occupied Timor. Yet at the end of the war, Australia was content to see the Portuguese military regime resume control of Timor, which was left as an impoverished colonial backwater. In the 1970s, Prime Minister Whitlam gave a nod and a wink to President Suharto's plans to invade East Timor. He put good relationships with Jakarta ahead of international law and basic decency. Prime Minister Fraser's government then watched the Indonesians invade and turned a blind eye to reports of the most terrible massacres and atrocities. The governments of, uh, of Prime Minister Whitlam and um, uh, Hawke and Keating then embraced Suharto uh, and scrabbled to negotiate a deal with Indonesia to get the lion's share of, an oil, of oil and gas wealth in the Timor Sea. And we can all remember uh, Foreign Minister Gareth Evans clinking champagne glasses with the Foreign Minister uh, Ali Alatas uh, whilst flying in a VIP jet high above the Timor Sea. <coughs> there are we then, we then go to the negotiations that took place after the independence of, of, uh, of, uh, uh, of East Timor. And we must remember that John Howard was very reluctant, very reluctant to assist initially in, the, uh, uh, in supporting uh, the Timorese uh, in their independence call, uh, and indeed only after international pressure uh, and public pressure did we send in Australian troops. So the East Timorese pe people triumphed. So did uh, uh, Australian activists such as uh, uh, Sister Susan Con uh, Connolly, who have so long championed for the cause of East Timor. And I also recall I was up in Timor uh, uh, for the uh, 20th anniversary, and uh, you know, pe uh, 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 people um, were honoured uh, as well. Uh, Michelle O'Neill from the ACTU for a lot of work that she'd done in, in this area. So lots and lots of Australians got involved. And of course, then what happened was uh, we then uh, entered into negotiations over the, the, the sea boundary between uh, Timor Leste and Australia. And we, importantly, and we need to understand this, we entered into good faith negotiations as was required by international law. But what did we do? We sent ASIS officers into the cabinet disguised as aid workers into the cabinet rooms of the Timor, of the, of the, uh, Timor government and bugged the negotiating team. Now, people might think that I'm revealing some sort of secret here, but I'm not. We have Bernard Kaliri and Witness Kay uh, appearing uh, in, in the courts here in the ACT not because there was some fictitious operation, but because there was a real operation. And anyone who wants to take the time and the trouble to go to look at uh, the, the uh, uh, ICJ's website and have a look at Timor Leste's memorial in relation to uh, its uh, proceedings against Australia, when Australia, uh, when the Australian government broke into the lawyers of, 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 uh, of Timor Leste, uh, raided. Uh, uh, their, their offices and took uh, all of their legal documents, which ultimately they had to return, with The Hague ordering an unusual order that Australia was not to spy on, on East Timor. So we, let's not pretend this didn't happen. It was unconscionable. It was not the way Australians expect uh, uh, us to treat our nearest neighbour, almost nearest neighbour, a neighbour that helped us throughout uh, World War II, a neighbour that is actually quite an important neighbour to us, noting its uh, ge geographical location. We dudded them. That's what we set out to do. We dudded them. And then when someone called them out, when someone called them out, what did we do? We went after them. Now, uh, I understand that uh, Witness K may have today uh, 
pleaded guilty to charges in the ACT court. Um, uh, that's not been confirmed. We, we saw that at question time. But in the event uh, that that is what has happened or will happen, we need to understand that Witness K uh, he, he didn't go to the media. He went to the Inspector General of Intelligence and Security and made a complaint, raised the issue through the appropriate authorities, was then authorised to go and talk to a lawyer that was approved by IGES to deal with uh, matter, these sorts of matters, went to talk to Mr Bernard Collieri, did everything properly. He called out misconduct and then, when he did it properly, he ends up in the ACT courts. He's been under extreme pressure. We know that in 2013 the Australian government took his passport off him so that he couldn't, tra so that he couldn't travel. This is a gentleman that, uh, that had served his country. This is a gentleman that was uh, of the highest calibre, never presented a problem in terms of anything that he'd done, uh, and he, was, he had his passport taken off, from, off him. Of course, he's been fighting that in the AAT to try and get it back. Those proceedings have been interrupted by the charges that were then laid against, uh, against uh, uh, Witness K. The charges, of course, originally sat, or the, the, the prospect of a charge originally sat with Attorney General Senator George Brandis, who refused to deal with it. He, he knew uh, that uh, this was not proper. So it sat on his desk until there was a change of Attorney General to Christian Porter, who then authorised the prosecution in a poor lack of lack of judgment. These are not the only judgments that we call into question with, uh, with the, with the uh, Attorney General uh, Christian Porter in that uh, we, you know, he approved these prosecutions. He's approved the prosecutions of David McBride. He's approved the prosecution of, uh, of, uh, of Richard Boyle. All bad calls. This is the Attorney General who censored an Auditor General's report refused to, to, to let the parliament see what the conclusions of the Auditor General's report on the basis of national security, I then have to go to the AAT to get a ruling that says, you know what, it's not sensitive, such that it has now been made available to the parliament. Poor judgment, poor judgment, poor judgment. And we have two whistleblowers uh, suffering for this, both Witness K and, uh, and Kaliri. And I've asked, um, and I follow up, and I'll give credit to Senator Carr at Estimates for pursuing this, what is the public interest in, the, in this prosecution? These are gentlemen that called out misconduct, an abhorrent breach of good faith to the country of East Timor. I've been to Timor. I've sat and talked with uh, the Timorese. I've, I've had a meeting with the chief of staff of the president. All who consider Witness K and Bernard Kaliri heroes, and they are disgusted in Australia's prosecution of their two heroes. Disgusted to the point that they're minded to cooperate with people that or countries that we might consider to be. Uh, not in our interest to, for them to cooperate with. When I went to uh, Timor-Leste, I went to the Southern Plateau, I could see, I think it's 32 kilometres of dual carriageway freeway that had been built by the Chinese. I saw the power lines that had been built by the Chinese. I've seen the ports that are being built by the Chinese. Because it turns out the Chinese are a much better friend to East Timor than Australia is. As anyone who looks through the lens of this prosecution would reasonably determine. Now, Senator Carr asked the question of the, uh, of the CDPP, what is the public interest in prosecuting these two gentlemen? I asked, uh, as a supplementary, whether or not our relationship with East Timor had been considered in that public in interest uh, determination. 
And the answer is it, it hadn't been. So we haven't considered properly, let's set aside the fact that these two people are heroes, we haven't considered what this is doing to uh, 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 our relationship with East Timor, with Timor-Leste. It is not in the public interest to proceed with this prosecution. It hasn't properly been considered. And uh, as I've suggested, uh, in, or as I call for in my motion, I think the Attorney General needs to exercise her powers under Section 71 of the Judiciary Act to decline to continue this prosecution. Now, of course, the answer from the Attorney General is, well, this power has never been used before. That's not a reason to uh, not use it properly. It's put in the Act. It's put in the Act because the Parliament uh, expects the Attorney General to have prosecutional uh, 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 responsibility to the Parliament. We give the Attorney General these powers, and they, you know, there are times when the Attorney General should exercise these powers. Not simply say, "Well, I haven't. Uh, this never been used before, so I'm too afraid to use them." Sure, it might be the fact that it, uh, it's, it calls for an exceptional set of circumstances. In the case of uh, Richard Boyle, we even got Senator Scar asking uh, pertinent questions of the CDPP, uh, asking whether this was an exceptional case and getting the answer, yes, it is. And yet the Attorney General is still not willing to, uh, to exercise those powers. We need to understand this is not in the public interest. And there's a requirement, to, if you are going to prosecute someone, to establish that there is public interest in doing so. And yet when Senator Carr has asked a question, when I asked a question in, in question time today, no one can tell the public what that interest is. We've got a public interest that's so secret the public can't even know about it. And that is a problem. So this government should clearly state what the public interest is in the case of Witness K and Kaliri, and also in the case of David McBride and, and uh, Richard Boyle. They should clearly state that. And I'm calling on the Attorney General to exercise her power uh, to decline to continue this prosecution because it serves no public good. Thank you, Senator Patrick. Senator Fawcett. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Uh, I to rise to speak to this motion, and uh, I wish to uh, just pick up on a couple of points that Senator Patrick raised there. He did talk about the IGIS and he talked about the processes that are in place. Uh, so I'd like to touch on a couple of those places, then move on to a little bit about our relationship with East Timor and uh, the very strong basis Australia has uh, in that relationship. The issues around disclosure um, were well explored in the report by the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security, the impacts of national security legislation on freedom of the media. Uh, whilst it is not directly this case, it goes to many of the similar issues. And uh, I would encourage anyone who has an interest uh, in these issues and why there are some matters that are not placed into the public domain uh, to read that report and understand uh, many of the considerations which executive government uh, of whether it's from the Labor Party or from the coalition, uh, has in deciding what uh, is or should be made public. So that's one fact. There is another fact that governments, and this is recognised by uh, all governments around the world, it's even recognised by many of the civil society players who came and gave evidence, uh, including in that media freedoms by members of the media, that there is information which a government should hold secret, and there's the protective um, framework uh, around protecting information that gives information certain levels of classification. Now, if that is going to have effect, what that means is that uh, people who are officials of the Commonwealth have a higher duty than people in perhaps the media or the general public uh, to protect that information which they are given privileged access to. Because if they don't fulfil that obligation of protecting that information, then the framework, the basis upon which government can hold information classified 
and importantly the trust of allies who are prepared to cooperate with Australia on the basis of the fact we have a system to protect information that is sensitive and classified and may go to national interest uh, issues. Uh, if that system is not upheld and protected, then a, our own government and our own national interest is compromised, but so too is our relationship and the trust from other partners who we work with. And certainly as a member of the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Intelligence and Security and also as someone who served in defence for over 22 years as a full-time officer, I recognise the incredible importance of having trusted relationships with allies. So all of that goes to having frameworks which are effective and have integrity because they are maintained. We recognise, though, as a government, as a country, because it's not just this government, as a country, we recognise that there are times when either individuals or collectively things happen which the Australian public would think are not appropriate. And so there is a method, there is a way, and Senator Patrick mentioned this, that through the Inspector General of Intelligence and Security, people who work within our intelligence agencies have the option, uh, under the Public Interest Disclosure Scheme, to highlight to an independent authority who has the ability to investigate uh, actions that they believe are disclosable incidents. And Section 29 uh, of the PID Act, the Public Interest Disclosure Act, gives a long list, which I won't run through here, but gives a long list of things that are disclosable. It then talks about things that are not disclosable uh, in terms of uh, just because somebody disagrees with a policy or an action, etc., of government. And again, the list is there and laid out. Uh, that people can refer to. But the important part that I think uh, needs to be highlighted here is that once an eligible person makes a disclosure to a proper authority, they are provided with legal protection from reprisals that result from that disclosure. So there is a process, if the process is followed and if everything is in accordance with the requirements of the legislation as to what can be disclosed and why, then they are provided with legal protection. So without commenting on the court case that is occurring at the moment, I just want to highlight the fact that um, action has been taken. The legislation is designed so that someone who has a valid concern and has abided by the process will be provided with protection. Um, and I will leave my comments there on that matter because I think it's important that the Australian public have confidence that people who work within our agencies, whether Defence, whether ASIO, ASIS, Australian Signals Directorate, you know, a range of bodies who work on behalf of the Australian population dealing in sensitive issues, they are charged with an obligation to protect. There are criminal penalties that they are liable to if they make unauthorised disclosures, but we do provide avenues, whether through the Ombudsman for some or through the IGES, the, in, the uh, Independent Inspector General of Intelligence and Security uh, for people in relevant agencies, there are avenues whereby they can make those disclosures. And if they make those disclosures and they have not done anything else, then they are protected uh, legally. In terms of East Timor, I think it is appropriate uh, that we highlight the fact that Australia has a deep partnership with East Timor uh, at a range of levels, both person to person as well as government levels. And uh, I think the um, visit by Prime Minister Morrison and Foreign Minister Payne in August of 2019, uh, celebrating the 20th anniversary of the referendum that led to their independence, and also to bring in the Maritime Boundaries Treaty into force, did actually open a new chapter in Australia's relationship with Timor-Leste. There is a high level of engagement. Uh, there is a focus of cooperation, including ongoing humanitarian support, uh, whether that's in things like the floods that were there in April or in supporting Timor-Leste with uh, the response to COVID-19. Uh, Australia continues to fund a, a range of humanitarian and other support as well as providing goods in the humanitarian effort in relief supplies, including medical things such as oxygen during the COVID uh, crisis, uh, as well as fresh water, 
evacuation centres uh, and facilitating uh, and funding access by NCO NGOs to assist those who are affected, people like the World Food Programme. Uh, so there are a range of uh, measures that Australia is taking in the current environment, uh, but has taken, and particularly uh, renegotiating the bilateral boundary, uh, which I think uh, has been an important reset in that relationship with Timor-Leste. And Timor-Leste ministers and officials have publicly acknowledged and thanked Australia uh, for our support, uh, and Timor-Leste appreciation has been conveyed to the Minister for Foreign Affairs uh, by their Minister for Foreign Affairs, uh, as well as the Prime Minister expressing his thanks to our Prime Minister for that ongoing support. Uh, they recognise that the prosecutions here are a matter for Australia under our law, um, but those prosecutions have not prevented the substantial improvement in the bilateral re relations which have taken place in recent years. Thank you, Senator Fawcett. Senator Carr. Well, thank you very much, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. Uh, this uh, question uh, today arise, uh, gives rise to some serious conversations about what we mean by our international reputation and what we mean by our concern when we provide advice to the world about our moral standards when it comes to human rights and our attitudes when it comes to the rules-based order. We're only too happy and very quick off the mark to offer advice to authoritarian regimes about our moral superiority in international relations. And therefore, uh, if we are to do that, then I think that we have to ensure that in our own activity, that is Australia's activity, the matters that uh, have just been referred to, uh, Senator Fawcett has mentioned in terms of questions of trust, uh, matters about uh, questions of uh, integrity, uh, questions that go to the deep partnerships with our uh, allies. Um, and the questions that we have to actually demonstrate in practice ourselves. And it strikes me that the circumstances that have arisen in regard to the Witness K and uh, the prosecution of Witness K's lawyer, Bernard Collery, do raise serious doubts about just what levels of legal protection are in fact available to officers that drew, do, do draw attention to what they believe to be the inadequacies of our diplomacy and our international behaviour in terms of those benchmarks. See, the allegations that ASIS has bugged the East Timor government cabinet room in 2004 have in fact outraged many Australians, and so they should. And so is the prosecution of two men who will reveal what I think, if true, is nothing short of shameful conduct. Now, these prosecutions have been largely conducted in secret. Prosecutions of people who claim to be whistleblowers, people who thought they had the, the protections of the legal mechanisms that uh, Senator Forster just referred to, and allegations of serious misconduct which involve criminal behaviour, not just by Australian government agencies, but possibly by senior ministers in a Howard government as well. Now, that, the possibility of that involvement in ministers might explain why the Morrison government has insisted on the cloak of secrecy around these very prosecutions. And even though the events that Witness K and Mr Collery have alleged to have found occurred, what, 17 years ago, we don't know why the former Attorney General, Christian Porter, has actually authorised the prosecutions. And I want to emphasise that, authorised the prosecutions. What we do know is that his predecessor, George Brandis, on several occasions declined to do so. Nor do we know why it is, and it's publicly explained, 
why Mr Porter has instructed his lawyers to intervene in the pre-trial proceedings against Mr Collery, and I repeat, on several occasions, to seek even greater secrecy in the way in which the trial was conducted. Mr Porter had always refused to explain what it was, what was in the public interest to prosecute these men who, had in, in their mind, had revealed shameful conduct by the Australian government. Mr Porter's successor, Senator Cash, who's here today, hasn't provided any explanation either. She, in fact, said in the question time, as I understood her, that this was a matter of independent action by the DPP. This has at all times been a highly political trial, highly political, and it's all times involved the actions of the Attorney General. I just, we don't know why the Commonwealth has gone to such extraordinary lengths and such incredible expense to conduct these secret prosecutions. Now, the letter to myself from the Attorney General's Department, we now find out it's what, in excess of $4 million. $4 million. And this is for a prosecution for two men whose real offence is to reveal some very, very dark aspects of Australian diplomacy. Now, the claim that the bugging of a friendly government by Australia in one of the what, is what, poorest neighbours is a very, very serious claim. I mean, the Howard government was very proud to be able to make finally the assertion that it helped that country obtain its independence. Australia played a positive role, a very positive role, particularly sending an international peacekeeping force there in September 1999. We'd like to think that Australia and East Timor did have a special relationship. The Howard government was very keen to encourage us all to say so. But what is extraordinary that that special relationship did not preclude spying on that country's cabinet. And I find that a remarkable, given what we are at stake was international commercial negotiations about resource allocation. Negotiations about how to cover up, how to, to carve up an extraordinarily lucrative oil and gas resource in the, East, in the Timor Sea. It would appear that the Howard government wanted to ensure that the newly independent, impoverished nation, Timor-Leste, received a small a share of that resource as was possible. Now, we know that an equitable division of the Greater Sunrise oil and gas field only happened after East Timor commenced proceedings in the International Court of Justice and the Permanent Court of Arbitration. And a revised treaty on the oil and gas fields was signed in 2018. 2018. That's when Australia did behave honourably. Now, it's the shameful behaviour revealed by Witness K and later shared with the media by, it would seem, by Mr Collery, has led the former president of East Timor to describe Witness K and Mr Collery as heroes, I think has been pointed out. The people of East Timor, Mr Ramos Horta said, owe a massive debt to Witness K. In this country, however, the government has chosen to prosecute these men. Now, the activity of these men did not involve a matter of national security. East Timor is hardly a threat to Australia. What these men alleged to occur was not espionage directed at a hostile nation. 
It was an attempt to obtain an unfair advantage in a commercial negotiation. Now, nothing in this gives credit to Australia. And I can't see how any of it, in regard to the secret prosecution of Witness K and Bernard Collery, gives credit to Australia either. Now, it's been said, oh, well, it's not really secret. It's just that portions of the proceedings are not in public. That's the sort of line that we get from the AG's department. That's the sort of classic Sir Humphrey's answer. The fact is the portions of the proceeding that the Australian public would wish to know have been closed. In plain English, the proceedings have been largely kept in secret. And we don't know why they're in secret. It means that an integral part of the justice is not being done in a way that can be seen to be done. Now, I've often said I'm no lawyer, but what I do understand is this. Our judicial system distinguishes, is distinguished from many others in so far as it is open and it is clearly different from the way in which authoritarian regimes operate. All governments in Australia have been clearly trying to distinguish themselves as the bearers of democracy. How can we do that if we behave in this manner? How can we offer ourselves as a moral authority on a rules-based model when we invade people's civil liberties, invading lawyers' offices the way we have, the way in which we treat people in these types of arrangements? Now, of course, it's understood that Witness K may well be pleading guilty to part of these proceedings, but in regard to other matters, Mr Collery has taken the matter up through the various parts of the court. Mr Collery is contesting the charges laid against him and, in fact, needs access to the information so the courts can actually proceed to assess his claim. He's prevented from doing that. I remind senators that Mr Collery is uh, 76 years of age. He has a distinguished legal career. He's a former deputy chief minister and AG, if I got it right, of the Australian Capital Territory. Now he's this is the man that we're prosecuting. I just can't see what is in the public interest but more importantly, what is in the national interest to prosecute this man in this way? And the officers before the Senate Estimates Committee could not explain that to us either. The zeal with which the government is pursuing me is evident from the proceedings in the Australian Capital Territories Court of Appeal. Lawyers acting for Mr Collery challenged the order made last year in the ACT Supreme Court to accept an application by the then Attorney General Mr Porter, to invoke the National Security Information Act. That act, of course, prevents access to the information. The act requires courts to give greatest weight to the AG's views on security implications of a case. And it just highlights the problem here. The act is being used to undermine transparency and open justice in Australian courts. We have no indication of what the national security information might be, but what we do, and we don't have any indication as to what the national interest is being served by this prosecution. The longer the Australian public is kept in the dark about the, this matter, the more questions are being raised here and internationally about the role of the Howard government and the ministers in the events of 1974. Those questions will not go away no matter how much effort is put into the suppression of information concerning Witness K and Mr Collery. The proceedings that we have before us in the courts in the Australian Capital Territory, 
are highlighting a very dangerous shift towards greater and greater emphasis on security over accountability in the government of this country. We've seen a rapid escalation in the misuse, the misuse of the legal system to suppress people's rights. And I can only suggest this is a stark reminder of how far this government will go to destroy the credibility of whistleblowers and undermine open justice. This whole matter ought to be reviewed by the new Attorney-General and should we go back to the position that uh, Senator Brandis had presented when he was at the, in that post. Thank you, Senator Carr. Senator Wish Wilson. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Many Australians were shocked this week that the Prime Minister would step away from a G7 meeting, a meeting ostensibly about uh, tackling the greatest challenge of our time, climate change, about nations decarbonising, a green-led recovery from COVID, that he would step away from this meeting and do a personal address to the APIA, the Australian Petroleum Production and Exploration Association in Perth, where over 2,000 uh, companies in the fossil fuel sector were meeting, and address this uh, conference personally from London and issue 80,000 square kilometres of uh, new ocean acreage for these companies to carve up and profit from and put our oceans at risk. And if Australians are shocked at the influence of the oil and gas industry on this government, then they will be especially shocked and outraged at the story and the matter that we are debating in the Senate today that relates to uh, Bernard Caleri, an Australian lawyer, who I'll talk about in a minute, and a whistleblower, Witness K. Unfortunately, we don't know his name. In fact, we know very little about this courageous man, except that he stepped forward with moral conviction and blew the whistle on something he thought was wrong and in the public interest. I want to read from an article uh, that anyone can access online. It's redflag.org. It's Gangsters for Capitalism, Downer Woodside and Witness K. In 2004, then Foreign Minister Alexander Downer presided over an Australian secret intelligence service, ASIS, operation to install listening devices in the offices of the government of the newly independent and desperately poor nation of East Timor. The operation, which was carried out under the cover of an aid project aimed to give Australia an advantage in negotiations over a new maritime border between the two countries. Among the main stakeholders in these negotiations was Australian oil and gas giant Woodside Petroleum. Woodside leads a consortium of companies with rights to exploit enormous reserves in the Greater Sunrise oil and gas fields, which lie in the Timor Sea around 150 kilometres from East Timor and 450 kilometres from Darwin. Now, Senator Patrick's already gone into some of the, some of the history about uh, East Timor and Australia and uh, the toing and froing between the two nations, but essentially East Timor, uh, as they would as a poor country, uh, wanted to lay claim to these fields. Now, it turns out that in uh, negotiations, according to uh, this, this article, Australia played hardball. At one point in the negotiations, Alexander Downer reportedly shouted across the table, your claims go to almost Alice Springs. You can demand that forever, for all I care. We are very tough. Let me give you a tutorial in politics. Not a chance. Perhaps part of the reason why Downer could be so tough was that, thanks to ASIS and the bugging of the East Timor cabinet, he knew exactly what the Timorese negotiation strategy would be. Now, I differ slightly from Senator Carr. I know many Australians are outraged when they hear that we would bug the, uh, the cabinet of a poor nation to get a national advantage. But I don't know, uh, sadly, in this day and age, whether Australians would actually be that surprised or outraged that we might do that to a foreign country in our national interest. But what I can absolutely assure you they would be deeply shocked and surprised by was if they knew that these negotiations were actually to get a commercial interest, to favour a corporation and a series of corporations uh, and 
a large fossil fuel project. It hasn't been pointed out yet in debate today that Witness K, an intelligence uh, analyst, came forward to blow the whistle on this when, in 2008, four years after Alexander Downer authorised this bugging of the Team Murray's cabinet, he left the government and got a job at Woodside Petroleum. Now, the revolving door between politicians and Woodside Petroleum is on the public record, and it is a significant cause for concern. Woodside are one of the biggest donors in this place—$1.4 million to the coalition and to Labor—$1.4 million. But when Witness K, this man who had served our country, saw that the man that had presided over this had personally benefited from his role as a senior minister in bugging the East Timorese cabinet and aided and abetted the highway robbery that occurred on behalf of Woodside Petroleum and other fossil fuel interests, he blew the whistle. You know why, Acting Deputy President? Probably because he thought it was corrupt. Probably because he thought it was corrupt. We may never know exactly what he thinks because these trials are going to be held in secret. But this revolving door between senior ministers and profit-seeking corporations, who they have just exerted influence over, is seen by many in the community as corruption, if not personal corruption, institutional corruption, a corruption of the institutions of our democracy. And that is an important distinction that I would like to make, and another reason why we continually push for an independent commission against corruption. So it's also been outlined in the debate today that uh, Witness K, this brave whistleblower, sought legal advice and went through the correct channels to do so. And it turns out that his lawyer, Bernard Clary, has now also been dragged into this. He's been charged by the Australian government, by the Attorney General, and faces up to 10 years imprisonment for representing a client. For representing a client. And I wanted to take the opportunity today to say some words about Bernard Caleri. Because to many people, they've read about his name in the paper, they've read about Witness K, but they probably don't know much about the man, Bernard Caleri. And as I highlighted, we'll probably never know much about Witness K. Three words that describe Bernard Caleri courageous, honourable, and compassionate. In fact, the lengths of this man's compassion are endless, and to many people he is a true hero. Let me tell you why. <coughs> Over the years, as a lawyer, countless pro bono human rights cases, advising the East Timor resistance for over 30 years, representing plaintiffs in the Threadbow landslide, Canberra bushfires and Royal Canberra hospital implosion. Founded the Immigration Reform Group, represented West Papuan refugees and Vietnamese boat people over many decades. Drafted the Discrimination Act as Attorney General of the Australian Capital Territory. Honorary Solicitor for Aboriginal Health Services, the Australian Bravery Association and the National Brain Injury Foundation. And the list goes on and on. Awarded the 2020 UK Government Blueprint for Free Speech Prize awarded to whistleblowers in recognition of bravery, integrity and commitment to the public interest. Awarded the 2018 Australian Lawyers Alliance Civil Justice Award. Awarded to an individual who has made a significant contribution to the pursuit of civil liberties in Australia. What justice is being served in this prosecution? What is it about this man that sounds like he is a criminal? He is not. He is not a criminal, yet this government is treating him and Witness K like a criminal. And it goes without saying that the acts they exposed certainly raise very serious questions, including at the senior levels of the Howard government about criminality. Now, while the rest of the country, even across the world, celebrates this man's courage, this man's bravery, integrity and commitment, the Australian government is continuing to prosecute him and drag out this prosecution and make his life a misery. This prosecution is one of the gravest acts of this government. 
and one of the greatest threats to freedom of expression in this country right now. The world is on the side of Bernard Collary, and the Australian government is on notice. And this debate today is just one of many things that will be happening in relation to this. It's on notice that those who speak up for justice, for the rule of law in this country, will not be silenced. Now, I will finish up because I understand there are other speakers, but I would like to acknowledge uh, Chloe Preston, uh, who has worked in my office uh, as a staff and Rex's office and Senator Xenophon's office. Chloe Preston was a young barrister who was working for Bernard Collary uh, when his office was raided, first raided by the federal police in relation to these charges. And Chloe had to represent uh, Bernard in court while he was overseas. And if someone had only been the job for a few weeks, of course she was well and truly thrown in at the deep end. But she uh, has maintained an abiding interest and friendship with uh, Bernard Collary and, and Senator Patrick uh, and a number of people over the years. And uh, she, she feels very deeply about this, this issue. And I've reflected her words in the Senate today. And I'm very proud to have read them on Hansard on her behalf and on behalf of all those Australians who deeply care about this issue. Thank you, Senator Wish Wilson. Senator Watt. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Um, unfortunately, due to lack of time, I won't be able to uh, say quite as much as I had hoped on this. And I know Senator Green was hoping to make a contribution as well, um, which time uh, will probably prevent as well. But I'll say as much as I can uh, to put a few more things down on record uh, on behalf of Labor and our position on this. Um, I would like to thank Senator Patrick for moving this motion, as it raises a number of important matters that go to the heart of how the justice system within a robust democracy such as ours should operate. In particular, the matters addressed in this motion relate to the principle of open justice, which is a fundamental principle for all justice systems in democratic nations. It is a principle summarised in the adage that justice must not only be done, it must be seen to be done. In addition, the subject matter of this motion, as well as the motion itself, are directly relevant to how the doctrine of separation of powers operates or should operate at a federal level. First, let me address some of the background that led to the current situation in which two men, Mr Bernard Cleary and a former intelligence officer known only as Witness K, are being prosecuted for offences in circumstances that have caused concern to many Australians, including many members in this place. The factual background to this matter relating to events that are alleged to have occurred in 2004 during the period of the Howard government remains a matter of contention, and given that it is relevant to the prosecutions now underway, it is not appropriate for me to revisit those matters now by discussing in detail now what has already been discussed extensively in the media over a number of years. However, Labor has been deeply concerned by the manner in which these contentious and highly sensitive matters have been mishandled by this Liberal government since shortly after they took office in 2013. On 3 December 2013, only three months after becoming Attorney-General, in the first disastrous succession of failures that was the Abbott government, Senator George Brandis issued a media release proudly announcing that he had authorised ASIO to raid the offices of East Timor's lawyer based in Australia and a former Attorney-General of the ACT, Mr Bernard Collieri. Mr Collieri's files were seized during this raid. In addition, Witness K's passport was seized. This public raid and announcement occurred just two days before hearings were due to start in East Timor's case against Australia at the Permanent Court of Arbitration in The Hague. This arbitration um, was to settle an, an extremely sensitive dispute between East Timor and Australia regarding the treaty on certain maritime arrangements in the Timor Sea. Labor expressed our concern at the time that these raids were likely to damage Australia's relationship with East Timor, as, as well as Australia's regional and international reputation. Specifically, we expressed concern that instead of resolving our legal dispute and helping to normalise relations with East Timor, which was already strained by the subject matter of the arbitral proceedings, the timing and ham-fisted public handling of the raids by Senator Brandis only further exacerbated tensions. Immediately after the raids, on 4 December 2013, Timor-Leste's then Prime Minister Jeanne Gusmao issued a statement calling on Australia to explain its actions. He said, the actions taken by the Australian government are counterproductive and uncooperative. Raiding the premises of a legal representative of Timor-Leste and taking such aggressive action against a key witness is unconscionable and unacceptable conduct. It is behaviour that is not worthy of a close friend and neighbour or of a great nation like Australia. 
As a consequence of these raids, in March 2014, Australia was brought, brought before the International Court of Justice, accused by East Timor of breaching its sovereignty and related principles of international law. The Abbott government contested these allegations, but the International Court of Justice ruled against Australia for the first time in our nation's history in a comprehensive and humiliating manner. The International Court of Justice even took the rare step of refusing to accept undertakings made by Senator Brandis regarding the materials seized from Mr Kaleri in the raids and instead made a series of orders against Australia. Not only was this embarrassing to Australia in our region and in the wider international community, but it compromised Australia's hard-earned reputation as a country that conducts itself as a responsible global citizen that respects the international rule of law. The key matters that had been the subject of the dispute between Australia and East Timor were finally resolved with a new treaty signed between our nations in March 2018. However, for reasons that remain unclear to this day, in June 2018, only three months after the new treaty arrangements were agreed, Senator Brandis's replacement as Attorney General and now former Attorney General Christian Porter personally authorised the prosecution of both Mr Cleary and Witness K. While the Commonwealth DPP recommended the prosecution of Mr Cleary and Witness K because the prosecution relates to alleged breaches of Section 39 of the Int Intelligence Services Act, a prosecution can only proceed with the approval of the Attorney-General. Labor has been calling for the Morrison government to explain why it suddenly authorised these prosecutions, given the charges relate to events alleged to have occurred in 2004 and which are alleged to have, occur to have involved senior members of the Howard government. To date, the Morrison government has refused to provide the public with an explanation for the decision by its former Attorney-General to authorise these prosecutions. Labor has also expressed concern at reports that, Porter, that Mr Porter has instructed his lawyers to intervene in the pre-trial proceedings against Mr Kaleri on multiple occasions in order to press the court to cast a greater cloak of secrecy over the trial. This has reportedly led to considerable further delay and cost, and in so doing increased the stress and financial hardship to the accused. Uh, in June 2020, the Morrison government admitted that it had already spent over $2 million on the prosecutions, even though they had not even progressed to the trial stage. And by estimates hearings in October last year, uh, the government was forced to admit that more than $3 million had been spent on these prosecutions. The figure has continued to go up and up and up. Um, time doesn't permit me to go uh, into great detail, um, but it's likely now that we're at more than $4 million of taxpayers' funds and still a date for the trial has not been sent, set. set. Um, in estimates last, mo last month, Labor asked senators asked a number of questions about how it is that these prosecutions are in the public interest. Uh, we, we raised a number of points, such as the lack of progress in these two prosecutions, um, the enormous cost uh, to the taxpayer in funding them, uh, the fact that the prosecutions relate to events that are alleged to have occurred 17 years ago, uh, and that there has been no suggestion of either of the, the accused posing any threat to uh, the public. We're still waiting for answers from this government about how these prosecutions serve the public interest. I also want to acknowledge the concerns raised by many Australians that, far from serving the public interest, these prosecutions may in fact be contrary to the public interest. Both Mr McCleary and Witness K claim to be whistleblowers. If that is in fact the case, then it is very difficult to see how the Morrison government's attempt to prosecute them can be in the public interest. To the contrary, the prosecution of whistleblowers for revealing wrongdoing is likely to intimidate those who would reveal wrongdoing and in so doing can only encourage corruption and undermine transparency, accountability and the rule of law. Unfortunately, the Morrison government has a track record of responding to revelations of corruption in government by attacking those brave enough to reveal it, rather than investigating the allegations and holding wrongdoers to account. We have seen this again and again as the Prime Minister seeks to sweep under the carpet scandal after scandal involving his own ministers. In April this year, the former New South Wales DPP Nicholas Cowdery said that these prosecutions in fact undermine confidence in the justice system and Commonwealth prosecutors were wrong to deem these prosecutions are in the public interest. He said that the wrong parties are being prosecuted. Uh, now, My colleague in the other place, the member for Fenner, has been active on this issue uh, and has uh, pointed out that the government has an unexplained decision to spend millions of dollars on these prosecutions uh, and that, they're being, that the trials are being conducted in, in secret. Um, Mr Kaleri and the former intelligence officer known as Witness K are, like all other Australians, entitled to a fair trial before a court of law. Even though we understand that Witness K has just today pleaded guilty, that in no way lessens his right to due process, including in relation to sentencing. 
Moreover, Labor strongly supports the principle of open justice, which dictates that judicial processes should be conducted in public unless the presiding magistrate or judge determines that there are compelling reasons to close the court. We in Labor do not consider that a compelling reason to close a court is embarrassing the Prime Minister or other members of the Liberal Party. Secret trials are not something that the Labor Party or indeed any Australian who value it, values our democratic values and heritage should countenance. While we acknowledge that there may be national security or privacy reasons for certain parts of a trial to be held behind closed doors, this government has shown that it seeks to hide behind a cloak of secrecy at every opportunity for every scandal it is involved in. Many Australians are concerned about these prosecutions, which is why I have welcomed the opportunity to speak on the motion. For the reasons I've outlined today, it's more important than ever that the Morrison government provide a detailed explanation Thank as to why you, the Senator prosecutions Watt. are in the public interest. It's now being 5.30 p.m. I propose that the Senate do now adjourn, and I call Senator McGrath. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mr. President. Uh, Labor in Queensland are not only they're not building dams; they're tearing down dams. And it has been 632 days since the, the farmers of the Wide Bay Burnett region were told that the Palaszczuk Labor government would be flushing water from Paradise Dam out to sea and tearing down the dam wall. 632 stressful days, 631 sleepless nights, and they are still waiting for Premier Palaszczuk to get out of her ivory tower and tell them the one simple thing that could put their minds at ease. When will she restore their dam? That's all she has to do. It's all we're asking Premier Palaszczuk to do is to tell the, the farmers of the Wide Bay Burnett that she will restore Paradise Dam, but because the destruction of this dam wall has meant a billion-dollar hit to the economy of the Wide Bay Burnett. And that's all they want. It's just a simple, simple rebuild of a dam. But of course, we've got Labor in Queensland, Labor in Queensland, who don't go around building dams, they're tearing down dams. We could get Labor in Queensland to build Yorana Dam, but oh no, nothing there. There have been 20 dams built in Australia in the last uh, since 2003, sorry, and 16 of those have been built in Tasmania. And what have Labor done in Queensland? Well, nothing, Mr. President. Shamefully nothing. So this week. The machinery began packing up and moving away from Paradise Dam. Next month, the workers' camp buildings will be removed. While Sunwater have promised a dam improvement project will involve activities over a number of years, to quote, the timing is to be confirmed, which is the political equivalent of I'll call you in the morning. You know, this is how the state Labor government treat the farmers of the Wide Bay Burnett. Now, my colleague and the Minister for Agriculture and Drought, David Littleproud, compared the, Bar the Paradise Dam fiasco to an episode of the ABC's Utopia last month. But even that program, on its best day, could not dream up a debacle of this magnitude. I would like to applaud the efforts of local farmers and business owners who have raised more than $1 million to fund a class action with the help of Tom Marland and Marlon Law. I would encourage those who are listening to support this class action, but it should not have to come to this. People should not have to sue their own government to get answers and fair compensation for such a massive economic hit created by, by government incompetence. The very real and significant strain this has put on families throughout the region is serious, and this should be beyond party politics. And I'd like to recognise AusHelp for their, their brilliant work in holding a mental health support and suicide prevention workshop in Bundaberg last month. And I'd like to also commend the efforts of Bundaberg, of Bundaberg Fruit and Vegetable Growers, Marlon Law, local MPs, the State Member for Burnett, uh, Stephen Bennett, the State Member for Calide, Colin Boyce, and the Federal Member for Hinkler, Keith Pitt, in their efforts to make the state Labor government see, see sense. 632 days is a long time to wait for an answer. Please, Premier Palaszczuk, do the right thing and rebuild Paradise Dam. Senator Mario Smith. Well, today we have seen the latest in a long line of government attacks on superannuation in Australia. Dirty deals done that ripped up the business of this chamber in order to ram through destructive and disastrous changes to superannuation. Changes that prioritised the self-interest of individuals in this chamber over the security and well-being of the working Australians outside of it. It is a disgrace, and it's just the latest in a long list of disgraceful acts from this government on superannuation. 
We have had a former Liberal Prime Minister describing super as a con. We have had repeated calls from senators opposite to delay legislated superannuation increases. We have had the government's decision to force those struggling during the pandemic to raid their super just to get by, disproportionately affecting those with minimal superannuation balances. And we've had the unbelievable, unfathomable suggestion from the government that those fleeing abusive relationships raid their super in order to leave. And of course, last night, the extraordinary things muttered by a Liberal senator in this place, who described super as a lie and said it's time to kill superannuation stone cold dead. These are Liberal senators, they are members of this government, they are former Prime Ministers from the other side, and their actions are disgraceful. Make no mistake, when the Liberals attack your super, they attack your financial security. When the Liberals attack your super, they attack your dignity in retirement. When the Liberals attack your super, they attack your future. The Liberals come after superannuation for one reason and one reason only. They want to take power away from you. They want to take power away from hard-working Australian families, and it is not hard to guess why. But if we let them keep attacking your superannuation, you know who will suffer most? Young people who have already been disproportionately forced to raid their superannuation during this pandemic. Women who are more likely to have less super and less security in their retirement. And low-income Australians, hard-working Australian families. Well, I'm here to reassure South Australians tonight that Labor will never, ever stop fighting for your superannuation. Super is a proud Labor reform. We introduced it because we believe every single Australian, every single Australian, no matter of how much they earn, deserves dignity in their retirement. We believe that every Australian, every Australian deserves financial security. And we believe that every Australian deserves a whole lot more than what they're getting from this government. Our superannuation system in Australia is the envy of the world. Its brilliance is in its universalism and its security, the very universalism and security that those opposite want to take away. Labor will never allow it. Labor will never stand for it because we are on the sides of hard-working Australians who deserve financial security in their retirement, who deserve dignity in their retirement. We're the side of the women who are working hard, harder and harder every year to see their superannuation balances not matching anywhere near those of the other gender. We're here for young people who've watched their superannuation balances go down and down during this pandemic because they had to raid them to survive. We're on their side. We're on the side of working Australians. We're on the side of superannuation, and we will never, ever stop fighting for it. Senator O'Neill. Thank you very much, Mr President. And I rise today to speak on the failed IPO of software company Newix that left thousands of investors devastated, yet made many in a very exclusive club, vastly rich. It pocketed Macquarie Bank over $565 million in the float and $24 million in fees. Its remaining stake was worth another $500 million and probably accounted for at least 50 per cent of the profits of Macquarie Capital that financial year. It was a billion-dollar payday for Macquarie and helped deliver Macquarie CEO a $20 million bonus for the 2021 financial year. Yet mere months after the IPO, the share price has plummeted by around 75 per cent, wiping almost $3 billion off the values of shares bought by everyday investors who bought them at the IPO or subsequently. How could ASIC allow this to happen? Aperian Law wrote multiple letters of complaint on behalf of a client warning ASIC about the Newix prospectus, despite being given only the statutory seven-day period to provide comments on a 320-page document. And this is how it went. 
Perrion Law sends its first letter on the 23rd of November 2020 regarding the inclusion of a risk disclosure in the NUIX prospectus that provided an effective carve-out for fraud, tax evasion and money laundering. Aperian Law then sends a second letter on the 25th of November 2020, this time querying whether the financial forecasts included in the prospectus were properly signed off by the relevant NUIX executives. After receiving no response to the first two letters, Aperian Law sends a third letter directly to Acting Chair Karen Chester and Deputy Commissioners Armour, Hughes and Press, and ASIC's Chief Operating Officer outlining its very significant concerns with NUIX's prospectus. Why then, given this concerted effort by Aperion, did ASIC fail to properly act on these very valid and prescient complaints? Why had they not done the due diligence and follow-up necessary in response to the Aperion law inquiries? Commissioner Cathy Armour was sent a detailed list of the issues with the prospectus. Armour was the general counsel of Macquarie Capital before taking her role as commissioner at ASIC. This is the very same Macquarie Capital that made almost $600 million on this IPO. What did Commissioner Armour not investigate? Why did she not investigate? What contact did she have from Macquarie in regard to this IPO that led her to such a complete abdication of responsibility in this regard? Did she even read the NUIX prospectus? Did any of her fellow commissioners at ASIC read and act on concerns validly raised with some desperation in three separate communications by Aperion? Acting Chair Karen Chester, too, utterly failed in her duties. I've heard from whistleblowers that she was too busy dealing with the internal politics of ASIC, manoeuvring to become a permanent chair and building her own cliques within ASIC, rather than effectively prosecuting the job she was actually hired to do. The failure of ASIC to appropriately regulate Newix's IPO has had catastrophic consequences for all investors except for Macquarie Bank, the Newix and Macquarie executives in the know, and offshore banks in tax-friendly Vanuatu and Switzerland. This sorry Newix episode has been a complete failure by ASIC. It must never be repeated. Senator Seward. Thank you, Mr President. I rise tonight to talk about one of the world's most remarkable re regions. The Kimberley is in Australia's northwest, and to celebrate the 25th anniversary and the work of Environs Kimberley. The Kimberley is one of the most remarkable places on the planet. It has the world's oldest living culture. Aboriginal people continue to observe their responsibilities to the land, river, wetlands and seas. And that, as they have done for millennia, despite the hardship and oppression wrought through colonialisation. It is one of the few regions of the world where ecosystems are relatively unspoilt. According to scientists who have scanned the globe, the Kimberley has the most intact tropical savanna in the world, despite the damage inflicted by cattle. Its coast is up in the top 4 per cent of the most intact coastlines in the world. The North Kimberley is listed by the Commonwealth as one of the continent's 15 national biodiversity hotspots. It is one of the few places where all of its mammal species, known at European colonialisation, are still, still survive. The West Kimberley has, been, has also been national heritage listed in recognition of, and I quote, natural, historic and indigenous storage of the region that are of outstanding heritage value to the nation. Uh, and it, it says Purnalulu, but it's called Bungle, um, used to, the Bungle Bungles, which are now properly called Purnalulu, is a World Heritage Site. 
The Kimberley is of global significance, and we have a responsibility to the world and future generations to make sure that it is not desecrated by the bulldozer blazed for industrial agriculture and the toxic chemicals used in the fracking industry. The Mirrawarra Fitzroy River is one of the world's great remaining intact rivers, a raging torrent after heavy monsoonal rains, which recedes to pools and wetland refuges by the end of the dry season. The river is fundamental to the lives of the people of the Kimberley and is covered by six language groups. 25 years ago, a cotton farmer proposed building three dams on the Murrawarra Fitzroy River and its tributaries, as well as a canal system to water crops in the Lagrange area south of Broome. More than 220,000 hectares of the Kimberley savannah was earmarked to produce GM cotton. Traditional owners were incensed and opposed the destruction of their homeland and river vigorously. That's when a small band of caring and plucky Broome residents got together to support traditional owners and protect the river. Environs Kimberley, commonly known by those of us that know them and love them, was formed. Uh, so EK was formed in 1996, and they have worked tirelessly, shoulder to shoulder, with traditional owners. And for eight long years, they campaigned to protect the Fitzroy until the, po the proposal was, thank goodness, withdrawn. Had this proposal gone ahead, the Fitzroy River would be a, in a very different state by now. It would no longer be free-flowing. Its plants and animals would have been devastated. The barramundi would no longer be abundant, and the critically endangered sawfish, which I have spoken of in this place several times, would no longer be thriving. Since that time, EK has worked in partnership with others to defend the Kimberley from large-scale industrialisation. A 2005 WA government plan developing the West Kimberley resources outlined an industrial scenario for the region, centred on major energy sources coming on shore, gas from the Browse Basin. It, dis it discussed the mining of lead, zinc, diamonds, iron ore, coal, uranium, tin, heavy mineral sands and onshore oil and gas fracking fields. The fossil gas from the Browse Basin was seen as a, as a power source for an aluminium refinery on the Dampier Peninsula, processing bauxite from the Mitchell Plateau, LPG, methanol, gas to liquids, ammonia and urea production were all mooted as downstream industries. This was an industrial development nightmare for this world significant place. However, WA, then WA Premier Colin Barnett's dream of turning the Kimberley into the next Pilbara died with the demise, thank goodness, of the Browse Gas pro uh, Project, which would have destroyed James Price Point and ruined Broome. The Broome community saw this vision for what it, for what it was, destruction of the Kimberley to benefit shareholders, politicians and business moguls who did not live in the region and would not have to live with the consequences. Woodside's um, Browse Basin gas, which would have spewed millions of tonnes of carbon dioxide and methane into the atmosphere, will now stay in the ground. Despite all the winds and protecting the Kimberley, dark clouds are on the horizon. Texan frackers are in town, along with others desperately chasing fossil fuels before this toxic industry is shut down. Billionaires are back wanting to take billions of litres of water out of the, Mar the Mar Marawara Fitzroy River and bulldoze tens of thousands of hectares of the world's most intact tropical savanna. Once again, environs Kimberley and traditional owners are calling for support to protect the Fitzroy. Just yesterday, the Kimberley Land Council demonstrated outside the WA parliament to call for local people's basic human rights to be recognised and respected so that they can protect their heritage and the national, and the national heritage listed Fitzroy River. I urge Australians to support 
environs Kimberley and the traditional owners to, to protect the Kimberley. EK has been at the front line for a quarter of a century in defending the Kimberley through research, information sharing and advocacy. They are the only environmental organisation in the region. They are advocating for protection and a sustainable economic future that respects nature and culture. They want a sustainable future for the Kimberley to protect one of the world's last, well, the world's largest intact savanna, one of the world's greatest rivers, one of this country's greatest rivers. But billionaires don't see any of that. They just see making money. Traditional owners have a vision for the Kimberley. I think it's up to 92 per cent is covered by native title. They want to do it their way. They want a sustainable future for the Kimberley. I want to say a huge thank you from the bottom of my heart to Environs Kimberley for all their work, for their vision, for their actions, for their advocacy and for respecting the rights of the traditional owners of the country in the Kimberley. I wish you didn't have to continue your work. I wish we could say that the area is no longer threatened, but unfortunately it is. So Australia, please support Environs Kimberley, the traditional owners of the Kimberley, to continue their work to ensure that this magnificent area of Australia is protected and that it is not destroyed by rent seekers trying to get the last bit out of the fossil fuels in this country, because they know the, they're not going to get away with it for long, so they're desperate to get in now. They shouldn't be allowed in. This should be stopped. Please support the work of the Kimberley, uh, the Environs Kimberley. Thank you, Environs Kimberley, for your hard work, and keep it up. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Seward. The Senate stands adjourned and will meet again on Monday, the 21st of June, at 10 a.m.